This is Audible. Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Over and Over Again by Cole McQuaid. Narrated by Philip Alces. 1. Luca Ward's parents said goodbye to him at Sheffield Railway Station. Luca didn't say it back. They'd not even bothered coming inside the station with him. Instead, they stood in front of that giant fucking urinal of a fountain in the square and made mealy-mouthed mumbles about seeing him in January. Fresh farm air. It was for his own good. His Uncle Imre couldn't wait to see him. He's not my uncle, Luca hissed. We're not even related. I haven't seen him in ten fucking years. But Luca... Admit it, he's just some stranger you're foisting me off on because you don't want to deal with me yourself. His father hunched his narrow shoulders, sighing and fidgeting with his pencil-thin tie. His ties always made him look like he was choking, squeezing his neck too small until his head ballooned atop the willow lathe of his body. I don't know what to do with you anymore, Luca. I'm at the end of my rope. Try not shipping me off like some bloody criminal. His mother, his little golden apple of a mother, with her way of talking with her hands as though shaping flowing waves and moving clouds, reached for him. Now don't be dramatic, dear. You used to love the farm, and it's beautiful out there in the Dales. If you're going to send me to the arse crack of nowhere, it could have been Scarborough. At least they've proper beaches. His father's lips thinned into a flat black dash. This isn't a vacation. This is punishment. This is discipline. You need to grow up. I'm a fucking adult. Adults don't steal a bloody motorcycle and leave it crashed out in front of the Peter and Paul. Lucas stared at his father. Marco Ward's chest heaved, the colour spotted high in his cheeks, his eyes bright. His father was like that, a thin and sensitive man, wispy enough to blow away with the wind, quiet even in his anger. Yet that quiet was what made his fury so powerful, when he choked on his emotions and trembled as though he'd break down at any moment. Luca's mother fretted between them with those wordless, helpless sounds she made when she wanted to knock their heads together, but meant to let them work it out for themselves. There was no hope Lucia Ward would step in and turn this wreck aside before it crashed. Not when this had been her fucking idea, tossing him out like the trash. His father sighed, shoulders sagging. I'm out of options, son. You're giving me no choice. The only alternative was to press charges, but I'm not ready to give up on you yet. It took fast talking to keep the church from prosecuting. If you want to be an adult, you can be tried as an adult. If you want to be reckless, you have to deal with how I choose to save your ass. But if you refuse to go, there's nothing I can do but to leave you to deal with your own consequences. Luca's gut heaved, then turned cold. The threat didn't need to be any clearer. He turned away. Whatever. I need a break from your dysfunctional horse shite anyway. Sort yourselves the fuck out, will you? You're a fucking disgrace. He walked away from his parents, leaving them standing in the mid-September sun like Jack Spratt and his wife, two pins stuck in the Sheffield Station Square and holding it in place. I love you, dearling his mother called. Do try to dress warm. We'll see you in January, son, his father added. Luca tossed a middle finger over his shoulder, stuffed his earbuds in, turned up the white stripes, and stepped into the shadow of the brick arches fronting the station's facade. Whatever. They wanted to ship him off like a damned prisoner. They hated him so much they couldn't be asked to drive to Harrogate themselves. They could go rot would serve them right if he never came back at all. 2. Imra Claiborne crouched over a bag of seed, one knee planted in the cool earth beneath the shadow of the open barn door. With one hand he sifted a clover and alfalfa seed mix between his fingers, little green-gold kernels indistinguishable, save for minor differentiations in shape and size. Their dusty, earthy scent wafted up with each handful that spilled back into the sack. 
His other hand steadied his cell phone, just barely catching it before it could slip from between his shoulder and ear, narrowly saving it from a swim in the seed bag. It's barely a minute to town, Marco, he said. No bother at all. I'll nip right out, fetch him from the station, and be back afield within the hour. On the other end of the line, Marco Ward sighed, his breaths crackling against the speaker. Thank you for this, Imra. I'm at my wit's end with that boy. He sounds a bit like you at that age. I never stole. Anything but your dad's rum. Marco laughed, yet it was tired, strained. I'd have let it go, even if I loved that bike. But the pole wanted to nab him for destruction of public property. He crashed the bloody thing into a church. If I'd not been friends with a few of the locals, he'd be in cuffs. The boy's on a fast track to hell at this rate. Let St. Peter worry about that when the time comes. Imre chuckled. He's nineteen, not a child. We still did daft things when we were nineteen. Uni worked out those wild oats well enough for both of us. If he'd just go to Uni, I'd be less worried. But he's intent on making his gap year a gap life. Exhaling, Imra sank back on his haunches and checked his watch. Luca's train would be pulling into Harrogate on the line north in about an hour and a half, and Imra still had an acre to till. Might just put it off until Luca was in and settled. Planting could wait another day. Alfalfa and clover grew quickly, and the herds would trim it down even faster, well before the frost set in. Could just take the day off, he thought. Spend a little time with Luca. He'd be upset, no doubt. Luca had always been a brightly passionate boy, quick to smile, quick to cry. God knew what he was like now. Imra hadn't seen Luca since he was a sober nine-year-old, one whose quick, brilliant smiles had already begun to disappear behind a careful silence and downcast eyes by the time the wards had cast off and put Harrogate at their backs. He'd hated to see it. Some people were born with a thick skin— some developed it over time. Luca had been born with skin like paper and a crystal heart. He took everything into himself and transformed it into raw emotion that shone and bled from him in this vivid kaleidoscope of colour. Every love, every loss, every joy, every hurt. Back when Marco and Lucia had lived closer in Harrogate proper, they'd been out at Imri's farm every other week. In those days Luca had been a pinwheel of animated energy, tumbling through the clover with soft white flowers dappled in the dark shock of his hair, his laughter echoing over the farm. The problem with feeling things so deeply, though, was feeling them hard, taking the wounds, and if those wounds had already made Luca sober and quiet by the time the wards had moved away to Sheffield ten years ago, Imra worried what kind of seething, Angry mass of scar tissue was about to show up on his doorstep as a grown man. He straightened, brushing the dirt from the knees of his jeans, and leaned in the barn door, looking out over the fields. His goats, primarily spry, tooth-edged alpines, a few Nubians scattered in the mix, milled in their walled pastures, gnawing at the last crop of alfalfa and clover, bleating and bouncing among themselves. The scent of fresh clover blooms was high and sweet. Fat, furry bees swam through it, nearly drunk on the aroma. He couldn't help a faint smile. Luca used to bounce about just like the goats. Surely that vivid spirit couldn't be completely broken. It'll be all right, Marco, he murmured into the phone. He just needs some time to cool off. Away from you. No doubt you're public enemy number one right now. God, am I? No one told me when you had kids they'd love you until they hated you. He's just trying to assert himself as a separate person from you and Lucia, an adult. Then he shouldn't act like a damned boy. Imra smiled to himself. Give it time. You can say that. You don't have children of your own. You don't know what it's like. I suppose I don't. And Imra doubted Marco would want to hear much else. He didn't think Marco realized just how much he was like his own son, quiet and sensitive, yet hot-headed and passionate, willing to listen to no law but his own. I'd best go if I'm to make it to the station on time. I'll take good care of Luca, you have my word. 
At this point, I'd be grateful if you put a few stripes on his hide, Marco groaned. I don't mean that, I don't. Just thank you, Imra. I know it's an imposition. It's no such thing. I'll let you know when he's settled in. Thank you. Lucia sends her love. Send mine back, Imra said, then ended the call with a swipe of his thumb, slipped his phone into his pocket, and folded his arms over his chest with a heavy sigh. He'd said it was no trouble, but in truth he had no idea what to do with Luca Ward. The bright, laughing boy he remembered wasn't the man being dropped in his lap in disgrace. He didn't know what to expect when he saw Luca again. But as he watched the goats, he remembered pale flower flecks against a crown of dark hair, and thought perhaps he could welcome Luca not to a jail sentence, but to a home. 3. Luca slept through to the transfer at Leeds. At Leeds Station he scrambled through the busy concourse, twice as large and crowded as Sheffield. He had ten minutes to make the second train from Leeds to Harrogate. He was tempted to miss it. Just disappear into Leeds. It was a big enough city. He could vanish anywhere and everywhere. Sleep on park benches, live wild, survive on fifty pea-cup noodles, get a job as a barista or some such and find himself at a tiny windowless flat in some shithole back alley, miserable but his. Stop being Luca Ward and just be Luca. The idea shouldn't have such appeal, but he'd been thinking about it for months. Some days he felt like his heart was a bird with clipped wings, and flying was just a memory it was terrified of forgetting. That was what had been so beautiful about that moment on the motorcycle. Hands up, hundreds of pounds of steel and burning petrol careening down the road, gravity gone and Luca weightless, flying, flying as if he could lift up on wings and send the bird of his heart soaring away. But there was Platform 17B, and the second train from Leeds to Harrogate already waiting. He double-checked his ticket, then hefted his hefty duffel and strode for the closest carriage, stretching his legs. Ten-minute transfers were utter balls, but he scrambled on with a few minutes to spare. The carriage was half-empty, dotted with bored-looking people in plain, dull colours, scattered about like bits of seed strewn for pecking hens. A few glanced up at him, but didn't quite look at him just dully registering his presence before returning blank stares to the windows, as if there was anything to see on an unmoving line. He found a seat in the very back row, shoved his bag into the overhead bin, then slumped down in the bucket chair against the window with his earbuds shoved in. Leeds was so noisy, but Sean Mendes crooned in Luca's ear, drowning it all out with aching pleas for someone to have mercy on him and his heart. A few more seats filled in a shuffling of feet and luggage. The doors cranked closed. The train screamed out a shrill whistle and rumbled around him. A jerk of momentum jolted him as the carriage rolled forward, wheels grinding and squealing against the tracks. This was it. Last chance to turn tail and run, slipping through his fingers, the doors locking and sealing him in. He rubbed at his chest at the tight low pane there, rested his too hot brow to the cool window pane, and swallowed a breath that lodged in his throat. Leeds station slid past slowly, then faster and faster, until the train arrowed through bright flashes of morning sun off rooftops. He wanted to go home already. He wanted his parents to just let him be. He'd thought it would serve them right if he didn't come back, but they were probably glad to see him gone. He was someone else's problem now. Maybe they'd be happier if he never came back. His phone buzzed, cutting off the music track, and cutting off the prickle in his eyes before it could become anything more. He rummaged his phone from his pocket and swiped through the latest text. Xavier. Luca laughed under his breath. That motherfucker. You there yet? Zave texted. Luca dotted his thumb over the screen, swiping out quick letters. Not yet. I almost didn't go at all. Could have run away in Leeds. At least it's a proper city. Harrogate's not so bad. Pretty even. Lucas smiled, though he didn't really feel like it. That was how Zave had always been, bright side to everything. 
It had driven Luca through the roof during A-levels, and that was the only thing that got him through A-levels. Xavier Ligari and his wide smile and bright black eyes in that pert brown face. Xavier was lucky. He was smart, charming, easygoing, and everyone liked him. Of course he could look at the bright side of everything. For him, every side was the bright side. But it was Xavier's bright side that had made Luca's life tolerable, and now he didn't even have Zave, when Luca's parents had just ripped him away from his friends, his life, everything he'd had in Sheffield. Don't try to make me feel better, he texted back. It just pisses me off. I'm not even staying in Harrogate. I'm going to a farm somewhere in the backwoods. Maybe you can feed the ducks. Luca scowled at the phone. You taking the piss? Always, Zave shot back. Luca could almost see that cheeky, damned grin. Don't make too many friends there. I'll get jealous. Yeah, I'll make friends with all the fucking pigs mucking around in the mud. With a snort, Luca closed the text window and tapped play on his music again. The track skipped forward to bad reputation and his side, sinking down in his seat and letting his eyes half close until the hard blue light of morning became a haze and the buildings streaked by in vague dashes of colour. He had a bad fucking reputation, all right. His father had probably called Imra already and filled his head with stories of what a degenerate reprobate Luca was. He flushed hotly and sank down deeper in his seat. Unka Imi. Though they weren't related by blood, and Imra was just a friend of Luca's father from uni, for as long as Luca could remember he'd called him Unka Imi, until around eight or so he'd declared himself too old for such childish bon mots, and begun pronouncing Imra so very gravely. He could hardly even remember what Imra looked like. He was more a collection of impressions than a solid mental image. Luca used to clamber all over him like a great broad-limbed oak tree. To a tiny boy, Imra had seemed a massive monolith, ten feet tall and broad as a mountain, with a thick nest of beard. Luca had always climbed in Imra's lap and tangled his fingers in that long, lustrously black scruff, stroking the soft strands and playing with the few tiny braids woven throughout, each tipped in small blue beads to match the slender, bead-tipped braids strung throughout the untamed mane of Imra's hair. Those beads had been the same blue as Imra's eyes. That was his clearest memory, how startlingly clear a blue Imra's eyes were against his swarthy, weathered skin. That and the kindness in his hands. He'd had massive hands, hands that could crush granite to dust, this great dark earthen god with the strength of stone. But he'd handled everything, from his tiny bleating goat kids to the smallest clover flower to Luca himself, with a gentleness that flowed from his hands like water, imbued with a living warmth. And Luca had been in love with him, the way only little boys could be. He still remembered sitting on Imra's lap when he was five years old, snuggled in the heavy rocking chair before the living room fireplace at Imra's farm. Blue walls. The room had deep blue walls, painted in varying shades over rough stone, turning the space into a dark blue night lit by the flicker of firelight. Soft illumination shining like honey off the polished wood of the guitar propped on the mantel. Luca's parents had been tangled on the couch, wrapped up in each other and cuddling under a quilt stitched in patterns of zigzags and dots and knotted loops, drowsy yet so contentedly in love. Luca had curled up in Imra's lap like a puppy, clinging to his beard and his shirt, fighting off sleep though his eyes refused to stay open. But he'd had a secret in his pocket, one he'd worked on all day, then hidden away in his jumper. And as the deep, heavy swelling of Imra's lazy sigh had moved his chest and stomach against Luca's cheek, Luca had opened his eyes, peeking at his parents to make sure they were really asleep, before rummaging in his pocket and pulling out his secret. A ring, made of braided blades of grass. 
He'd had to make it a whole eleven to twelve times before it came out right, because the grass would break and splinter, or one strand would be too short, or it was just too small, because Imra had hands big enough to hold the world. But now it was perfect, a thin, flat band of interwoven strands making chevron patterns. He'd made it because that was what people did when they loved people, he'd thought. His parents had. They loved each other, so they had rings. So he'd made a ring too, smooth and pretty, and he'd tucked it away again and run his thumb over its textures before taking a deep breath and looking up at Imra. Immy, he'd asked, biting his lip. His mouth tasted funny, like he'd been sucking on pennies. Imra had rumbled a soft, curious sound, and looked down at him with those eyes as gentle as his hands, surrounded by seams and folds that settled his gaze into a cradle of warmth, softening the forbidding crags of dark, heavy brows. "'What is it, Anyoka?' he'd asked, his deep, richly inflected English altering into something more melodious and smooth on the Hungarian word. Luca had taken a breath so massive it tried to burst his chest, then announced, I'm going to marry you one day. Imra had blinked, then laughed low in his throat, the sound so large yet so quiet, shaking them both. Oh, you know, and why is that? Because I love you. Luca had put as much conviction into the words as he could, more confidence than he'd felt when his ears burned and his bare toes curled until they caught in the denim over Imra's thighs. Mummy and Daddy love each other, and they got married. I love you, so I'm going to marry you. Imra's gaze had softened, and he'd gently dropped one of those massive hands atop Luca's head, playing through his hair. Five years old is very young to be so serious about marriage. I mean it. Luca had ducked his head, fidgeting his lower lip with his fingers, then gulped and pulled the ring from his pocket again. I'm going to grow up, and I'm going to be tall and handsome, and then you'll love me too, and we'll get married. Tilting his head, Imra had studied the ring solemnly. In the firelight, the edges of the ring had gleamed like spun gold fibre. There's a problem with that. Luca's heart had turned upside down. It was an awful feeling, a sick feeling, and he'd dropped his hands into his lap, staring down at the silly pointless little ring. Oh. The problem, Imra had said, catching his hand, swallowing it inside his own until Luca's fingers and the ring disappeared into a thick palm, is that I already love you, Angyuka. A sharp breath had sucked into Luca's throat. Imra had uncurled his hand and gently grasped Luca's and guided him, still gripping the ring so tight, to slip the ring over Imra's third finger on his left hand. It had fit just right, sliding over his thickly ridged, scarred knuckle, and settling into place nestled at the base of his finger. Luca had smiled so much his face hurt with it, and flung his arms round Imra's shoulders, burying his face in his neck and his beard. I'm always gonna love you, Emmy, he'd whispered and Imra had chuckled again and wrapped his arms around him, holding him just tight enough. I know you will, Angyolka. I know. The memory of that night, the firelight in Imra's eyes, the sweet light flutters of Luca's heart, sank in his chest. He huddled down deeper in the train seat. He'd been such a ridiculous child. Imra had been kind to him patiently indulging him and not crushing his five-year-old heart, but that had been fourteen years ago. Imra probably still saw him as that same earnest, simple little boy, full of nonsense ideas and making promises he'd never keep, unrealistic and completely confused. He'd be right about one thing. Luca was completely and utterly confused and not sure what to do with himself. Not on that fucking farm, and not when Imra got sick of him and shipped him back home without a single damned thing having changed. With a groan, he leaned forward, thunking his forehead against the seat in front of him. Why, of all people, did it have to be Imra? Hey! The man in the row before him barked. Watch it back there. Sorry, 
Luca mumbled and curled in on himself, burying his face in his knees with a low moan. Fuck. He couldn't even manage a train ride without stirring up trouble. The next four months would be miserable. Four. Eventually Luca settled into the train's lull, the sound of the rails mingling with the pulse and rock and cadence of his music, hypnotizing him into a drifting thrall that wasn't quite sleep, but wasn't quite awake. He snapped from it only long enough to show the conductor his ticket as she passed through before slipping into a trance again, silently mouthing lyrics and trying to ignore the heavy weight on his chest. After passing beneath the castle-like arches and towers of the Bramhope Tunnel entrance, he drifted off fully. The darkness of the tunnel and the rhythmic flash of running lights eased him into a fitful doze, his phone clutched against his chest and his head resting against the window. He woke as the train shot from the tunnel and light splashed over him, searing through his eyelids and shocking him awake. He opened his eyes on a blaze of white, stabbing into his retinas and blinding him. With a wince, he turned his face away and covered his eyes with his arm, blinking until he adjusted to the light. The white haze cleared, replaced by green and gold and brilliant autumn fire, rolling fields that swooped up and down like the crests and troughs of waves, plunging high only to sweep gracefully low, stroked as smooth as the flick of a calligraphy brush. Deep pink and rich purple edged the green, catching the light in soft streaks, glimmering beneath a sky of endless blue and low, silver-bellied clouds. Tumbles of pale grey limestone pushed up through the grass like fragments of ancient ruins. The Yorkshire dales swept past, segmented into fields by hedgerows, lines of trees, low fencing walls built of hand-stacked worn river stones in white and grey. Small blocky barns with white sides and peaked roofs scattered all about. At the peak of one hill the sun shone in bursts through the legs of grazing cattle. Luca's eyes widened. He pressed his fingers to the window, breathing in slowly. He'd never seen the dales like this. During his childhood in Harrogate, the verdant acreage had been a close and ordinary thing. The last time he'd seen the dales had been through a window, just a crevice of sky blocked off by stacks of moving boxes in the back of a truck. A heavy feeling struck hard in the pit of his stomach, at once sweet and swimming with a certain quiet, thrashing terror. A feeling of coming home, when Harrogate hadn't been home for ten years. He didn't even remember his old address, the house where they'd lived, as more than an afterimage of sunlight through overgrown trees his dad had always promised to trim from their tiny patch of backyard, but never did. Everything else about Harrogate was just impressions. Weekends on Imra's farm, weekdays running and playing with other children in the neighborhood, all sticky fingers and red balloons and little legs pumping on bike pedals. Coming back now, ten years older and city-wiser, made him feel like an imposter. He didn't belong here. It may have been home once, but it couldn't be now. But he still remembered the ugly, overly modern Harrogate railway station sticking out like a raw sore against the town's graceful, historic architecture, villas and tree-lined roadways. He groaned as the carriage pulled into the station, easing to a halt with a lurch and a grinding squeal of railway brakes. While the conductor called disembarkation stops and times, Luca dragged himself out of his seat wincing when his body protested with shooters of pain lashing through his limbs and crawling up his spine. He stretched it out, groaning as he pulled his muscles loose, then tugged his earbuds out, hauled his bag down from the bin and slung it over his shoulder. His legs didn't want to work right. His body told him gravity swayed back and forth with the rhythm of inertial motion. But the train was at a standstill, while he tripped over his feet like a puppy trying to figure out what to do with his oversized paws. He nearly tangled his boots together on the steps down to the platform, and barely caught himself from pitching forward by grabbing onto the door frame. Yet hands caught him, before he even managed to grip the frame. Large warm hands, thick-fingered and gentle, radiating a familiar heat. 
He stiffened as those hands slowly drew him down the steps and set him to rights, handling him as if he were little more than dandelion fluff, light and spinning and wheeling as freely as his spinning, wheeling heart. He'd thought he'd have to go searching for Imra, but as his feet came down to earth and settled on the platform, he stared up into clear, steady blue eyes he knew as well as he knew his own face. Imra had come to him. He was still tall, even from Luca's higher perspective, well over six feet, and still broad, his shoulders the shoulders of mountains. His rough-hewn body was built of blocks of thick musculature, grace in the taper from shoulders to waist, strength in the hard press of sturdy thighs against worn jeans. But that wild mane of unruly hair and that thick familiar beard had gone completely silver, soft as mist, and in some places shimmering with streaks of pure white, shadowed to iron grey in others, a halo of shining moon-pale colour standing stark against naturally dark skin, weathered even deeper by the sun. Those scattered braids, in both beard and hair, remained, the beads tipping them a darker blue now, some polished stone with black veins throughout, and a luminous sheen. The lines around Imra's eyes had deepened, shadowed by thick brows a darker shade of steely, sooty grey, and the creases around his mouth were starker, but the way he smiled was still the same. Just the slightest pull of a generous, sensitive mouth with full red lips and a precisely defined dip in the centre, a dip that softened and sweetened as that subtle smile tugged at it. Imra's smile warmed as he steadied Luca with those large hands on his shoulders. Luca, Imra murmured. His was a slow and measured way of speaking, and his voice, while deep and imbued with a quiet and rumbling authority, was always so soft, so coaxing, as if promising safety with every word. Imra was a man who never had to raise his voice to command attention, and he had Luca's attention entirely as he said, It's good to see you. Luca worked his lips incoherently. He hadn't expected Imra to be here, smiling like that, waiting for his unwanted burden right here on the train platform, instead of impatiently tapping his foot in the car park. Luca didn't know what to say. He just stared up at Imra, his heart struggling to grow strange and beating wings, struggling to fly, as he took in how Imra had changed over the years. Older, yes, but still so vibrant, still simmering with a silent and undeniable strength. And standing there with his silver hair dotted with flowers, dozens woven into a crown of soft, bursting white clover blossoms, with their frothy round blooms and tiny petals, interlaced with slender green stems. Luca blinked, blinked again, tilted his head, and frowned. The fuck is that? he demanded, and Imra burst into rough laughter that rolled as sweetly and smoothly as the sloping hills and valleys of the dales. Luca just scowled. Great, not five minutes and Imra was already laughing at him. Just fucking great. Five. Imra hadn't consciously realized he was still watching for a twig-thin sprout of a boy until a young man stepped off the train, and that click of recognition settled in like a lock sliding into a familiar home. That tiny sprout had been replaced by a tall, graceful slip of a man who had just stepped past the cusp of adulthood. Pale and smooth and slim as a lily, made up of sharp edges and sullenly beautiful angles. It was hard to see little Luca in that man, until he lifted his head and pale green eyes flashed from beneath a side-swept shag of ink-black hair. Those green eyes, light as new spring leaves and framed by a thick ring of black lashes, were still the same mirrors that reflected back every emotion he took into himself. And right now they simmered with exhaustion, hurt, and a barely suppressed and bubbling rage. Until those emotions vanished, wiped away by shock and panic as his coltish legs tangled on the train carriage steps, and he pitched forward under the heft of a bag that probably weighed more than he did. 
Im removed without thinking. Two steps and he was there, catching Luca under his arms and halting his fall. Luca probably could have caught himself, already reaching for the doorframe, but Imra hadn't considered that. He'd just reacted and now he was standing here with his hands full of startled boy, the lines of Luca's body stiff under his touch, tension hardening lean sinew under the defensively black armor of his clothing. Imra eased him down onto the concrete of the platform, then shifted his grip to his shoulders, holding loosely. Luca had the look of a trapped animal, ready to either attack or bolt, and Imra would prefer he did neither. And so, no matter how he wanted to pull Luca into his arms and remind him he was home, he was safe, Imra would never hurt him. Instead, he only clasped his shoulders gently, giving Luca plenty of room to wiggle free and give himself whatever distance he needed. No, this Luca certainly wasn't the bright-eyed, effusive boy he'd known. Luca the boy had been fragile, but Luca the man was completely broken, lost, hurting. "'wounded and struggling to cage all that unfettered emotion inside "'where he could protect it from others' sharp touches. "'Yet still it burst from him at every seam, desperate to be free. "'Not the Luca he'd known at all, but still Luca, very much. "'Luca,' he said, "'it's good to see you.' "'Luca stared up at him, eyes wide, long lashes trembling.' For a moment he looked lost, sweetly confused, before his brows knit together and he tilted his head. The fuck is that? Imra arched a brow, then realized Luca was staring at the flower crown on Imra's head. The sheer confused indignation sparking in Luca's eyes, as if the clover flowers had mortally offended him, roused a burst of laughter that rioted up from Imra's belly and past his lips before he could stop it. Luca scowled. That sulky pink mouth twisted into a pout, and Luca lifted his pointed, utterly defiant chin and stepped out from under Imri's grasp, edging away from blocking the carriage exit and putting a few feet of distance between them. What's so bloody funny? Nothing. Imra let his laughter out on a slow breath, but couldn't stop himself from smiling as he pulled the flower crown from his head and offered it to Luca, dangling from his fingertips. I had made this to welcome you home, but if you don't want it... Luca's eyes widened, then narrowed. He jerked his face away, glaring across the platform, his scowl deepening so much his nose scrunched up. The tips of his ears and the point of his nose colored a rather fetching shade of pink. Whatever, he growled. This isn't home. It's my home. It used to be yours. Luca shot him a suspicious glare from the corner of his eye, then darted a look down at the flower crown, then back at Imra. Imra waited. He was content to wait him out as long as need be. He wasn't certain what had happened to Luca in the ten years since he'd last seen him, but he was in no rush to force the defensive young man to bear his wounds. Imra had once had the trust of a little boy who loved anyone and everyone who treated him with the smallest bit of kindness. But that easy trust was as far gone as that boy, and didn't seem to have any place inside this skittish, snarling man. That was all right. Imra was patient. If Luca needed him to, Imra would take every small step needed to earn that trust again. And he thought, right now, what Luca needed, more than the discipline his father wanted, was someone to trust. After another wary look, Luca edged closer, just close enough to snatch the flower crown from Imra's fingers before backing away again. He held his arms crossed close over his chest and hunched into them. Yet he handled the flower crown delicately, the slim, interwoven stems tangled carefully in his fingertips. Imra studied him a moment longer, then looked away before he might make Luca uncomfortable with his scrutiny. Do you have any other bags? No, just this one. It looks heavy. Luca glowered. I've got it. I only said it looks heavy. Imra shrugged. I'd be happy to take it. You must be tired. I was barely on the train an hour and a half. Imra chuckled. I'm trying to be nice, Luca. You can counter with logic and facts if you like, 
but emotion doesn't listen to logic or facts. Nice isn't an emotion, Luca bit off, but he relaxed his death grip on himself, then unslung his bag from his shoulder. Then, without looking at Imra, in fact glaring pointedly away, he thrust the bag at him, but kept the crown of clovers clutched in his other hand. Imra took the bag and hefted it over his shoulder. Something hard-edged inside dug into his back, but he ignored it and turned toward the doors leading into the concourse. This way. He led Luca from the platform and into the station proper, less busy at this time of day, when most of the commuters to and from Leeds were usually on the early morning or evening trains. A few gawking tourists stood about, too wrapped up in their maps and their iPhone photo galleries to step out of the main thoroughfare, but Imra navigated neatly around them with Luca on his heels, trailing in his wake as though he didn't want anyone to assume they were together. Imra kept his smile to himself and let the boy have his silence. At least he wasn't running away. Imra had thought the moment he turned his back, Luca would bolt and vanish into the brush with a last flicker of white like a deer's tail disappearing under the trees. Luca held his silence, practically vibrating with it, fit to stab Imra with his fury, until, as they stepped through the doors leading out to the station's main entrance, Luca caught up with him and angled into his path just enough to block him. Imra stopped, cocking his head. Luca stared down at his feet. Bulky boots, just like the post-punk anarchist chavs Imra and Marco had run with at Nottingham, back in their wilder days, that barely caged the rumpled bottoms of black jeans clinging to slim legs. He fiddled with the cord of his earbuds, tangling it with the flower crown, then blurted out, Listen, I'm sorry about this. He chewed on the words like chewing nails. Imra could make a dozen guesses as to what he was apologizing for, but held his tongue and only asked, About what? A mutinous shrug. My dad's basically using you as an alternative to, I don't know, a therapist? Corrective school? Boot camp? Dumping me in the closest skip? Do you expect Lohera to be a prison? That flicker in Luca's eyes, so familiar. From the moment he could speak, he'd always been curious about the little bits of Hungarian and Romongro peppered into Imra's speech, always asking what this or that word meant. Lohera was one of the first words Imra had taught him, and that familiar flicker said he recognized it and was trying to place the meaning. And just as he had when he was a tiny thing, Luca picked at his lower lip with his finger as he thought, tugging at the pink soft curve and pinching it between his thumb and forefinger before something clicked in his gaze as he looked down at the clovers in his hand. Lohera. Clover. Clover Farm, Imra's pride and joy. But it wasn't his farm that roused a spark of pride in this moment. It was Luca, and that curiosity that remained alive even after years had dulled his brightness and fire. But that curiosity faded, washed away by the troubled tides rolling across his features, as Luca looked away again. I don't know what to expect, Luca murmured. His voice, too, had changed as much as the rest of him, from an impish lisp to a husky tenor with a faint lyrical uplilt at the edges of his words, certain sounds catching in the back of his throat in a breathy burr. This is so daft. He's cranked off at me, so he sends me off to the farm like I'm still a kid, like it's some kind of object lesson about the value of hard work or some shite. He grimaced. Really, he just doesn't want to look at me, but he can't let me go either. Imra caught the faint note of longing in Luca's voice, lingered on how pale green eyes turned distant, far-seeing. Is that what you want? To be let go? Yeah. Luca trailed into silence, his mouth soft and bitter in its twist, then added, It's time to cut the leash, but he won't, not until I'm properly trained to run the way he wants me to. Luca. Imre considered, searching for the right words, words that wouldn't send Luca running in the opposite direction. He hadn't quite known what he was agreeing to when Marco called him in frustration, begging him to take Luca for a few months and keep him out of trouble. Whip him into shape had been the unspoken implication, but that wasn't anything Imra had ever agreed to. 
What he'd agreed to, even if it hadn't been explicitly stated, was to give Luca shelter, in whatever form that shelter might take, whatever form Luca might need. And he was already realizing what Luca actually needed was a far cry from what his father thought he needed. I'm not your jailer, Imre said after careful thought. I'm not the hand holding your leash. I'm not going to train you to do anything except help out on the farm. If you don't mind a little hard labor to make the days go by faster. He shifted the bag against his back. That hard edge was still digging into him fiercely, but he continued to ignore it. Luca. Silent Luca. Stiff Luca. Luca, who still wouldn't look at him, was more important. I understand why your father sent you here, but I've no agenda. This isn't any different from the weekends you used to spend at Loera. He offered his hand palm up. No judgment, no punishment, I swear it. But Luca only stared at him again, with that same look of baffled indignation as when he'd noticed the flower crown. Imra couldn't quite make out what was going on behind his eyes, with the strange way he stared at Imra as if he'd sprouted horns fit to mingle with his goats. What? Imra asked. I don't think I've ever heard you say that much out loud before. You're afraid. You seemed to need it. Wrong thing to say. Imra knew it before the words were even fully out of his mouth. Luca's open, naked confusion slammed shut behind a door of fury, his expression twisting into a ferocious glare. I'm not afraid, he spat, then turned away with a toss of messy hair staring narrow-eyed across the street. Just, just, uh, let's go. I hate this place. It's noisy, Imra sighed. This might be more difficult than he'd thought. He couldn't help being honest, sometimes bluntly, terribly honest, whether people wanted to hear it or not. It had gotten him in trouble quite a bit in his younger days, and the only way he'd learned to temper it was with silence when he thought his honesty might be unwanted. And he thought his honesty was very much unwanted right now. So he only said, All right, Luca, and turned toward the car park, fishing in his pocket for his keys. Come on, then and parked this way. Luca said nothing, just a wordless shadow skulking in Imra's wake. 6. Luca could still smell Imra. It hadn't quite struck him at first when Imra had caught him and for a moment they'd stood so close, Imra so overwhelming that all Luca could do was stare. That scent was so familiar it hadn't even registered on a conscious level. Warm hay and sunlit clover fields, clean soft fur and the musk of a hard day's labor, a sweet undercurrent of honey and the tang of apples and something with a bit of mulled, creamy spice. Imra had always smelled of what he loved, and he smelled of Lohera Farm even now, of all the things that made up his home. That scent instinctively made Luca want to melt into it, melt into Imra, and it took everything in him not to press himself against Imra and beg him to make everything all right, make it stop hurting, the way only Imra could. Like fuck, Luca was a grown damned man, too old to be clinging to people and begging them to fix everything. Just because Imra still smelled like fond childhood memories didn't mean anything. Yet that scent was even more pervasive in Imra's car, a battered flatbed Land Rover with its camper removed. Its paint had once hinted it green, or maybe that was Luca's faulty memory when it was nothing but a matte, washed-out grey now. The old, well-cared-for leather seats had soaked in that scent. It rose from the scatterings of hay left in the Land Rover's bed, crunching a little now and then when Luca's bag slid around the back as the jeep took the bumps and ruts in the road. Luca sank into the sun-warmed leather, closed his eyes, and let himself relax just a little into the scent filling the cab, while they rattled off the main roads of Harrogate and on to the smaller dirt-paved farm roads leading out into the fields and dales. Maybe he could treat this like being on holiday instead of a punishment. Imra wasn't shouting at him, wasn't looking at him with Imra's brand of stern, quiet disappointment that was more effective than any raised voices or sharp words. Imra wasn't anything. He was just a silent presence filling the Land Rover. 
Luca couldn't stand it. As a child, he'd loved Imra's silence, loved how easy it was to just sit with him, each in their own private little worlds. But right now, he'd give anything to know what was going on behind those calm, impenetrable blue eyes. He'd give anything to know if Imra thought he was just some immature prat and not the boy he'd promised to always love. Luca's face flamed. He opened his eyes, glaring at the scratched and pitted roof of the car. Why was he even thinking about that right now? Why did it matter? Promises made to children didn't matter. They were promises made to different people. Luca might as well be a stranger, and it didn't matter what Imra thought of him. If he disapproved, if he felt anything at all, it sure as hell didn't matter if he still loved Luca. He didn't want Imra to still love him. Not like that. Not like he was just a child to be coddled and indulged, even if he'd meant it with all his heart when he'd said, I'm always gonna love you, Immy. His breaths caught. His heart flipped. Oh, oh, fuck him in the ear. Was that why he was such a bollocksy mess? Was the five-year-old monster he used to be still naively in love with Imra? No. Hell to the fucking no. The Imra he remembered was an idealized giant seen through the eyes of a child. This man was someone else entirely, as much a stranger as Luca. Something on your mind? Imra asked mildly, his mouth curling at the corners. Luca jerked, flattening himself against the Land Rover's door. Guilt thumped through his heart in erratic rhythm. No. He huddled into himself and glared out the window as fields rolled past, dotted with cattle and round hillocks of hay. Just pondering my next crime, planning quiet the spree. I've a reputation to uphold, don't you fucking know? Right regular criminal now, are you? Oh, yeah. Can't even talk to you without a witness in the room. Pity you'd make for such scintillating conversation over tea. Luca wrinkled his nose and stuck his tongue out at Imra. Imra chuckled, glancing at him sidelong. So... What have you been doing to get Marco into such a snit? I don't even know. Sighing, Luca thunked his head back against the seat. I mean, I know he told you about the whole motorbike thing, but he's been acting like I'm some kind of degenerate since way before that. Like I'm wasting my life drinking, smoking, and nothing else. Do you drink and smoke? A little, yeah, but that's not all I do. Luca shot back. If you're going to lecture me, I don't want to hear it. What would I have to lecture you about? Not going to uni? Not having a job? Being a foul-mouthed prat? Crashing Dad's bike? Imra's brows rose briefly before he turned his eyes, those damned neutral, unreadable eyes that told Luca nothing, back to the road. Do you think you need lecturing about any of those things? No. What, you think I'm ashamed or something? I don't think anything, Imra said softly. That's the problem, Luca wanted to shout. Show me something, anything. Show me what you think of me. Show me how you feel. Show me that you see me and not some tot to pat on the head and send on his way. But Imra said nothing else. He sat languid in the driver's seat, his shoulders relaxed against the leather, one long brawny arm stretched between their seats, the other hand casual on the steering wheel, narrow hips slouched forward and thickly muscled thighs spread. His faded, frayed, dark grey Henley was unbuttoned and open at the throat, the strong tendons of his neck leading down to a visible, ticking pulse, moving against the hollow of his clavicle. Luca caught himself staring at it and looked away sharply, hissing and hunching into himself again. Shut the fuck up, Imra. Even as he said the words, Luca wished he could reach out, pluck them from the air, and swallow them back down inside himself before they ever reached Imra. A stillness settled over the car, different from Imra's calm, easy silence. In that stillness floated things unsaid, things whispered in a language Luca couldn't understand, yet still they screamed their meaning inside him in echoes of guilt and wrongness that bounced off the walls of his heart. Please don't speak to me that way, Imra whispered, toneless and steady. Why? Luca's hackles bristled, and God he wanted to shut up, but couldn't seem to stop his awful, waspish, frightened tongue. 
You going to try to be my dad, too? No, Imra answered simply. It just hurts. That frank, honest admission, spoken with neither recrimination nor shame, cut Luca's legs out from beneath him. He stared at Imra, but Imra only watched the road. Those clear, calm eyes were remote and strange, as if Imra were an island whose shore Luca could never reach, no matter how far he swam. Oh, Luca whispered and shrank into himself. I... I'm sorry. Imra said nothing. He only shifted gears as the long stone fence walls of Lohara Farm came into view over the next rise in the road. Luca huddled in the corner of the seat, looked out the window, and shut his awful, hateful mouth before it spat any more venom into the pool of acid misery eating away inside him. 7. Lohara Farm was still as Luca remembered it a sprawling two-story stone house with connected extension and greenhouse, its peaked slate roof overshadowing walls festooned with climbing runners of honeysuckle, a few late showers of pale white and gold blooms spreading their horned mouths and soft-fronded lips. Many other flowers littered the overgrown garden of a lawn in a carpet of fallen blossoms. Cathedral windows with cross-hatched interior framing bars peered through the showering leaves, making narrow gaps in the green completely covering the walls of the house. One of those windows, the second from the right on the top floor, looked in on a room he remembered from childhood. There had been a bed made up in that room just for him, covered in those quilts Imra seemed to have in infinite supply, with their bright zigzag and octagonal patterns and mandalas mixed with homey earthy colours. There'd been a wall hanging, he remembered, a scarf in deep wine purple embroidered in gold, festooned with tiny silver bells. He'd loved to play with the bells until they shimmered with sound, and Imra had always stilled his hand gently and reminded him to be careful with it, to treat it with love. But he'd never said why, when Luca had asked. Against the backdrop of three massive white-walled barns and over seventeen acres of rolling land segmented into crop fields and pastures of grazing goats, the farmhouse still looked like a small cosy cottage despite its size and Luca remembered those blue walls throughout the house, each warm, close room filled with the comforting odds and ends of Imra's life. That pang struck Luca in the pit of his stomach again, that feeling of coming home when this wasn't home at all. He didn't have a home, not when his parents didn't want him, but wouldn't quite cut him loose to find a place of his own, and this place belonged to the man he'd told to shut the fuck up, like Imra didn't have feelings and wouldn't care if Luca cut him open. God, he was such a little shite. No wonder his parents didn't want him around, and banished him here. Maybe eating a handful of good farm dirt would clean his fucking sour mouth out. He stole a glance at Imra as the Land Rover turned into the winding earth drive that circled the house and ran toward the closest barn. Imra kept his gaze straight forward. Something about the set of his jaw said it might be better if Luca kept his mouth shut. Luca plucked at his lower lip, then looked away, dragging the high collar of his pullover up to cover the bottom half of his face, yanking the sleeves down over his hands, fidgeting with the hems. He stayed in his corner and made himself as small as possible, taking up as little of Imra's space as he could, until Imra pulled the Land Rover to a halt in the broad, flat expanse of swept earth in front of the closest barn. Imra unbuckled his seat belt and levered himself out of the driver's seat. After the door closed, hard enough to bounce the Land Rover on its tires, Luca slowly uncurled himself, peering over the collar of his pullover to watch as Imra circled the truck on his long, smoothly prowling strides, that mane of silver hair flowing around his shoulders in tossing waves. He flicked a single glance at Luca as he passed the passenger side window, then moved past to grip the straps of Luca's bag and heft it from the Land Rover's bed. Luca winced and uncurled himself then fumbled the seatbelt free and slunk out of the passenger's seat, flattening himself against the side of the truck to keep out of Imra's way. He reached for his bag. I'll take it, he mumbled, 
but Imra was already slinging it over his shoulder and made no move to set it down or into Luca's outstretched hand. Luca let his hand fall. Imra looked away from him, gaze flicking over the house, the barns, the pastures, with the air of someone in control of his environment, the air of a fierce protector shepherding his herd, a half-domesticated wildling that still remembered the wolf he had once been. Then those thoughtful searching eyes were on Luca again, and Luca flinched back, dropping his gaze to his feet and pulling even harder at his sleeves. If you have to smoke, Imra said, do it in the kitchen. The smell will upset the animals if you do it outside. The slightest spark, especially in a drier autumn, could send the fields or stores up in flames and could start a wildfire that would destroy this farm and hundreds of acres beyond. I won't. Smoke, that is. Luca shook his head quickly, then lifted his head enough to peek at Imra. Imra, I I'm sorry. I really am. I'm mad at my dad and taking it out on you. That was unfair of me. Imra's subtly expressive mouth tightened, then softened. Those shielded eyes warmed, the creases around them easing, losing their stiffness. I used to call you Angelka, he murmured. Angel, Luca repeated in a whisper. The soft nickname in Hungarian twisted up inside him, lacing its fingers into the chambers of his heart. He swallowed. I remember. He couldn't look at Imra, not when Imra watched him as if he expected something, as if searching for the bright-eyed angel Luca used to be. Luca stared at the barn, with its painted blue doors the same shade he'd remembered from so long ago. His eyes prickled, and he took a shaky breath. I'm not an angel, he said. Not anymore. Oh, you think so? Just ask anyone. Luca choked and shrugged stiff shoulders. Anyone with an opinion will tell you. I didn't ask anyone's opinion. A soft scuff of a booted foot in the dirt, and Imra's scent drew closer, a more concentrated blend of the scents of this entire place, laced with the heady, heavy aroma of honeysuckle flowers decaying into the soil and releasing their fermented fragrance to colour the cool, biting early autumn air. I asked yours. Luca shook his head, pulling back. He couldn't handle Imra so close, asking him that. He edged from between the man and the Land Rover, backing toward the barn. I don't know. I'm not the little boy you used to know. But eyes as blue as the barn doors followed him, refusing to let him escape. No, you're not, Imra said then stepped forward and brushed past him, the broad muscles of his back flexing hard against his shirt as he hefted Luca's bag against his shoulders and led him toward the house. Luca stared after him, his stomach tight. If he wasn't that boy to Imra any more, then who was he? 8. Luca's habit of toying with his lower lip, Imra discovered, was entirely distracting. Luca was doing it right now, as he followed Imra toward the side entrance to the house. Accessible via a broad grass-lined pathway between the rear of the barn and the wall of the house, Luca just kept playing at his mouth, pressing his fingertip into the peak of his upper lip, tugging out his full lower lip, pushing it in until it yielded and swelled his mouth into an overripe raspberry, gleaming and soft. Imra snorted under his breath and lengthened his stride, so it wasn't so easy to glance over and watch Luca toying and plucking at his lip with such utter innocence. Nineteen was no age, technically a man, but still too much a boy. Luca needed Imra's protection, his support. Nothing had made that more obvious than his cruel and barbed tongue. Those thorns were defensive, protective not aggressive, and it was Imra's job to shield him from more pain. Nothing else. If another man of Imra's age ever looked at Luca that way, Imra would nail him to the barn rafters. Imra would deserve no less, if he let his thoughts wander back to that ripe pink mouth for even half a moment. He distracted himself by letting out a long, low whistle through his teeth, controlling it until it swooped up at the end. Then he paused, listening. 
A few moments later, a series of soft yips came from over the hills, first three from the north, then three from the east. All clear, those yips said, and he nodded to himself. Good. Luca paused mid-stride, inhaling softly and casting Imra a wide-eyed look, gaze brimming with hope and longing. Siri and Ghoul? Imra shook his head. Siri Kli passed away a few years ago. Gulo about a year after. Oh, Luca's face fell, his eyes lowering. I'm sorry. They were loved and lived well. But Imra couldn't stand that look on Luca's face, and after a moment he let out another whistle. Two short high calls this time, one longer low sweep. The barks that answered were less controlled, more ecstatic, and within seconds two shaggy Australian shepherds came scrambling over the hills, one white with scattered black cookies and cream flecks, the other black with matching white flecks, their brilliantly deep golden eyes identical. Their tongues lolled in wide grins, fur flying as they raced across the fields toward the farmhouse. Imra had just enough time to set Luca's bag down before the dogs pounced him, tumbling into him with their tails wagging furiously. He sank down to one knee and wrapped his arms around them, burying his fingers in their ruffs and surrounding himself with the dusty, warm living scent of sun-heated fur and happy dog, speckled with pollen and the fragrance of the clover fields. These two, he said as a rough tongue rasped over his cheek, are Sirikli and Gulo's pups. Their brothers and sisters live on a few of the neighboring farms, but Vilagoshno and Shetitno stayed to keep me company. Luca wrinkled his brows, then stretched a hand out toward the dogs carefully. Vila, vi, Vila and Sheti. Imra grinned, then clucked his tongue. The moment they'd been given permission, the dogs swarmed on to Luca. Vila yipped and leaped up on her hind legs, resting her paws on his shoulders and thrusting her nose into his face to sniff him. Luca rocked back with a laugh, a bright and sweet thing like sugar and champagne, a sound Imra could almost breathe in and feel rolling over his tongue, a sound he'd missed deeply. He couldn't help smiling as he watched Luca wrap his arms around Vila and scratch through her ruff, squinting one eye up as she licked his cheek. Shetty milled around his legs, watching him, quiet and waiting, until Luca dropped a hand to let her sniff, before scratching underneath her jaw until she whined with pleasure. Luca's eyes lidded, softening. Hi, he murmured. Hi, girl. He glanced at Imra. Hungarian or Romungro? Romungro, light and dark. Luca gave him a dry look, a touch of impishness peering past the shroud of misery. Original, Imre. But you haven't asked which is light and which is dark. Luca frowned, leaning his cheek against Vila, with her black coat speckled in white. Light? Then he stroked his hand over Shetty's head, fingers smoothing her white, black speckled coat. Dark. But Vila is black and Shetty is white. But Vila's bright and jumping everywhere. She's blinding like bright white light. Luca laughed again, nuzzling into Vila's cheek, all the while never stopping that scratching that left Shetty's hind leg, Jack rabbiting against the ground until she raised little puffs of dust. Shetty's quieter and more patient and waits for you to come to her. She's calm as a quiet and peaceful night. Imra tore his gaze away from watching Luca with the dogs, but it was hard. When Luca smiled like that, his thorns vanished to leave a brightness as blinding as Vila's. Interesting how Luca could be so observant about others, even animals in all their simplicity. But he couldn't quite see himself. Very good, Angyulka, Imra murmured, then rose and hefted Luca's bag once more. Come then. I'll show you to your room. 9. The last thing Luca wanted was to let the dogs go, sending them bounding back out to the fields with another of Imra's special whistles. But they had a job to do, just like everything on the farm. He remembered that much, at least. Keeping the dogs from the herds meant leaving the younger goats vulnerable to foxes. 
Luca didn't know much about wildlife, but he knew this time of year the carnivores would be gorging themselves in preparation for a lean winter, and he wouldn't ask Imra to risk keeping Shetty and Vila in just so Luca could play. But the warm, clean, wonderful scent of dog still clung to him, reminding him of summer days playing with Siri and Ghoul, the dogs Imra had had when Luca was little. He'd tumbled in the dirt with them like a puppy himself and come in filthy, leaving his mother and father sighing in despair, and Imra chuckling as he loaned him a massive shirt to trail around in while his clothing was in the wash. He couldn't believe Siri and Ghoul were gone, but they'd already been adults when Luca was just a tiny thing. He didn't know why he was so surprised. Maybe it was just another of those sharp reminders that time didn't stop, and neither did the little pains that came with being an adult. Though at least Imra was smiling again, and no longer looking at Luca like he'd sliced ribbons from his heart. Luca followed him into the house, stepping into the nearly overwhelming scent of baking apples that had always pervaded the interior of Lohara. Surrounding himself in that scent was better than wrapping himself in a warm-down blanket and burrowing under the covers on a frosty day. He stopped just past the threshold and breathed, taking it deep into his chest. Yet Imra was moving on, through the narrow foyer, past the anteroom with its half-wood, half-stone walls and round mirrors in ornate antique bronze frames, up the slim staircase of dark, polished oak with its stylized banisters. Luca followed, trailing his fingers along the stone of the wall, tracing how the texture of the paint wash laid over it changed it. Everything woke more and more memories. That texture under his fingers the creak of the fifth step, the understated, quiet paintings in black and white ink lined in a diagonal following the stairs, capturing ancient artists' pen renditions of flora, complete with hand-scribbled notes in multiple languages. He paused under a sketch of spraying blooms and traced his fingertips over the Latin with a small smile. Alcea rosea, he read off softly. Hollyhocks then took the steps two at a time, catching up with Imra. Lohera had always been a treasure trove of little wonders and curiosities, but seeing it now was like finding it anew, and Luca had to stop himself from picking up the little silver sculptures on the tiny tables lining the upstairs hallway, or stopping to trace the triangular patterns in the deeply colored rose, black and blue runner, whose dark shade of cobalt perfectly matched the walls. Second door from the end. Luca had known before Imra stopped that it would be there, but he couldn't help the little thrill of excitement that shot from the tips of his toes to the base of his spine as Imra pushed the door open, then swept a gently mocking bow and gestured for Luca to precede him. Luca nearly spun into the room. It was small, but that was what made it perfect. He'd always loved small spaces places that felt like a secret, somewhere he could huddle like a wee fairy in a wooded hollow and keep all his treasures and mysteries to himself in his own little world. This room had been that place for him as a child, his special secret hollow, where on weekends he whispered the things no one could know before leaving them safe here when he went back to his ordinary, unsecret, unspecial bedroom at the old house in Harrogate. The bed was a cosy iron-framed sleigh, piled high with quilts and thick, lush pillows. The blue walls had been turned into a deep blue night sky, painted with a glowing moon so detailed it rivaled the real moon, luminous and swollen and surrounded by a thousand wishing stars. A rosewood chest sat at the foot of the bed, polished to a deep shine, its sides carved with ornate vines Luca knew from tracing them over and over. They matched the low-carved shelf that sat below the window, piled high with cushions and quilts to turn it into a window seat. An entire wall was taken up by a massive bookshelf full of the strangest oldest books on the strangest oldest subjects, and even without touching them, Luca knew the feeling of gilt leather spines and the smell of the pages and all the wonders held inside.
and that scarf still over the bed, pinned up in a graceful swoop, those little bells dangling from the fringe. He laughed, spread his arms, and flopped back onto the bed. He sank in a good foot, nearly swallowed into the thick layers of quilts. Imre chuckled, stepped inside, and set Luca's bag down on the rocking chair in the corner. Then he folded his arms on the footboard of the bed, leaning over the edge to look down at Luca, his hair falling over his shoulder in a tumble of steel and moonlight. Luca tilted his head back, looking up at Imra with his heart a thing of sweet, giddy prickles. You didn't change it, he breathed. My old room. Upsized a little, bigger bed. A small smile lingered on Imra's lips. Not that you ever slept in here. The fondness in that smile turned the prickles in Luca's heart into needles, piercing him deep and injecting some strange, aching thing that filled it up too full. He caught his lower lip between his teeth, then dragged his gaze away from Imra, tilting his head back to look up at the painted-on moon. He couldn't remember what he'd said to tell Imra he'd wanted this years ago, but he remembered the next weekend he'd come to visit, the room had been repainted. He'd tumbled into Imra and hugged him so hard he'd nearly bowled all six foot six of Imra to the floor with all three and a half stone of Luca. And he'd almost, almost stayed in the room all night when it was magic and he didn't want to stop counting the stars. But then the sound of the wind in the trees had crept under his skin, like it always had. And the creak of the barn doors, querulous and moaning like they were calling out to the owls in the rafters, and the hoo-hoo-hooing owls called back. He'd trembled in the dark, trying too hard to be a big boy, refusing a nightlight until he couldn't stand it any more. Then he'd bundled up a quilt against his chest, tiptoed down the hall to Imra's room, crawled up onto the foot of his massive bed and curled up in a ball there, small and unobtrusive as he could be. And wrapped in that quilt, tucked into that little corner with the light from Imra's fireplace warming him, he'd slept better than he had his entire life. I was afraid of the dark, he murmured. You made a very good foot warmer, Imra said dryly. Are you still afraid of the dark? Not any more. Luca laughed, then dropped his voice to a deep rasp, scratchy in the back of his throat. I am the dark, I am the night. When Imra only looked at him blankly, Luca sighed. Batman, no? No. God, Imra, we've got to get you some books from this century. Comic books count. Luca pushed himself up on his elbows then froze as a cool kiss brushed his cheeks. Imra's hair, drifting down to curtain both their faces, trailing in caresses as soft as breath against Luca's skin. The cat's cradle strings of his heart snapped tight. He didn't dare lift his gaze, but he couldn't stop himself, raising his eyes. They locked with Imra's, hovering mere inches away. So much at Lohera was blue, rich, warm, comforting blue, but it could never match the blue of Imra's eyes, the colour and indescribable shade that Luca could only call the colour of strength, security, patience. If emotions had colours, every emotion Luca had felt as he'd sat in a field for hours and braided stalk after stalk of grass into the perfect ring was in those eyes. And Luca wondered if Imra remembered that day, that moment, that promise that didn't feel so much like a childish whim when Luca's lips tingled and his heart spun in a crazed tumult like a carnival wheel, his stomach drawing up tight. The slightest tilt of his head and that long, lush beard would brush against his cheeks, a little push and he could press his mouth to those expressive lips, a little, a little nothing. Imra pulled back straightening to his full, towering height and looking down at Luca strangely. A subtle shake of his head, at Luca, at himself. Luca didn't know, and couldn't figure out what it meant, but it cut hard, cut deep, before Imra turned away, lifting a hand in a casual farewell flick. Take the rest of the day to get settled in, drifted over his shoulder. I need to go lay down seed, 
Then bring the herds in for the night. If you're hungry, help yourself to the kitchen. I'll be in to make supper once the goats are bedded down. Oh, Lucas said faintly, voice strangling in his throat. Okay. But he didn't even get the K out before Imra was gone, vanishing into the hallway. Lucas stared after him, gut churning, then slumped back onto the bed with a groan, dragging his hands over his face. Ah, fuck. Ten. As he walked the rows he'd tilled in his farthest two acres the day before, Imra considered the idea that he might just be punishing himself. Hand-seeding was arduous at best, exhaustingly grueling at worst, manually scattering the mixture of clover and alfalfa seeds that would replenish what the last harvest of sweet corn had drained from the soil. This field would transition into grazing pasture for the goats until the next seeding rotation. But he often found the practiced, repetitive motion of casting seeds into the rows soothing and meditative. He could have brought the hopper out and finished in half the time, but sometimes he did things the old-fashioned way just because the physical labor felt good. And right now, physical labor was distracting, both punishment and meditation, when he needed every last bit of both. For half a second, as Luca had pushed up close to him, as sweet-smelling breaths had wound through his beard like tugging fingers to infiltrate down to his skin, Imra had almost... he didn't know. Most of the time he was too worried about planting and harvesting schedules, milking, production, and the million other things that went into running a farm to even wonder about anything else. Very few people tugged his strings that way. It wasn't just how he was wired. He needed more. More than most needed to form a basic attraction, and finding that more was difficult enough before looking past issues of compatibility and sexuality. So he filled his days with seed and feed, his nights with craft work and planning, and paid little to no mind to thoughts of partners, attraction, sex. And he needed to keep it that way. Luca wasn't just any pretty young just legal thing. He was Marco's son. Imra repeated that to himself each time he flung his arm out to scatter another handful of seed, until the labor and the beating afternoon sun burned the mantra into his skin. By the time he'd seeded both fields and gone over them to track and water the seed, his mind was empty of all, save the chores he needed to finish for the day. The goats needed to be brought in, and the two in six stalls needed to be checked and fed. He'd need to feed the dogs, clean the pumps in the goat barn, muck the horses. Plenty enough to keep him busy, and his mind occupied. He headed back into the barn and mopped the sweat from his face with a saddle blanket, before saddling up Andrash, a sturdy blue roan gelding who seemed built for carrying someone of Imra's bulk. Andrash snorted and nudged Imra's shoulder with his velvet nose, lipping his shirt, while Imra fitted a halter and lead to Jofia, then attached her lead to Andrash's saddle. Jofia stepped out of a stall on high, dainty steps, her show horse breeding in every line of her, her silver dapple coat shining black beneath her blonde mane. When she thrust her hand into his palm, it was with the air of royalty demanding deference, and Imra couldn't help smiling. You, I think, will like Luca, he murmured as he rested his brow to the mares. He is just like you, desperate for simple, kind affection, but only on his own terms, and he would rather bite his own hand off than ask. He couldn't help but wonder what had happened, as he swung up onto Andrasha's back and took both horses out into the fields. Marco was a good man, a good, attentive father. Lucia was a kind mother, an intelligent woman, and she and Marco had doted on Luca from birth. Even if they were both busy with their careers, Marco a semiconductor engineer in Sheffield's booming tech sector, Lucia an executive career coach, Imra couldn't imagine either neglecting or mistreating Luca. So what had happened to leave Luca this mess of thorns, desperate for love but too prickly to let anyone in arm's reach? 
The question weighed heavily on Imra's mind as he ran the horses through the fields, letting them stretch their legs, before bringing them about to round up the herds, driving the goats with the horses while Vila and Shetty nipped the rebellious beast's heels to keep them in line. He only kept fifty-odd goats, separated into two herds of twenty-five. As much as seventeen acres would support, when he only used ten acres for grazing pasturage and rotated the rest with seed crops and the apple orchard. But even fifty goats were a fractious, mischievous lot for one man and two dogs to handle. And by the time they'd rounded the little buggers up and into the paddock feeding into the largest barn, the sun was setting in a wild burst of pinks and oranges and blooming, furiously vivid reds. One thing he'd missed most about North Yorkshire, during his years at uni in Nottingham, had been the sunsets. Every sunset made him think of a song so joyous it couldn't help shouting itself across the sky in a ringing of colours, only for that last poignant note to trail off into the reverent silence of night. It wasn't until Vila had nudged the last nanny goat into the paddock and bumped the gate shut with her muzzle that Imra realized he had an audience. He whistled for the dogs to go into the house, sending them racing off, the door flap rattling in their wakes. Imra pulled his shirt off and rubbed the sweat from his eyes with it, squinting across the field at the slim figure leaning against the fence wall. Luca rested his elbows atop the uneven upper ledge of the stacked stone wall, chin propped in one hand, pale eyes tracking Imra. When he realized he had Imra's attention, he lifted a hand in a wave. Imra didn't realize he was hoping for a smile, an impish, sweet smile, until he didn't get one. Just a shallow twitch of Luca's lips, depthless and sad. What had happened to him? Imra checked Jophia's tether, then guided both horses toward the wall with a squeeze of his thighs against Andrash's flanks. A few goats trailed with curious bleats, but wandered off a few steps later, more interested in their water trough. As Imra cantered closer, Luca leaned over the fence wall, stretching his hand out. You have horses now, he said, and for all that he wouldn't smile, there was a soft elation in his voice. Bought them from a retiring showbreeder, a whim, but one I've never regretted. Imra swung himself down from Andrasha's back and caressed the roan's neck, until his eyes drooped, and he lowered his nose into Luca's palm with a soft, pleased wicker. Luca made a delighted sound as he stroked over Andrasha's nose, his eyes widening, wonder glimmering in pale green depths. That wonder turned into a quick, spontaneous laugh that he clamped down on as swiftly as it had been startled out of him when Jophia shoved her nose in with a jealous, demanding thrust. Imra snorted and nudged the mare, who stared at Luca imperiously as if challenging his worth, his right to touch her. Luca stared right back with a bold, fearless curiosity. You look quite corked off, he said, and lightly rested his hand to Jophia's forelock. Are you always like this? You'll want to watch that one, Imra said. It's not that she's mean, just prickly and temperamental. Luca hummed a soft sound under his breath and gently stroked his fingertips down Jophia's crest to rest his palm to her cheek. He never took his gaze from her dark, intelligent eyes, never noticed Imra watching him, but Imra couldn't look away. They're never really mean. Luca murmured. They're just scared is all. They usually have a reason to be. What's your reason, then? Imra cleared his throat and pushed the thought from his mind. She's a good deal like you. Wicked but sweet. Bit of a terror. But she'll love you as long as it's on her terms. Do you ride? Luca hummed a thoughtful sound under his breath, gaze still fixed on Jophia. No, never. Would you like to learn? Luca caught a breath, lifting his head and looking at Imra. Can I? I'll teach you. I take the horses out on a daily run to stretch their legs and check the walls. Normally I keep Jophia on the tether, but you can take her tomorrow. Luca looked back up at the mare, still stroking his fingers gently over the delicate bones of her face.
She held stock still for him, submitting to his long, slender hands in a way she never had for Imra, even when she demanded Imra's affection. Luca had a way of moving his hands as though making music with every curl of his finger and flow of his wrist, and he had Jophia in thrall with each caress of his fingertips. Jophia, he repeated softly. It's a pretty name. Hungarian this time. Aye, you have an ear for the pronunciations. I learned from you. Luca worried his lower lip with one tooth. What if I fall trying to ride her? Then you get back up and get back on. Imra tore his gaze from watching those soft fingertips graze the regal lines of Jophia's jaw. She won't mistreat you. He paused. Much. He tugged on both horses' halters and led them toward the gate. Luca trailed on the other side of the fence wall, keeping one hand on Jophia the entire time, stroking her neck and fingering her mane. Can I help with anything? he asked breathlessly, then ducked his head and cleared his throat. I mean, if I wouldn't be in the way. Imra bit back a grin. Heaven forbid Luca look too eager. Do you remember how to rake stalls? Might be even better at it now that I'm taller than the rake. Imra snubbed Jophia's lead and Andrasha's reins to the gatepost, then vaulted the gate. He wouldn't risk opening it when one of those canny little horned monsters might rush the gap like it was a game. Writing himself, he dusted his hands off and tossed his head toward the barn just back of the house. You can clear the horses' stalls before we put them down for the night. I need to check the sick goats. He strode for the barn with Luca on his heels. Only half aware he was doing it, Imra shortened his strides so Luca could keep up. Though Luca was a leggy thing at just under six feet, his long, free-swinging steps fluid and swift. Together they slipped under the shadow of the barn. Imra flicked the overhead lights on, pointed Luca to the rake on the wall, and left him to muck the two large box stalls Imra had installed after buying the horses. Imra let himself into the first of the six stalls, six total, though only two were occupied. In the first, one of his best milking nannies, Gia, lay on her bed of sweet hay, breathing shallowly, her square pupils and golden irises glazed. Imra knelt and cradled her head in his lap, soothing her with soft sounds under his breath, stroking the bristly hairs between her horns and down her nose. Her nose was dry, hot, and he leaned over for the towel he'd left resting in a bucket on the stall wall. He dabbed her nose, moistening it, then pulled the feeding bottle from its slot and fitted the nipple between her lips. Gently he pumped trickles into her mouth, massaging her throat to help her swallow. Mostly water, but mixed with a liquid nutrient concoction and the oral medication the vet had provided to expel toxins while strengthening immune resistance. From the messes in the hay, the last round had worked. Though Gia was feverish and unresponsive, her heartbeat was stronger, her breathing less erratic than this morning. Imra coaxed her to drink the entire mixture, then tugged over her feed bucket, the bin filled with a paste of alfalfa, clover, and dry feed mulched into something that wouldn't require much effort or chewing. He scooped up a thick green gob on two fingers, then slipped his fingers into her mouth. After a feeble moment, her tongue fluttered. Then her lips worked, gumming at his fingers, sucking the paste away. Good girl, he whispered, massaging her throat again and reaching for another fingerful of paste. Come on, girl, eat for me. Luca's head appeared over the door of the stall, green eyes liquid. He bit his lip, then whispered, What's wrong with them? Monkshood, Imra answered. As he fed Gia another fingerful of the paste, he watched Luca from the corner of his eye. I keep my grazing acreage free of weeds, but the goats will stretch their heads over someone else's fence now and then, or get out into the woods and find things they shouldn't. Monkshood is poisonous and can take hold wild around here. Luca clutched hard at the rake and peered into the other stall where another nanny, Myrta, rested panting in the hay. Will they be all right? I don't know. 
Monkshood is potent, but they only nibbled a little or they'd already be dead. All I can do is hope they purge it and manage to recover. They look so sad. They're in pain. Imra stroked Gia's soft, silky ears, then fed her more, listening to the encouraging, sucking sounds as she ate. If it gets too bad, I'll have to put them down. Please don't let it get that bad. Imra! Luca gasped, covering his mouth with one hand. You can't! I don't want to. He closed his eyes, sighing heavily. But leaving them to slowly suffer to death is far more cruel. He opened his eyes when the stall door squealed. Luca pulled the stall open and stepped inside, his boots crunching on the hay. He dropped to his knees at Gia's flank, bent over her, and pressed his cheek to her shaggy black and white side, just over her heart. One pale hand stroked down her side, moving gently over her stomach. The goat bleated weakly, then settled, pulling her head away from Imra to lean toward Luca. Please get better, please get better, Luca whispered, closing his eyes. Please. Imra stared at him, his heart knotting into the strangest twist. Luca. Luca screwed his eyes tighter shut and turned his face into Gia's shoulder, his own shoulders trembling. I don't want them to die. He choked, muffled against soft fur. Ah, Luca. Then we'll have to nurse them back to health. Imra couldn't stop himself. He leaned over the warm animal cradled between them and rested his hand to the top of Luca's head. Soft, dark hair slipped over his fingers, catching on the hairs on his knuckles. Go finish up the horse's stalls while I make these two comfortable, and then I'll show you what to watch for and how to help them if anything changes. All right? Luca lifted his head, looking up at Imra with a gut-wrenching mixture of naked hope and vulnerability, pulling Imra into pale eyes that showed a reflection of himself in every pain and fear Luca begged him to soothe. Promise, Luca whispered. I promise, Imra answered, because he could say nothing else. When Luca looked at him that way, that pleading gaze pulling on pieces of his heart he hadn't known he possessed, no lost all meaning, along with many other things that once meant more than everything to Imra. Honor, decency, willpower. He turned his face away from Luca and focused on the sick animal in his lap. Go, he said roughly. The sooner it's done, the sooner we'll get her on her feet. Oh, oh, okay. Imra listened while Luca scrambled to his feet, then closed his eyes and cursed himself roundly under his breath. No, he told himself, and willed it to mean something, anything. No, Imra, no. Eleven. Luca raked out the horse's stalls and put down fresh hay, but the soft bleatings from the sick stalls distracted him as Imra massaged the goats' stomachs. He couldn't help it. They'd looked so pathetic, so sad, and he'd almost started crying right then and there like a little sobbing nit. He didn't know what was wrong with him. He hadn't cried over an animal since his cat was hit by a car their first week in Sheffield, and the vet had had to put her down. Then again, he'd not been around animals since then either. He'd never gotten another pet after losing Persia, never wanting to face that loss again. He could chalk the tears up to the fact that he was stressed out and upset, or he could just fob it off to being a big effin' softy for small furry things. That wasn't so bad, was it? Imra was soft on them, and Imra was... God, he was amazing. Those hands were just as gentle, just as kind as Luca remembered, whether they were feeding a sick goat or, or, or resting on top of Luca's head, just enough pressure and weight to send comforting warmth radiating down through him to pool in the pit of his stomach. He jerked from his trance to realize he'd just been standing there, staring toward the open barn door and the deepening twilight. His cheeks heated. He glanced over his shoulder at the six stalls, then propped the rake against the wall and slipped out into the evening coolness. 
The horses still waited at post near the fence, and Luca leaned in to stretch a hand out for them to sniff. Remember me? he asked softly. I promise I won't hurt you. I just want to take you inside. Is that okay? Jophia lipped his hand. The other one, a bigger, bulkier horse with a lustrous silvery blue coat and smoky dark legs and muzzle, nosed at his fingers. He laughed and scratched their poles. He'd never been around horses, except on a school field trip to see horse-drawn carriages, and he'd never gotten to touch them. He climbed the fence wall, settled straddling it, and spent a good ten minutes scratching them both around their ears and crests and jaws, until Jophia's blonde eyelashes trembled, and the other horse lowered his head to put its full weight into Luca's palm. Quiet pleasure washed through him, and he lingered a few moments before carefully untying the knots on their leads. He stole a peek at the goats, but most of them had already taken themselves into the big barn. The only ones still milling around weren't anywhere near the gate. He hopped off the fence, pulled the gate open, and gently tugged the horse's leads. Come on now, Imra will kill me if the goats get out. The horses obliged as if they were used to this, a little hop-skip in their steps as they trotted through the gate, then waited patiently while he closed and latched it before taking their leads again, one to either side, and coaxed them into the smaller barn. Imra was still in with the sick goats, and Luca was as quiet as he could be in urging the horses toward their stalls. He wasn't sure which was which but they seemed to know their own spaces and split off on their own, each into one stall and then the other. And each waited patiently while he fumbled with removing their tack and hanging it up on the hooks in the stalls. Though Jophia nipped his shoulder when he pulled her halter a little too tight, trying to get at the buckles. Sorry, girl. He laughed and pressed his cheek to hers. Sorry, I'm still figuring this out. Once he'd hung everything up, he tentatively used the saddle blankets hanging in the stalls to rub both horses down. They seemed to like it, so even if it wasn't quite right, it didn't seem to be bad. Then he filled the water buckets in their stalls from the barn pump and hose, before poking around the feed room, until he found a bag that matched the dregs in their feed bags and refilled them. I'm not so bad at this, he thought with a touch of satisfaction, then peered over the goat's pen again, watching Imra as he leaned over her and murmured under his breath. Imra? Luca risked quietly. I put the horses in their stalls. Imra looked up as if pulling from a trance. You did? And took off their tack and rubbed them down and fed them? Luca looked away rubbing the back of his neck and shrugging. That's what you're supposed to do, right? Aye, thank you. A rumble, soft and appreciative, and Luca ducked his head and hoped like hell he wasn't blushing as much as it felt like. He didn't know what to say, his tongue thick, but after a few moments Imra spoke again. Here, Gia's resting, come see. Luca edged into the stall and sank to his knees, looking down at the goat. She seemed to be breathing deeper, and her eyes were closed, but Imra gently pried one open, drawing the lids apart to reveal those strange, slit-square pupils goats had. Gia's were so large Luca almost couldn't see the yellow rings of her eyes. You can tell how drugged she is on the monk's hood by how dilated her eyes are, Imra murmured. This is too much, even for low light. Her pupils also don't respond to light, look. He moved his palm so it cast a shadow over the goat's eye, then moved it again, but the pupil didn't expand or contract. If she were awake, they wouldn't track moving objects in her field of vision either. That's the best way to tell how conscious she is, by how visually responsive she is. The monk's hood causes neurological pain, so she might not be able to get up for a while even if she's recovering. Luca curled his fists against his thighs. Is she? Recovering? Imra looked up at him. Luca felt like that steady blue gaze was measuring him, judging how much he could stand to hear. Then, she ate more today than she could yesterday. It's an improvement. I don't know if she's truly recovering yet. 
The important thing is hydration to flush her system and nutrition to fortify her. So I bottle feed water mixed with her nutrient solution and medication. She'll need another bottle right before bed, then another first thing in the morning. I still need to feed Marta, so I'll show you the proper mix ratio. Luca nodded, but it took a moment to stand and follow Imra. He lingered with Gia for a few more moments, stroking between her ears. It felt wrong to leave her alone and in pain, but there were other animals that needed help. Myrta was in better shape, and managed to lift her own head while Imra showed Luca how to bottle-feed her and massage her throat. He let Luca hold the bottle, and he couldn't help smiling when the little white goat strained toward the nipple, sucking harder and harder for more. She's younger, Imra murmured, as he mixed pace to finger-feed her. Barely old enough for this year's breeding season, stronger, more resilient, and she'll recover faster. Good, Luca whispered, his heart beating harder as the goat gave a crooning little sound and leaned into him. I'm glad. There was something nice about helping Imra settle the goats in and make them comfortable, something that left Luca's chest warm. Watching Imra work with the animals was mesmerizing, the way they seemed to naturally trust him and submit to his touch. Luca wished he had that kind of gift, a way of making small, vulnerable things trust him. Like you, Luca? Like you trust him, even though he's a stranger you haven't seen for ten years? He growled at his inner voice. I'm not vulnerable. His inner voice remained smugly silent. Once they finished, Imra held the door to the stall for Luca, then closed it behind him and offered a towel. Go wash up. I'll close the herds up and be in to make supper. Let me make supper. Luca scrubbed his hands, then plucked the towel between his fingers and lowered his eyes to trace the red and white plaid terry cloth. I, I don't want to freeload. I didn't ask to come here, but you didn't ask for me to be here either. I, I just want to carry my weight. You don't have to do that, Luca. You helped with the horses tonight. I need to keep busy. He smiled slightly, though it brought a lump to his throat. I'll get bored if I don't. When I get bored, I get in trouble. I know. Imra chuckled. Very well. Try not to burn the kitchen down. Hey, I cooked for myself most of the time during my gap year, you know. Curry ramen does not count as cooking. How did you know? Luca jerked his head up to find Imra watching him with an arch, knowing look that said he hadn't known a damned thing, but Luca had just given himself away. Luca scowled. Oh, you arse! For just a moment Imra grinned, wide enough to flash fierce teeth and light his eyes with a wolfish gleam, there and gone again, but that grin hit like a punch right to Luca's gut. I'll see you for supper then, Angelka. Uh, right, yeah, supper, he stammered. Then turned and fled to the house, with Imra's deep, rumbling chuckle trailing after him. Twelve. Closing the herds in, for Imra was just a matter of chasing the last few stragglers into the barn, checking their dry feed and water, and doing spot checks for injuries or illness. Sick or wounded goats were usually easier to spot during herding. They were the ones who fell behind, lamed or dazed and wandering. But it didn't hurt to give them one last look over, and it looked like they'd need their hooves trimmed soon. Might be an easier job with Luca, though he'd have to give him the older goats, who were accustomed enough to the process not to kick. Oi, Luca. If Imra was honest with himself, he was avoiding going back to the house. Luca had been here less than eight hours, and already the entire atmosphere of the farm had changed. He fit right in as if he'd never left, and reminded Imra too achingly much of what it had been like to have people, friends close enough to be family, people who were in his home as often as not, lighting it with their warmth. After the wards had moved away, a certain quiet emptiness had settled over Lohera. 
Imra's family was sparse and scattered, many Hungarian Romani who had remained in Hungary instead of emigrating elsewhere, and the branch who'd settled in England and taken on the Claiborne name generations ago had been fiercely clannish. So fiercely clannish they rarely married outside of Roma lines and had few children. Imra had been an only child. His parents passed away years ago. He had cousins he didn't know by name and little else. He was friendly with the other local farmers, but when they were all busy managing their own homesteads, most had little time for anyone save their own. Lonely, Imra? He smiled grimly and leaned his elbows against the fence, looking up at the house. The light was on in the upstairs bathroom window. The frosted glass fogged. Luca must still be in the shower. No point in going in anyway, then, unless he wanted to use the downstairs bathroom. But it had only a bathtub, no shower, and he doubted he'd have time for a soak before supper when the antiquated pipes pumped slowly and the bath took forever to fill. He caught a glimpse of movement against the window, just a silhouette and a hint of paleness, and jerked his gaze away to glare fiercely toward the deep purple line of the evening horizon. And therein lay the other problem, a problem that wasn't Luca, but Imra himself. With a sigh under his breath, he slid his hands into his pockets and pushed away from the fence, heading out toward the field. He told himself he was walking to the fences to check for breaches, but he'd walked them just this morning. What he needed right now was the sense of clover and honeysuckle, the sound of crickets, the first soft low call of tiny owls in the far trees, answered by the deeper, more sonorous hoots of the barn owls, who kindly kept the mice from his door and his stores of grain. The September night air was crisp as the first bite of a cool red apple, and he closed his eyes, tilting his head back into the breeze and letting it slip over his face and through his hair, washing his thoughts clean until he was blank and empty and quiet. He'd never minded the loneliness before, when he liked his silence. Silence was hard to come by when other people seemed to manufacture noise like a commodity. And Luca seemed to make noise just by existing. The bright noise of his repressed emotions, bursting to get out and screaming even when he didn't say a word. When Imra had been a child, his mother would make stars come out for him. She'd turn down all the lamps in the kitchen, back before the farmhouse had had electricity, then light a single oil lantern in the center of the table. Then, with one of her darning needles, she'd punch tiny holes scattered across a piece of black cardstock and hold it over the lamp. The lamplight would shine through in beams, bursting through those tiny holes and spreading onto the ceiling of the kitchen in glowing dots of stars against the blue painted stone. His father had been the one who'd painted the walls and ceilings of Lohera blue. It feels alive now, Robbie Claiborne had said and held his wife and son close. It feels like a home. It did. It had been the Claiborne home for generations, but Imra supposed that legacy would end with him. He was too old for children, and not particularly interested in fathering them by conventional means. Not that forty-six was any age, but... He exhaled deeply, opening his eyes and looking up at the purpled, star-strewn sky. Not his mother's stars but familiar ones nonetheless, even if they couldn't hold him tonight. His head was full of as much noise as the house. This wasn't helping. He trudged down the hill and back to the house. The bathroom light was dark, so Luca must be out. Imra let himself in through the kitchen door in the rear of the house, then drew up short as savory scents rolled over him, practically crawling down his throat to curl in his gullet with a hungry, grumbling roar. Luca stood at the stove, barefoot, in a pair of clean jeans and a T-shirt that, for some bizarre reason, seemed to have been designed to fit improperly. Clinging tight in the waist, but so loose in the neck that it slewed to one side over a pale, curving shoulder, dark blue against white skin. Imra found himself contemplating the sharp protrusion of bone against that fine skin, and promptly redirected his attention to the pot bubbling on the stove. 
The dogs were nowhere to be found, their food bowls emptied and left in that haphazard scatter that said they'd gorged and run off to play, leaving just Luca and layers upon layers of delectable aromas. Well, this was new. He wasn't sure what to do with the odd feeling of coming home to a pretty thing in his kitchen, cooking for them both, and bustling about with quiet efficiency. He must have made some kind of sound, because Lucas started, then glanced over his shoulder and smiled a shy, utterly fetching smile. Hope you weren't saving that steak for anything. It was already defrosted, so it needed to be cooked soon anyway. Belatedly, Imre remembered to shut the door behind him then shook his head. No, nothing special. He felt an utter dolt, standing awkwardly in his own kitchen like he didn't belong. He cleared his throat. What are you making? Steak and onions in asparagus bits, and baby potatoes in, um, there's like this really thick cream in an unlabeled container, and it tasted kind of like sour cream, so I really hope that's what it is. If it's not, Please don't tell me what I just put in my mouth. Imra chuckled weakly. Just sour cream. Tastes a bit different when it's made with goat's milk. I didn't even know you could make sour cream with goat's milk. Luca grinned. Cool. Yeah, Imra said, tongue thick. Cool. Luca wrinkled his nose at him playfully. Don't try to be edgy, Imra. It doesn't work. Many things weren't working right now. Imra's brain, his tongue. Thank God Luca didn't seem to notice Imra was just standing there, his hands clenching and unclenching as if looking for something to do to jumpstart his frozen thoughts. The boy moved between skillet and pot, stirring and scrambling, humming under his breath. But after a moment Luca glanced back at him and flashed that sweet grin again, a wild witch grin both wicked and innocent, and doing entirely disconcerting things to Imra's pulse. It'll be done in about ten minutes, Lucas said. I tried to leave hot water in the shower. Don't be a heathen and come to supper smelling like goats, eh? Right. That cue finally signalled Imra's legs to work again. He ducked out of the kitchen and into the hallway, then dragged himself up the stairs and away from the sound of Luca's voice rising over the kitchen, breaking into lilting, only slightly off-key song the moment Imra was out of the room. Too much noise. Too much everything. He shut himself in the bathroom, closed his eyes, and slumped against the wall. How the hell had he ended up running from a nineteen-year-old slip of a boy in his own bloody house? Thirteen. Luca was surprised by how much he enjoyed cooking. He'd spent most of his gap year on mini-holiday, faffing about Sheffield and the surrounding villages. While now and then he'd whipped together something for himself, it was just to fill his belly. He'd never thought much of making something that deliberately tasted good so someone else could enjoy it. But he'd picked up enough watching his parents in the kitchen that it wasn't hard to cube a steak and cut asparagus and toss them together with onions and a little olive oil and spices. What was hard, he thought, was realizing that, for the first time in a long time, he felt happy to be somewhere. He'd had a few moments on holiday, moments when he'd had too much beer and was doing something reckless just to feel like he could fly. Those moments had been pure joy, though he'd always had to come down. Come home, when home was never somewhere he wanted to be. Not now, not ever, though he'd rather have left by his own choice. But he wanted to be at Lohera. He'd realized that the moment the Land Rover had turned onto the familiar curving drive. So much he was afraid he'd embarrass himself, scrambling to do anything he could to earn the right to stay. He didn't think Imra would put him out as his parents had, but if he did, that was the end of things for Luca. That idle daydream of sleeping on park benches in Leeds might well become his reality, and while the concept had sounded glamorously bohemian when he was ready to cut and run, the reality of cold, miserable nights and getting chased about by the police and being treated like human filth when he tried to apply for jobs was neither romantic nor particularly desirable 
nor in any way funny. Imra wouldn't let that happen to him, he thought. Not the Imra he remembered. Would he? By the time the sound of running water cut off from upstairs, Luca had sunk himself into a brood. Mulling over his options once, Imra too got sick of him and put him out on his ass. He couldn't crash at Zave's. His parents wouldn't let him when Zave was off at uni, but Zave might let him stop up in his dorm for a bit. There were youth hostels, queer youth shelters. Concert over then, Imra asked at his back. Luca jerked, heart dropping, breaths halting. He'd not heard Imra come down the stairs. For such a big man, he moved with remarkable silence, not even creaking the tattletale fifth step. And Luca nearly dropped the spatula when that quiet voice rumbled at his side. He looked up. Imra leaned against the counter, sleek as a seal with his damp hair slicked back, water darkened to iron grey, droplets still speckling his beard. He'd changed into clean, less ragged jeans and another open-throated Henley, a soft cream-coloured thing that brought his tawny skin into stark relief, his entire body nearly glowing with lingering heat from the shower. Oh, Lucas squeaked. Um, oh, Imra repeated and folded his arms over his chest. Corded sinew strained at the shoulder seams of his shirt. Um, Lucas scowled. Don't be a prick. You caught me off guard. Ever so sorry. Imra glanced at the skillet. Smells good. It's done. I just need to... I've got it. Imra didn't even wait for him to finish before he reached over Luca's head and opened one of the high cabinets. The deep, pleasantly pungent scent of the bar of dark lava soap from the upstairs shower washed over Luca. The scent clung to him after his shower, too, but it wasn't the same as the heady mix it made when blended with Imra's musk. Luca's gaze fell to the strip of bronzed skin bared when Imra lifted his arms. Just a glimpse of ridged sinew and the band of his underwear above the low waist of his jeans, before Luca closed his eyes and let that scent flow into him like a drugging draught of opium. You all right? Imra asked. You've not come over faint standing over the stove? Ah! Uh, Lucas snapped his eyes open to find those warm blue eyes locked on him intently. He licked his lips and stared down into the skillet. No, no, I'm fine. I was just thinking. Deep thoughts, then? Yeah, Lucas said weakly. Deep thoughts. He felt the moment Imra stopped looking at him and moved away with an amused sound, leaving room for Luca to breathe. They worked together in silence, Imra setting the table with brightly painted earthenware plates and cups, Luca following up to split portions between them, with the lion's share going to the lion-sized man who probably needed ten times more fuel than Luca. In this moment, the rhythm was comfortable. Easy. Luca loved the kitchen at Lohera, the dining table right there in the same room, the copper pots and pans and skillets shining on their hooks in stark contrast to the blue walls, the cool stone floors, the old brick hearth, the long banks of windows, the polished wood table centred by a tall glass jar of fresh green apples. Imra poured iced tea and Luca put out forks and knives. Then Imra pulled out a chair for Luca and stood over it, waiting. Luca blinked. It took a moment to click, and when it did he tried to say, What are you doing? but only got out something resembling, Cook. By all means, Imra said with that dry, subtle humour. Stand to eat if you're more comfortable that way. Luca twisted his mouth up, then let it go in an explosive sigh. That sigh unfortunately, did nothing to dispel the things flitting around inside his chest. He sat gingerly, leaning forward in the seat. As Imra pushed the chair in gently behind him, thick knuckles brushed Luca's shoulder blades. He went stiff, struggling not to jump, but couldn't stop how his breaths hitched in his throat or the tingling prickle on the back of his neck. That prickle was practically a sixth sense tuned to detect Imra his body heat, his proximity, and it only eased when Imra rounded the table, took his own seat, 
and murmured something in low Romungro before shaking out his napkin and picking up his fork. Luca tried not to be obvious about watching him. He'd tasted the food before serving it, the asparagus crisply seasoned and soaked in the flavor of the steak cubes, the baby potatoes boiled to softness and half-mashed in their skins, swimming in a bath of liquid sour cream and chives and basil. And it had seemed fine to him. But if Imra didn't like it, then he'd just wasted Imra's good food on a bad meal. Yet Imra only took one bite of steak and asparagus, then another, before letting out a soft sound of appreciation and spearing a cream-coated bite of potato. But he paused with a fork halfway to his mouth. Blue eyes suddenly skewered Luca, and Luca froze. Something wrong? Imra asked. Nothing. Luca strangled out, then dropped his gaze to his own plate and picked up his fork. So, um, tomorrow you'll teach me how to ride? Imra swallowed and reached for his glass of iced tea. In the afternoon, once I put the goats out to pasture in the morning, we'll need to spend some time on apple picking before the harvest gets overripe. He paused for a sip of tea. Then I'll teach you to ride and if you can keep your seat well enough, I'll take you out with me to bring the goats back in. All right, that sounds good. Luca tried a smile and propped his feet on the rungs of the chair. Last time he'd sat in these chairs, the rungs were as far as he could reach, but now his knees bumped the bottom of the table. That sounds really good. Imra studied him contemplatively, then mused. You're not afraid of hard work, so what's this Yoda says about being too lazy to go to uni? Luca hunched in on himself. That budding spark of warmth at watching Imra enjoy food prepared with Luca's own two hands doused as quickly as shutting off the flame on the stove. It's not laziness, he growled. There's just nothing I want to do at uni. Nothing? No. He glowered at his plate and pushed his food around with the tip of his fork. I want to do something. I just don't know what. All the usual study courses bore me. And while I figure it out, why waste time getting a degree I don't want and won't need? He shrugged. I'll go back to uni when I know what it's for, when it's good for something. Sounds practical to me, Imra said nonchalantly, and took another bite of his supper. Luca blinked. What? Imra blinked right back. It's sound logic. I... oh. Luca uncurled just a little eyeing Imra warily. Dad didn't think so. I came back from a weekend in Manchester, and Dad found out I'd not registered for the autumn term this year. He flipped his shite. I got drunk and flipped his bike. He called you, and here we are. With an amused sound, Imra raised his glass in a mocking toast. Here we are. I don't even know why he sent me out here. Go play with goats, that'll make you sorry. He snorted and nipped a bite off the tines of his fork. I think he's just tired of trying to figure out what to do with me, so he sent me away where he wouldn't have to look at me. Do you really think he'd be that cruel? I don't know. I guess I know a different dad than you do. He's your friend. He can't really be mine. I can be, though, Imra pointed out softly. Your friend, I mean. I'm not your father. I don't want to be. I don't want to be in that position with you. I refuse to treat you that way. So? He set his fork down and offered one broad hand across the table, weathered fingers spread. Friends? That warm, inviting hand tugged at all the empty spaces in Luca, as if Imra had snared his fingers in Luca's strings and pulled. He eyed that hand. He wanted. He wanted that, he thought a friend, and he liked how Imra listened to him and honestly seemed to hear him and give consideration to what he said. Talked back to him too, but didn't talk down. And Imra's kindness, his strength, the memories of safety and security all wrapped up in that outstretched hand. Luca bit his lip, then slid his hand into Imra's. Rough calluses rasped against his palm and a thrill shot up his arm and raised the fine hairs on his skin for a single sweet breath. Yeah, he murmured. Sure, but I tend to get my friends in trouble. 
He started to pull his hand back, but Imra's hand tightened for one heart-stopping moment, holding him fast in that massive stone-hewn grip before letting go. Luca pulled his hand back and curled it in his lap, his fingers tingling and light and hot. I went to uni with your father, Imri said, one thick brow arching. I know how to take care of myself. Nah, come on, Dad's an engineer. I bet he was all pencils and graph paper and studying twenty-four-seven. Your father, Imra proclaimed gravely was nearly expelled for drunken skinny dipping in the boating lake at Highfields Park. Luca's eyes widened, and he clapped a hand over his mouth. No, no! He burst into laughter, then tried to choke it back, stuffing it back down inside. I did not need to picture that. That's my dad, naked. Imra let out a long-suffering, weary sigh. Your father was nude more often than not. One drop of liquor, and suddenly he couldn't stand to be clothed. When we graduated, he burned his textbooks, got drunk on rye, and danced around the bonfire in the raw. Imra, stop! Luca snickered, covering his ears with both hands. That's horrid! I'm simply informing you that I know how to handle the Ward brand of trouble. He acts as though you're the first Ward to crash a motorcycle. Imra's gaze met his, solemn and steady, only a faint glint of repressed laughter giving him away. He shot one off the top of the student union building, trying to impress Lucia. Nearly took himself with it. Guess who pulled him back from the edge? Mum? Luca ventured. Me, Imra retorted flatly. Your mother was so disgusted I think she'd have let him fall. Luca tried to fight a giggle and failed. That giggle turned into a cackle before he swallowed it down and collapsed back into the chair and let himself laugh until his sides hurt, because all he could picture was a tall building and his father, naked and reed-thin as Luca himself, dangling over the edge by one of Imra's meaty paws, while Imra just looked at him with patient, tired disgust. Oh! Luca gasped, wiping at his wet eyes. Oh, you're giving me so much ammunition. Planning to raise a little more havoc, then? Do some naked swimming? Luca choked on his next laugh. The vision in his mind's eye replaced his father with himself. And instead of the edge of the building, there was the edge of a lake. Imra's hot hand curled against the back of his neck. Swathes of darkly bronzed skin that his imagination refused to define as more than impressions. But impressions were enough to leave Luca struggling to unlock his frozen tongue. On fire from collarbones to hairline, petrified in his seat. I, what? Naked? I, I, um... I'm teasing Ongulka. Imra said it with that same gravelly, soothing calm as everything else. Luca was tempted to kick him under the damned table. But Imra was watching him as though he knew exactly what Luca was thinking, an arch look over the rim of his glass. And when Luca scowled at him, Imra's mouth only twitched in a ghost of a curve that spoke volumes for his silent laughter. Finish your supper, Imra continued smoothly. We rise early here. Luca huffed and stabbed his fork into his potatoes. Up with the dawn. Not quite that early and not without enough coffee. Luca didn't say anything. He didn't know what to say, when Imra was still watching him and that image still burned in his mind. Rough fingers on the back of his neck, that prickle that knew Imra with an uncomfortable familiarity, that scent of lava soap and farm-sweet smells and man. He bit his lip, fixing his gaze on his plate, and pressing his tongue against the backs of his teeth. He had to get his head on straight and just stop. Before that look of patient, fond amusement turned to disappointment, and Imra dropped him like so much worthless garbage. 14. If the rest of supper was silent, Imra didn't mind save that Luca was so quiet, so subdued, staring down at his plate. 
Imra had the sense that prodding right now wouldn't be invited or particularly successful. Sometimes even the worst thoughts needed time to stew alone, and if Luca needed his silence, then Imra wouldn't pry. Yet when Imra volunteered to take care of the dishes, Luca only mumbled something under his breath and disappeared up the stairs, leaving Imra looking after him, his sudden absence as palpable in the room as if a Luca-shaped cutout had been left in the world. Imra lingered on that as he put away the leftovers for later. The food had been surprisingly good, filling and satisfying, a tantalizing blend of flavors without being overwhelming, and washed up the dishes. Had he said something to upset Luca? Perhaps talking about Marco hadn't been the best idea when the relationship between father and son was so clearly strained, and bringing up Marco's university antics probably made the judgment brought down on Luca seem that much harsher. And Marco was being unfair, Imra thought. Luca had a good head on his shoulders, and his reasons for waiting made sense. Seemed more intelligent and mature than diving in and wasting four years on something that made him miserable. But it wasn't Imra's place to interfere or take sides. So he only finished the washing up and settled in the living room to read, keeping an ear open for a boy who had suddenly gone as quiet as a mouse in the walls. Yet by the time he'd flicked through a few hundred well-worn, yellowed pages of Shardik, he'd still heard nothing, and his inner clock told him it was time to check the goats one last time before bed. He tugged his reading glasses off, tucked them away, and took a few quiet steps up the stairs, pausing before the rather vocal fifth step, and called up softly. Luca? Nothing. Let him sleep, then. He'd just arrived today, and for all that he'd thrown himself into helping out, he was probably emotionally and physically wrung out. A good night's sleep would bring things clear, Imra thought, and maybe tomorrow Luca would let that smile slip free more often, rather than hiding it like a guilty confession. He waited a moment longer, then slipped back down the stairs and out to the barn. Andras and Jofia dozed with their tails switching, but the goats weren't alone in their stalls. Luca nestled in the corner of Gia's stall, with the nanny goat's head in his lap, stroking her face and rocking subtly, his pensive eyes fixed on her, and his pale, feline features a portrait of wordless, unguarded sorrow. The empty feeding bottle was propped against his side, and Gia rested quietly across his thighs, her tail now and then flicking. A strange, throbbing feeling built in Imra's chest, starting somewhere between the top of his stomach and the bottom of his ribs, but with each slow beat swelling larger and flowing into every inner crack and crevice. Something like pain, something like warmth, something like understanding, something like longing. Pieces of each and every one and so many other things until the only thing he could do was hold so very stone still, or he would become a chaos of emotion. Luca let out a soft hitching breath, and oblivious to Imra, squeezed his eyes shut. The faint evening light drifting through the open barn doors caught on the wet glimmering droplets gathered on his lashes in fine, misty beads. Please, he whispered, and curled around Gia. Please be okay. Those low words pierced Imra's heart. He stepped closer to the open stall door, clearing his throat softly in subtle warning. Luca. Luca stiffened, lifting his head, clutching Gia closer protectively and staring up at Imra with wide, tear-dotted eyes, pale green swimming underneath a lake of dewed wetness. Ah, oh, God. Imra stepped into the stall and sank to his knees next to his boy and the goat. Luca, he repeated, come to bed. He curled his hand against Luca's shoulder. It was hard as stone beneath his palm, yet trembled deeply as fragile paper in a gale. There's nothing more you can do for them tonight. You need to rest. Luca's lips parted before he let out a hurting sound and looked down at the goat. But Gia looks like she's getting worse. Imra hesitated, 
then leaned over the nanny and gently pried her eyes open. They'd dilated more deeply, a worrisome glaze in them, and when he bent and pressed his cheek to her chest, her heartbeat was shallow, weaker. Luca was right. Imra bit back a curse under his breath, stomach sinking. Sometimes they get worse before they get better, he said. He didn't want to hurt Luca, but he wouldn't lie either. And sometimes they just get worse. But she'll hold until morning, Angelka. Let her rest while you rest. We'll see how she's doing then. He squeezed that slim shoulder. Come. Luca looked up at him again, before that sheen in his eyes burst over into a flood. Imra, he choked out, half whisper, half sob. Then Imra's arms were full of lithe limbs and shaking shoulders as Luca flung himself against Imra's chest. Imra went still, but his body knew what to do even when his mind didn't. His arms enfolded Luca and drew him up close. Even all grown up, he was still so small compared to Imra, and he fit him into a trembling bundle that Imra could so easily wrap himself around, as if he could use his body to shield Luca from any blow that might come at him. Yet the wounds that cut deepest, Imra had no defense against. He could only hold Luca close, and let the boy spend his tears against his shoulder, while Gia wheezed and shivered in the hay, and Imra's chest ached with an awful, hollow feeling. Luca, he whispered and stroked his slim back. Angelka, angel, we're doing everything we can for them. I've had the vet in already, but I'll check in on Gia until morning and then call the vet first thing. She'll come right down from Harrogate, all right? He caught that fine, pointed chin in his fingertips and coaxed Luca to tilt his face up, to let him look at him, to meet those red-rimmed eyes. Will that ease your mind? Luca sniffled, then nodded and rubbed the pinkened tip of his nose. Aye. Then consider it done. Imra released Luca's chin and rested his hand atop his head. Wash up for bed. I'll stay with her a little longer. Okay, Luca said, but his lips remained parted as though he might say something else. He braced his hands against Imra's chest, fingerprinting warmth through his clothing. Clear green eyes flicked over Imra's face before Luca ducked his head and pulled back. It took a moment for Imra to remind his arms to move, to unlock, to fall away. Luca unfolded himself, pulling to his feet, a hay-strewn mess with lips swollen and his nose and cheeks red. He caught his lower lip between his fingers, twisting it, then asked, If something changes, you'll come get me, even if it's bad? You have my word, Imra promised. Okay, Luca said again. He lingered a moment longer still watching Imra strangely, an inscrutable and fair thing in the moonlight, a mystery in parchment and ink colours, fidgeting at his lip, his shirt. Imra tilted his head, a question on his tongue. Yet before he could find his voice, Luca was gone, fleet-footed in the dark and vanishing into the house. Fifteen. Luca rinsed off the dirt and hay of the goats in the bathroom sink, scrubbed furiously at his aching eyes, then changed into a T-shirt and boxers for bed. He curled up in the bedroom he still thought of as his, even though it never really had been and never really would be. But he couldn't sleep for listening for Imra. Luca should be down there, bedding down in the stall with Gia. But Gia wasn't his goat, his pet, his anything. It wasn't his place. He couldn't just show up here after less than a day and start tromping around like it was his responsibility to do anything. He wouldn't even know what to do if Gia took a turn for the worse at three in the morning and he couldn't wake Imra. The only thing he could do was leave everything in Imra's hands and remind himself that Imra had been doing this for longer than Luca had even been alive. He burrowed himself into the quilts and pillows and willed himself to sleep. But sleep wouldn't come. With a moan, he pressed his face into the cool pillowcase, 
then rolled over and dragged his bag closer. He'd halfway unpacked, but his laptop was buried under the clothes he'd not yet put away, along with the phone charger he'd spent nearly an hour hunting for earlier and failed to find. He wriggled an arm behind the headboard to plug in both his laptop and his charger, then hooked up his phone and checked the bars. Three. Not bad. His dad used to complain about the cell service out here all the time. But then again, ten years ago, people had thought half a megabyte was a fair data plan, and brick phones with two color screens were just making way for flip phones with tiny, grainy, multicolor displays and brushed chrome finishes. His dad still had one, a pink razor, and he refused to trade it in for a smartphone. For an engineer, his dad had some weird ideas about technological progress. Fuck, he didn't want to think about that prick right now. Not when he was this raw. He flipped his laptop open and checked available Wi-Fi networks. Not one of them said Lohara, though there were about five within range, two with strong signal. Probably the neighbors. He'd peeked in the living room, and Imra still didn't even have a television. Farmers. Bloody hell. He checked his phone again, but no 3G or 4G data out here. No using his mobile hotspot. The sound of a door opening and shutting drifted from downstairs. He listened for Imra's footsteps, but he still walked cat quiet. This time, though, that creaking fifth step snitched on him. Then a shadow passed under Luca's closed door, before another door opened and closed across the hall, at the very end. Luca bit his lip, then rolled out of bed, slipped into the hall, and knocked tentatively on Imra's bedroom door. Imra? Aye, drifted out, muted through the thick oak slab. Luca hesitated, then pushed the door open a crack. Imra froze in the middle of lifting his shirt off, arms stretched over his head with the henley snared around his forearms, his hair tangled in the neck of the shirt. Deep burnished light fell from the crackling hearth in a waterfall of flame, turning Imra into forge-lit bronze. His body was a mass of corded muscle, with that bulk that only came through years and years of thickening, straining, destroying himself with hard labor, and rebuilding over and over again from the stone and earth of the land around him. His shoulders massive, his waist a solid sheet of hard-cut muscle his chest a broad, defined taper, lightly furred with a V-shaped pelt of curling silver and black. Imra held still one moment longer, one darkened blue eye watching Luca sharply through a gap in his upraised shirt, the only sounds in the silence, the crackle of the fireplace and Luca's shallow, swift breaths. He, he couldn't, he hadn't meant, but he couldn't look away couldn't figure out where to look, and his heart hurt, its beating painful and labored and throbbing inside his chest. Imra was just too much, too much everything. Too much Imra, and Luca stood petrified in the doorway, the question he'd wanted to ask crumbling on his lips. Imra pulled the shirt the rest of the way off, powerful biceps and forearms flexing and bunching in hard angles. He shook his hair loose, then ran a hand through it, sweeping it to one side and watching Luca from beneath his brows. What is it, Angelka? Um, Imra's brows drew together. Are you all right? Luca closed his eyes, pressed his too hot face into his too hot palms, then thrust himself out of the doorway and leaned against the wall in the hall, staring across it at... at... nothing. Anything but Imra. Fuck. I'm fine, he growled, clutching his arms over his chest, trying to keep his heart inside where it belonged. Just wanted to know if you ever got internet. Imra leaned out the doorway silver hair tumbling over his shoulder, one hand gripping the doorway. He studied Luca wryly, practically hanging over his shoulder. It's the network ending in 0744. I changed the Wi-Fi password to your birthday this morning. Luca flinched back from that warm, silk-smooth baritone right in his ear.
His heart gave up on pummeling out through his chest and slammed its way up to the bottom of his throat. Oh, he squeaked, staring at Imra from the corner of his eye. Imra needed to put a shirt on and stop remembering things like Luca's birthday, when Luca was pretty fucking sure he didn't remember what really mattered. What? Imra blinked at him, then snorted. Ordering seed is more convenient online, and this Amazon Prime thing is very novel. I could get spoiled. Oh, oh, that fucking dork. Imra really thought Luca was staring at him because the Luddite knew what Wi-Fi was, not because he was trying not to see all of that, all those things he shouldn't be looking at, because Imra was Imra and Luca was Luca, and he just, he couldn't, too messy, too confusing, too much, when all he wanted to do was go to sleep and forget the absolute fuckery his life had become. Gotcha, he muttered and fixed his eyes on his toes. Thanks. Imra lingered a moment longer, with a searching gaze that pulled at Luca with a quiet magnetism palpable in the space between them. That was the problem with Imra. He was so honest, so rawly and quietly true, that his honesty seemed to ask for the same from everyone. That they come to him laid naked and bare as he was to the world, and trust that he wouldn't find their every point of vulnerability and eviscerate them. Luca couldn't trust him that way. He couldn't trust anyone that way ever again. But then that rough, massive hand fell to the top of his head, and he closed his eyes, his throat tightening as he tried not to lean into that touch like a cat. Good night, Luca, Imra murmured. Luca twisted away, as though the sharp stab of yearning in the pit of his stomach were a spear thrust he could dodge, and backed a few steps down the hall. Um, good night. He started to turn away, then paused, curling his fingers tight. Um, Gia's resting, Imra answered gently. She's stable, I promise. Thank you. Luca said, then ducked into his room and firmly shut the door. 16. Luca didn't breathe until he heard the dim sound of hinges creaking, followed by the click of a latch. Then he groaned, slumping against the door and sinking down until his knees folded up against his chest and he could bury his face in his thighs. Don't do this to yourself, Luca he whispered. Just don't. He'd dealt with enough rejections lately. He didn't need to add one more to the pile. Cursing under his breath, he crawled into bed, sprawled out on his side, and logged onto the Wi-Fi. Even if he had a squint-eyed moment, wondering if he should use 0112 or 01 December. 01 December. This was Imra. He practically spoke in proper nouns. The Wi-Fi was a little slow, but passable enough to get his email going. Nothing but spam, a few Twitter highlights, and a syrupy fake concerned email from his mum, though he'd have to answer it by morning or deal with an equally syrupy fake concerned phone call where Lucia Ward waffled between worrying Luca had hurt himself and worrying Luca had burned Lohera down. But that was a problem for morning. For now he pulled up Facebook and logged into the web messenger. His last chat with Zave was at the top of the history, and he tapped out a quick message, typing one-handed with his head pillowed on his other arm. Luca Ward. You up? Barely half a second passed before the typing dots popped up on the screen, followed by a new message balloon, that little bloop popping out of his speakers. Xavier Lagari. Hey, fuckface, I'm up, waiting for you. How's the first day on the pig farm? Goat farm. Whatever. Pigs are cuter. You okay out there? Yeah, it's not bad. There's horses and the goats are cute. Cuter than pigs. What about the guy you're staying with? Luca paused. Imra felt like a secret he wanted to keep to himself, and a confession he wanted to scream to the world. He wanted to tell Xavier everything, 
but he didn't even know what he'd say when one day had left Luca a tangled mess, with his insides all knotted up and his heart struggling to shed its weights to float lighter than air. He pressed his lips together, working his tongue against the inside of his cheek, then tapped out two words. Luca Ward. He's okay, Xavier Lagari. Isn't he gay too? Duelingbanjos.mp3. Ha, fucking ha. It's not like that. He hot. Way too hot. My dad would skin me, that kind of hot. He think you're hot. Luca groaned. Who knew what the fuck Imra thought? For someone who was so fucking honest, he was also way too fucking close-mouthed. Luca Ward. I'm pretty sure he still thinks I'm five. Xavier Ligari. Suck balls. No, thanks, not my kink. You dirty. Why you got to make that gross? You make faces, that's my kink. Put me on vid, you little shite. I want to see you. Why? Because you're not okay. I can tell. Need to look at you and make sure it's really you. It's me. I'm just... sad. Why? Lot of reasons. I mean, my parents are fucking knobs who threw me out like a broken toy and just... I don't know. And one of the goats is sick and I'm a tit and getting all attached and I'm scared she'll die. And Imre is... Imre is. Imre was... Imra was. Imra? How did he explain that to Zave? Xavier Lagari. Imra's the hot guy. Luca Ward. Imra's the hot older guy who's completely out of my league. Why? I have all these memories every time I look at him. All these feelings that it's like I forgot them. Buried them until I saw him again. Like it's been winter inside me all this time but he's the sun that makes the buried seeds sprout. What the fuck? Buried seeds? You've already been on that fucking farm too long, you soppy tit. Jesus fucking Christ, have you been watching Twilight again? Shut it. Point is, I thought my annoying baby crush would go away, and I think instead I'm just making it worse. I go weak every time he calls me Angel. Angyoka. It's Hungarian? But he says it with a Romany accent, and it just... It fucks me up so bad. Oh, that's so sweet. I'm gonna gag. It's killing me. I shouldn't feel like this. Have you ever told him how you feel? When I was five, I gave him a ring and told him I was going to marry him when I grew up. Ah, ha, 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 you sentimental fuckface. Shut up. Smiley face. Luca laughed, though he didn't really want to. Not when that laughter just sat atop his heartache and pressed down on it until it hurt even more compressed into a smaller space. Xavier Lagari. Does he remember that? Luca Ward. Probably not. He looks at me like he doesn't even know who I am now, like nothing ever mattered. So let him get to know you. He already knows me, or oh, the old me. Bloke doesn't know you the way you want him to. So? So? Luca frowned. So what? So? Oh. Oh. He sucked in a breath and pressed his knuckles to his mouth, then turned his face into the sheets and groaned. No. Nope. Absolutely not. He couldn't even think that way. He peeked one eye over his knuckles, then pecked out. Luca Ward. I can't do that, Xavier Ligari. Why not? I can't. I don't want to talk about this any more. I have to go to sleep. We're picking apples tomorrow. Okay, nature boy. Call me if you get in trouble. I got your back. Thanks. Night. Zave answered with a grinning photo that was one-third face and two-thirds middle finger, tinted blue on brown by the light reflected from his computer screen. Luca snorted and flipped the chat window off right back, but didn't bother taking a photo. He told Xavier to fuck off on a regular basis. He could pull a few out of the bank for this one. Sighing, 
Luca plugged his earbuds in and pulled up one of his desktop playlists, then shifted onto his back and stared up at the ceiling, while Taylor Swift and Zane sighed about not wanting to live forever. He traced the pattern of painted stars that came back to him with a familiarity as deep as muscle memory. Lohera was like that, he thought. Muscle memory. But the heart was muscle too, and its memory was too long and too deep for him. It remembered far too much, when all he wanted to do was forget. 17. Imre couldn't seem to get comfortable. He sprawled against his bed, staring up at the ceiling. He'd flung the duvet back an hour ago. It was too hot with the duvet and the fire going, but too cold with just the fire. But it wasn't the temperature keeping him restless. It wasn't even knowing he'd be up in an hour to check on the goats, just to soothe the boy shut away in his room down the hall. It was the boy himself, and those wide, damned green eyes. Why was he thinking about Luca? Angry, sullen Luca. Quiet, shyly laughing Luca. Luca entranced by the softness of a horse's muzzle. Luca cradling a goat's head in his lap and crying with pure and utter heartbreak. Luca pressed against him, clinging to him, trusting Imra to protect and shield him as if Imra was still the same man he'd been ten years ago. He was starting to think he might not be. He sighed, dragged a hand over his face and rolled out of bed. He'd regret this tomorrow, but sleep right now was pointless. He pulled on a pair of jeans over his boxer briefs, dragged on a long-sleeved shirt against the chill, and let himself out into the hall. But he paused as he passed Luca's room. A pale light shone under the door. He leaned in and listened, but couldn't hear movement, typing, any other signs that Luca was awake. Gently he wrapped the backs of his knuckles to the door. Luca, he whispered. Nothing. With a careful touch, he twisted the doorknob until the latch came free without a sound, then opened the door just a crack, just enough to peek inside. Luca curled on his side in the bed. This long thing of pale, slender limbs tangled together in a gangly mess, dark hair spilling across the pillows and leaving his face unguarded. In his sleep, that defensive scowl and pensive withdrawal had relaxed, and he looked almost lost, Imra thought. Lost without a compass, falling with no idea which way was up. Luca had fallen asleep with his laptop open in front of him, little black nodules of earbuds in his ears. The laptop was dangerously close to the edge of the bed, the covers were flung back, and goose pimples pricked on those slim, smooth legs. Imra sighed, shaking his head, and eased into the room, moving carefully over the weathered floorboards. He relocated the laptop to the nightstand, then paused. The crown of woven clover blossoms he had given Luca that morning was draped over the blue fabric lampshade, wringing it in a delicate band. The blooms had wilted, the stems browning, but he'd kept it. Imra lightly brushed the fronds of one bloom, then folded the quilts over Luca, pulling them up to his shoulders. Luca made a sleepy sound, burrowing down into the sheets, then subsided. Imra watched until he was certain he was settled, then caught the earbud cords delicately and tugged them from Luca's ears with a gentle pop. His fingers brushed the soft skin of Luca's cheeks, catching the subtlest hint of roughness, where a faint prickle of stubble lingered just in front of his ears. Imra? Luca sighed his name in a throaty burr, never opening his eyes. Imra didn't even think he was really awake, just talking to himself, and with another of those sleepy sounds Luca nosed into the pillows, going lax again with a last drowsy murmur. Imra? Don't, Imra thought, his breaths hurt, scouring the inside of his chest. Don't say my name that way. Luca only sighed once more. Imra coiled the earbuds atop the laptop, then smoothed Luca's hair back from his brow. He lingered a moment, letting his fingers slip through hair as dark and shimmering as the gleam of a still black pool on a moonless night. 
Sleep, my Agnolka, he whispered, then made himself pull away and slip out into the night and to the barn. Eighteen. Luca woke to the sense of frying bacon and eggs and the sound of Imra's voice drifting up the stairs, unintelligible but a familiar, steady part of the quiet music of a Lohera morning. He squinted against the morning light streaming through the window and wrinkled his nose, pressing sleep-tacky lips together. He didn't remember falling asleep, but he didn't remember putting his laptop away either, and sometimes he did things in zombie mode that he had no recollection of the following morning. Yet he remembered dreaming of a great stone statue that spoke and threaded its rough granite fingers into his hair until he felt the gentle scrape of rock down to his very scalp. With a yawn, he sat up and woke his laptop up to check the time. Quarter of seven. Fuck his life. Fuck Imra's life. Fuck farm mornings. But his stomach didn't want to go back to bed, not when it was already having a long-distance love affair with what a discerning nose would swear was apple-smoked bacon. Luca's nose wasn't particularly discerning, but he was quite particularly fucking hungry, and that was good enough. He climbed out of bed, floorboards cool against his bare feet, and padded down the hall. Eager yips met him at the head of the stairs and Vila tumbled into him. He laughed, draping his arms around her body and hugging the shepherd, then sank to one knee to loop an arm around Shetty's neck. Good morning, he said, and Shetty answered with a ringing bark, then a wet nose pressed against his cheek. That bark summoned Imra. He leaned around the wall at the foot of the stairs, his sleep-rumpled hair tumbling everywhere and speckled with hay. He held his cell to his ear with one hand, the other clutched a mug of coffee, and he lifted the mug in greeting, offering a brief, distracted hint of a smile before disappearing around the wall again. Lucas stood and descended the stairs. Vila and Shetty pressed against his legs, then leaned against the kitchen door frame to listen. Aye, Imra said into the phone, setting his mug down on the counter and replacing it with a spatula. He pushed eggs, cheese, and bacon around in the same pan, frying them all together in a massive, dripping heap. No, they've made it this far, but I think Gia's taken a turn. Could be nothing, could be something, couldn't hurt to look. He paused, then, stop in for breakfast? He glanced over his shoulder, caught Luca's eye, and lifted his mug, mouthing, coffee? When Luca shook his head, Imre turned his attention back to the phone. All right. Thanks, Myra. Was that the vet? Luca asked, hope tight in the pit of his stomach and light in the palms of his hands. Myra Landers. Best vet in all of York. Imra fit his phone into the back pocket of his jeans. She's due out on general farm rounds today, so she's already on her way. She'll make us a priority. Twenty minutes or less. Your turn to set the table today. Luca edged closer to Imre. At least he was wearing a shirt, but his trend toward close-clinging, open-throated Henleys, this morning was a dark, heathered blue, wasn't much better for Luca's constitution or comfort levels. He told himself not to look, and wedged himself into the space next to Imre, just close enough to reach the overhead cabinets. Where Imre had reached easily, Luca had to stretch on his toes, and his waist pressed against Imre's hip as he leaned over and strained as far as he could. With an amused sidelong look, Imre reached up, caught up a stack of plates one-handed, and deposited them in Luca's arms. Luca stuck his tongue out at him and carted the plates to the table. You're too big. I'm exactly the right size for me, Imre chuckled. Don't forget to set out for Myra. You might want to fetch a pair of trousers, too. Not that she's a stranger to the scandal of a man's bare legs. Luca rolled his eyes. She'll be here before breakfast is over. I thought everything moved slow in the country. Not when your animals are sick. Gia's still steady, though. She didn't worsen overnight. Luca returned to Imri's side to fetch silverware from the drawer but paused, squinting up at weathered features, the hay in Imra's hair, 
The lines around his eyes and mouth were a little more tired this morning, the distance in his eyes not quite distraction. Luca reached up, not really thinking, and plucked a stalk of hay from Imra's hair, teasing it free from the waving silver strands. Did you sleep in the barn, Imra? Guilty, Imra said with zero guilt at all. Lucas sighed. You wouldn't let me? I wasn't tired, you were. Imra shrugged, the broad expanse of his back tight. Figured I could keep watch. Imra pulled away then, out of reach, and leaving Luca with nothing but the stalk of hay and the bite of gnawing confusion. Imra's jaw was tight. His head bowed, and he kept his back to Luca as he scraped out three mounded piles of bacon, eggs, and cheese onto the plates. Imra? Luca asked. That horrible, wanting ache in his chest longed to press against that broad back, lean into Imra, coax him with his weight and gentle pressure, until those taut shoulders relaxed. What's wrong? Eh? Huh? Imra lifted his head with a blank look, then looked away again. Nothing. I'm just thinking, working out my planting schedule. Weather's been strange and unpredictable this last year or two, but I'm trying to plan for contingencies. Then he was turning away again, just in time to catch the toaster oven as it shrilled. He spilled fresh rolls out into a basket and brought them to the table, while Luca and Vila and Shetty watched and Imra looked anywhere but at them. Imra Claiborne had just come the closest Luca had ever seen to telling a lie. Not that he thought Imra was capable of lying, but he hadn't told the right truth either, and the hitch in Luca's chest said it was very much on purpose. He just didn't understand why. Nineteen. Myra's twenty minutes were more like ten. They always were, and the sound of her ratchety pickup came just in time to break the awkward silence that Imra hated all the more, because it was entirely his fault. Silence should be a relief. Silence should be calming. Silence should be sweet. Instead, silence was damning, and he tried to pretend he didn't see Luca's many sidelong glances, each one dark with an unspoken question. What did I do wrong? Nothing on your car. Nothing at all. The noise of tires grinding on beaten earth sent Luca racing upstairs to dress, while Imra set out the last of the butter and cream pots at the table. Luca, he called up the stairs. We'll be in the barn. A clatter echoed down the stairs. I'm coming, I'm coming. Imra looked down at Shetty. Curious golden eyes looked up at him, almost mocking. He sighed, rested his hand atop her head, then headed out to meet Myra in the yard. She was already climbing out of her truck by the time the house door banged shut. A small woman with spare shoulders and generous hips, her battered canvas utility jacket buttoned snugly around her waist, and her tight black micro-braids bound up in a no-nonsense knot, swept out of her round, apple-cheeked brown face. She raised a hand, her clear, pleasant voice ringing over the morning. Morning, Imre. That apple bacon I smell. Made it because I know you like it. He clasped her outstretched hand and shook it firmly. She had her kit in the other hand, a sturdy, steel-bound fishing tackle box. Still carrying that thing? I'll switch to the old black bag when someone invents one that can survive being crushed under two tons of steel and four tractor-grade tires. Imra started to respond, but then the side door rattled open and Luca came spilling out into the yard, his boots half-laced, his skin-tight jeans scrunched in odd places on his thighs and calves, his loose, long-sleeved shirt inside out and backwards, with the tag flipped up to rest in the hollow of his throat. Myra fixed Imra with a knowing look. Hired new help, Imra. Imra beckoned Luca closer. The boy took a few shuffling steps then squared his shoulders and closed the distance on brave strides. This is Luca, Imra said. A friend, taking a gap year from university and staying over a bit to learn about animal husbandry. Luca, this is Myra Landers. 
Luca's eyes widened at the same moment Myra's narrowed, when Imra said, a friend. The spread of slow-rising pink in Luca's cheeks was fascinating, like watching ink furl in clouds through water. But Imra tore his gaze away as Luca offered Myra his hand. Gone was the surly spark of temper, lost resentment, hurt confusion, replaced by a shy sweet smile and a tentative spark of hope that caught in Luca's eyes and turned to motes of fire in the morning sun. It's nice to meet you, Luca said. Luca, hm? Myra shook his hand with a warm, thoughtful smile. Worried about the goats, Luca? Luca ducked his head and retrieved his hand, only to rake it through his hair, spiking the already sleep-disheveled strands everywhere. Yes, um, Gia, I was feeding her and massaging her throat, like Imra showed me, and her breathing went funny. His face fell. I didn't hurt her, did I? Doubtful. Ugly stuff, monks' hoodies. Used to call it wolfsbane, because they used it to kill wolves back when we still had wolves. One reason Imra liked Myra was her calm, factual way of explaining things, simple logic without hyperbole or drama, providing grounded, reassuring reality to counteract panic. And she continued with that grounded calm as she said, But it kills fast. If both goats survived this long, odds are they'll make it. Just need a bit of babying for a good while. So let's go have a look. She turned to lead the way into the barn. Luca flashed Imra a nervous, preoccupied smile, then trailed after her. Imra hung back. He didn't think there'd be much room for him anyway. Not with Myra already in Gia's stall, kneeling next to the panting goat, Luca right behind her and peering over her shoulder. Myra checked Gia's eyes pressed a stethoscope over her heart, then tossed a dry look over her shoulder. See anything? Luca stammered something, then mumbled, Sorry, and retreated to lean against the interior wall of the stall. Imra draped his arms over the wall and leaned on it at Luca's shoulder. It'll be all right, he said. But Luca wouldn't look at him, his mouth tight, his gaze fixed on Myra and Gia alone. Myra pried the goat's mouth open, peered down her throat, sniffed her breaths, then listened to her heart again. She pressed her ear to the nanny's nostrils and mouth, listening with an expression of intent concentration, her brows peaked, before examining the goat's tongue. Gia sat through this with a sort of tired endurance, her eyes rolling slightly and the occasional protesting bleat escaping, only to sigh as Myra set her back down gently in the hay. Sore throat, she proclaimed firmly. Bottle feeding will do that. Not really anything to worry about. But since she's not getting enough air, her heart's laboring a bit. I can give her steroids to boost her cardiac function and relieve the inflammation, but she'll be no good for commercial milking or breeding any more. Do it, Imra said without hesitation. Luca jerked his head up, staring at Imra. You mean it? Of course. Imra could see the moment Luca started to reach for him, arms outstretched, and the moment he remembered Myra and glanced over his shoulder at her before backing away from Imra, clutching his arms close to himself. Imra, quite honestly, shouldn't be so very disappointed. I'm glad, Luca murmured, fidgeting with his shirt sleeves and watching Myra draw vials from her kit. I'm so glad she'll be all right. Myra inserted a needle into a vial and drew a shot of clear fluid up into a syringe. A tap, a squirt, and then she was pinching up a loose bit of skin and fat behind the goat's neck and sliding the injection in deep. Imra had seen it a thousand times, done it himself when necessary, but it still made him wince and look away. He'd never liked needles, but they came with the territory. She'll need a lot of attentive care, Myra said. They both will. I'll dose them both just to be proactive, but it'll still be a while before they're ready to turn out to pasture again. I'll watch them, Luca said quickly. Both of them. I'll take care of them. Well, Imri's lucky he found you then, isn't he? Myra finished dosing Myrta the same as she had Gia, then slapped her hands to her thighs and pushed herself to her feet. Her smile was arch, 
Kind for Luca, pointed for Imre, as she stepped out of the stall and brushed past Imre toward the house. Now, she said while Imre bit back a groan, I believe someone owes me bacon. Luca flashed Imre another vivid smile, then dropped to his knees, swept the goat up and hugged her tight, burying his face in her neck. She bleated softly while Imre tilted his head, eyeing them. God save him. He thought he might well be jealous of a goat. As quickly as he'd dropped, Luca was on his feet, an animated bundle of energy already dashing toward the house in Myra's wake. Imra sighed, tilting his head back to the rafters, and stared for a long, centering moment before calling out, Ongilka! Luca pinwheeled to a halt, pivoting on his heels breathlessly. Yeah? Imra slid his hands into his pockets and strode closer, nodding toward the tag threatening to tickle the underside of Luca's chin. Your shirt. Luca blinked blankly, looked down, then flushed. Oh, fuck. He snagged the hem of his shirt in both hands and lifted, with that sort of guileless thoughtlessness that only Luca could have, standing in the middle of the yard and bloody well stripping. Imra froze, then turned and walked into the house before he saw more than a smooth strip of white skin and the dip of his navel against the flat lines of his stomach. Day two. It was only day two, and that boy was already testing his patience. Twenty. Myra's presence made breakfast both better and worse. With Myra there, Imra had someone to direct his attention to other than the boy sitting across the table from him, shirt now right side out and front forward. But with Myra there, he also saw a wholly new Luca, an eager, intelligent Luca who plied Myra with sharply curious questions about the differences in veterinary practice on a farm, peppered with bashful apologies for the barrage. That burning light in his eyes, when something caught his complete and utter interest, it was both familiar and wholly alien when seen through the lens of age, filters stripped away by the years to let Imra see it for what it was. Passion, pure and unfettered and raw. He wondered if Marco had ever seen Luca like this. If Marco even could see Luca like this, or if the trouble at home had muddied the waters so much that Marco didn't even realize how much Luca repressed himself, until something brought that passion bursting to the fore. Not your place, Imra reminded himself, and tore his gaze from Luca to focus on his eggs. But as he lowered his eyes, he caught Myra's sidelong glance and had to turn away from her long, shrewd stare. When they finished, Luca volunteered for the dishes since Imra had cooked. Imra walked Myra out to the main barn. Since she was doing rounds anyway, he might as well take advantage. He thought she might let him off the hook when the entirety of her attention was devoted to the horses, the goats, even the chickens in their coop out behind the barn. She gave each animal a once-over exam, made quick not by carelessness but by expert experience. If veterinary expertise could be passed down through the generations, then Myra had all the knowledge of her father before her and her grandmother before him crammed into that sharp mind and her capable, efficient hands. She saw to the dogs last and snuck them a few treats from her pocket before sending them off to romp with the goats, bouncing as much as the hyperactive, blatting livestock. Imra walked her back to her truck, and quietly passed her a roll of notes that disappeared into her utility jacket with a brief nod. He offered his hand. Thanks for switching your schedule to come out first. Luca would have stayed in that stall all night if I'd let him. Not a problem. You're not so far out of town, so it wasn't much bother. She shook his hand firmly, then dropped her hand into her pocket and tilted her head. So... What's the real story with the kid? Imra forced down a wince, tensing. I told you already. You told me he's a friend with some BS story about a gap year. She frowned. Feels like I've seen him before. Remember the wards before they moved out of town? Myra sucked in her cheeks, whistling. 
Little boy Blue's all grown up then, and apparently your friend. He is a friend, Imra sighed, raking his hair back out of his face, staring out across the fields. I'm trying to be his friend. Not sure that's something you can try to be. It's just something you are or you aren't. Myra touched his arm. Light, the gentle contact of work-calloused fingers that spoke as much for her concern as the softness of her voice. Be careful, Imre. He looked down at her, frowning. Of what? She smiled sadly and let her hand fall. Of everything. Twenty-one. Luca finished the dishes and tidying up just in time to step out and watch Myra's truck pull out onto the dirt lane, the early morning sun glinting in sharp winking stars off the roof. He raised his hand in a wave and thought he caught a smile in her rearview mirror as a slim brown hand slipped out the driver's side window in response. He liked her, he thought. He liked her a lot. How she was with the animals, how she had so much written inside her brain like an encyclopedia with countless pages, and could answer everything from the number of vertebrae in an alpine goat's spine to the proper carving time for a Guernsey cow without even stopping to think. He didn't know how anyone could be that smart, but God, he almost envied her. He lingered on the bouncing, rocking truck, then glanced at Imra. Imra stood with his shoulder propped against the corner of the smaller barn, his mouth set in a grim line, and though his gaze too was fixed on the truck, he didn't seem to actually be seeing it. Luca wasn't sure what he saw, but whatever it was, it pulled his brows into a darkly lowering ledge, casting those troubled blue eyes into tumultuous shadow. Luca drifted a step closer. Imra tensed turning his head, and looked at Luca for a silent moment in which Luca froze where he stood, trembled, waited for Imra to speak. But Imra only shook his head, that same shake that had left Luca so confused before, when he didn't know if it meant not you, or not me, or not now, before turning and walking away. Oblivious to the fact that each step ground the heels of his boots into the center of Luca's aching chest. Luca swallowed thickly, rubbing at the awful empty feeling just under his breastbone. What had he done wrong? Why was Imre upset with him already? What had Luca fucked up this time? Imre disappeared into the barn. Luca curled his hands, pressing them hard against his thighs, then squared his shoulders and followed. He stopped just under the shadow of the entryway and watched Imra. The man leaned between the horses' stalls while they hung their heads over the stall doors and pressed into him from either side. His eyes closed and his arms looped around their necks, as if drawing comfort from the warmth of horse flesh. And he didn't look up at all as Luca drifted past. Luca took refuge in Gia's stall, settling into a nest in the hay and cradling the goat in his lap. Her eyes seemed clearer, more focused, and when he scooped up a fingerful of her feed paste the way he'd seen Imra do, she stretched her neck toward his hand weakly, her agile lips working needily. Luca couldn't help smiling, easing the crush of heartache just a few feathers' weights. Good girl he whispered, and gave her his fingers to suckle clean, her warm, wet mouth tickling over his skin. He let that distract him from the sounds of Imra just a few feet away, working with the horses until he was just a collection of quiet noises, the faint clop of hooves, the rustle of straw, low, wickering snorts, the jingle of tack. As long as Luca rendered Imra down to that, he could be not a confusing, frustrating person who tied Luca up into knots. But just the soothing backdrop noise of a barn, complemented by the morning calls of birds flitting across the sky, the goats making their silly half-laugh, half-cough noises in their paddock, the dogs yipping. This was nice, Luca thought, as he fed Gia another mouthful and stroked behind her ears. And, he thought, he didn't miss the city at all. But he glanced up as Imra passed the goat's stalls, face set in stern lines of preoccupation, 
He fetched a currying brush from a row of them set on the far wall, then turned back. Luca watched him, hoping Imra would at least glance his way. But he didn't. Luca pressed his teeth against the inside of his lower lip. It took all his nerve to pull his voice from inside his chest, push it up his throat, force it past his lips. Imra? Imra jerked as if he'd been struck, turned his head, blinked at Luca, as if he'd forgotten he was there. He said nothing, only stopping, tilting his head, brows canted in silent question. Luca swallowed hard. He almost couldn't speak again and lowered his eyes, fixing his gaze on Gia instead of Imra. Was it a lot of money for Myra to come out? He barely straggled out a whisper and cleared his throat, trying to boost a bit more confidence into his voice. I have a little bit in my bank ac Absolutely not, Imra said firmly, yet there was no censure in the words. Instead, when Luca looked up, the kindness was in those blue eyes again, clearing away the pensive shadows as Imra watched him steadily. She was coming anyway. I paid for her usual rounds, and breakfast was the tip for Cianos first. His lips quirked. She says Lohera eggs are worth the trouble, and she'd sell a kidney for my apple-smoked bacon. Yet somehow that didn't ease the guilt in the pit of Luca's stomach. Imra was still being strange, and Luca averted his eyes. Maybe it wasn't Imra being strange at all. Maybe he was just being kind to a guest, and that kindness was already wearing thin. Oh, Luca mumbled. Okay. He'd thought Imra would walk away, but instead his shadow fell over the stall as he leaned one thick forearm on the door. The morning light falling into the barn caught on the dark hairs on his arm, turning their edges into golden arcs. Would you like to stay with her today? he asked. Luca perked. Would that be okay? Didn't you say we had to— I've got the apple orchard. Stay with Gia. You can feed Murta too. Imra's voice deepened, a warm rumble tinged with approval. You're good with them. Pleasure flushed through Luca, lifting him dizzily. I... I am? Soft touch. Makes all the difference. Imra paused, idly stroking at his beard, toying with the beads tipping the braids, then added, If she's better after lunch, we'll go riding. Deal? Deal? Luca nodded quickly, then lingered for a longer look. A faint rim of red ringed Imra's eyes, and those deep lines were still sunken into his face, subtly heightening the shadows and making the lines of his cheekbones into saber slashes above the trim of his beard, their high ridges starkly pronounced as cliffs. Maybe, maybe nothing was wrong at all, and Luca was reading too much into Imra being exhausted after a long night in the barn. Luca hesitated, then added, If you're okay, why wouldn't I be? That calm, curiously neutral response made Luca braver. Imra wouldn't shut him down or dismiss him. He wouldn't. You look tired, he ventured. Can't you take the day off? That's almost impossible on a farm. Imra chuckled, eyes creasing at the corners, that brief rumble flashing a hint of white teeth. I'll go to bed early tonight, all right? All right, Luca agreed, and smiled quickly before flushing and looking away again. I'm sorry for... I don't know, I just... Hmm? Luca's stomach made one riotous leap, then splashed back down into its place. I just want to take care of you he whispered. Silence. Luca winced, squeezing his eyes shut and sinking down into his shoulders. Then the stall door creaked, and hay crunched under heavy boots. Imra's warmth drew in on him, leeching the September morning chill from the air. I've been taking care of myself for a while, Angyoka. That voice rumbled close. So very close, as real a touch as brimming, comforting body heat. Luca peeked one eye open, holding his breath. Imra crouched before him, powerful body folded with lithe grace, his hair tumbling over one shoulder in a silvered waterfall that practically fell into Luca's lap.
This Closimra smelled of saddle oil and leather and horse flesh, taken in shallowly through Luca's nostrils. His heartbeat tried to stop, but his racing pulse made that impossible, a flooded river breaking its banks and threatening to shatter the levees of his heart. Intensely blue eyes filled his vision, holding him petrified. Besides, Imra murmured, I'm supposed to be the one taking care of you. Luca's mouth was too dry to speak. He swallowed, took in a shaky breath, made himself meet Imra's eyes. Made himself be brave, when his heart was full and heavy and his stomach was taut with terror, and all he could think of was wrapping his arms around Imra's neck and burying his face in his beard and breathing, I'm always going to love you, Imi. I'm always going to love you, Imra. There wasn't enough room in his body for the courage to say that. He could only whisper, It can't go both ways? Imra smiled, leaned in. Luca strained toward him. And Imra pressed two fingers to the center of Luca's forehead, pushing him playfully back. Supper's on you tonight, then, okay? Then he stood, leaving Luca frozen, staring, with a lap full of confused goat and his breaths tasting of the salt of Imra's musk. Okay, he rasped, as Imra chuckled and walked away. Lucas stared after him, groaned, then slumped forward and buried his face into Gia's warm flank, digging a hand into his hair. Bah, Gia said. Fuck, Luca answered. Just, just, fuck. Twenty-two. Imra took Andrash out with the herds, but left Jophia in her stall. If he had his guess right, she'd be getting a double workout this afternoon with a novice rider. But that presented its own problems. He whistled for Vila and Shetty. The Australian shepherds came bounding over the grass, then split into familiar formation, Imra bringing up the rear while Vila and Shetty took flanking positions, racing up and down the lines of the herd to keep the goats boxed in and moving in the same general direction. They took the hills at a light trot, moving steadily underneath the rising sun. The sky was that crisp, cloudless blue that came just before a freeze, the air high and hard with a certain loamy tang that promised a deepening autumn soon. He'd get one last burst of clover and alfalfa out of the newly seeded fields, one last harvest of honey from the hives, one last milking before the last of the kids were weaned, and then there'd be nothing but snow and fallow earth until March, last frost and sweet corn planting season. Winter was always quiet on the farm, a time to repair odds and ends, bottle and can and preserve things, turn milk into cream and cheese and butter, while making sure the animals kept warm and fed inside the heated barns. Winter was the closest he ever took to time off. But this winter he'd be shut away not with his thoughts, but with a boy who wanted to take care of him, and who looked at him as if those ten years apart had left him in drought and aching to slake some unnamed thirst. Be careful, Myra had said, and Imra sighed. He wanted to be careful, with Luca, with that fragile and tender heart, but he didn't know how. He let his thoughts drift into nothing, familiarity soothing him into quiet as he worked with the dogs to split the herds and drive them toward two separate grazing pastures, both bursting with the latest crop of tall, white-frothing ladino clover vying for space with purple-blooming alfalfa and the violet droplets of vetch hanging between their fern-like leaves, so prevalent they grew naturally without needing to be seeded. The fields were cut into patches by irrigation ditches turned watering brooks during grazing cycles, and Imra guided Andrash slowly between the rows, searching between the plants for any weeds or poisonous invaders. One stray seed pod on the wind could ruin an entire field with lethal invasive species and decimate an entire herd. Accident had brought down two of his nannies. He wouldn't let carelessness hurt any more.
The sun was cresting at mid-morning and climbing toward noon by the time he left the herds in the dog's care and made his way back to the farmhouse. He glimpsed Luca as he put the roan gelding down to rest and eat, but Luca had his earbuds in and was so preoccupied feeding Murta from a bottle that he didn't even notice Imra slipping in and out of the barn, or standing in the aisle, watching how gentle Luca was with the nanny, the way he cradled her head and seemed to instinctively know just the right angle to hold both her head and the bottle to ease her drinking without choking or forcing her. He was really good with them, Imra thought. He hoped like hell the nannies pulled through. It would cut him to the quick if either died. It always did, when he lost an animal to age or illness or predators or fate. But Luca didn't have the experience to know that it was part of farm life. A regrettable part of farm life, but still something to be dealt with and accepted. If Murta or Gia died... He'd be devastated. Imra crept from the barn so as not to disturb them and wheeled a large hand barrow packed with bushel buckets out to the half acre he'd fenced off behind wooden railings, beyond the farthest storage barn. His apple orchard was a relatively recent addition to Lohera, added only fifteen years ago, but by now he had a relatively strong mix of young and old trees in well-cultivated rows, a blend of Ribston Pippin, Sunset, and Egremont Russet Apples that cross-pollinated in different ways each season to produce uniquely blended harvests. This season's yielded sweet apples with subtle notes, with the red-orange Ribston Pippin's sharpness creeping into pleasant counterpoint beneath the dry bite of the Egremont Russet and the sunset's sweetness showing up at unexpected moments throughout the crop. The variations each year fascinated him, and he never tried to control them. He just let them grow as they would, and didn't try to hold too fast to any one thing or the other, no matter what the season might bring. He'd cleared a fair portion of the harvest before Luca had come, but another few good days would get the last of the ripe apples. He set two baskets beneath each fruit-heavy tree, limbs bowed underneath the weight of their bounty, then set to work, losing himself and his troubled thoughts in the focus on picking, inspecting, checking for worms and blight before tossing them into the keep basket or the basket for discards that weren't quite fit for human consumption but that goats and horses would gladly take as part of their winter bulking feed. A few bees droned around him as he worked, not particularly interested in him when they were mostly keeping to the hive boxes spaced among the trees, building up their honeycombs to guard their queens for the winter. The light backdrop of their looping, buzzing song eased him into a trance as he fell into the rhythm of pick, inspect, drop, move on, now and then shifting position to circle the lowest branches before levering himself up to brace his feet on the trunk and reach the higher branches. He was just stretching up to catch a ripe, round sunset apple from an uppermost twig, his feet planted against the thick trunk of an older tree and his other hand gripping tight at the base of a sturdy branch, when Luca's voice rang over the fields. Imra? he cried, then louder. Imra? That call sliced through Imra's chest. He lost his grip, lost his footing, crashed to the ground. Gravity and his own weight crushed together in a pounding slam. The apple tumbled out of his hand and rolled across the ground, its thudding bounces matching the erratic, frightened rhythm of his heart. He rolled over, pushing off before he fully found his feet, launching himself across the orchard as fast as his legs would take him. Imra! came again. His stomach plunged. He vaulted the orchard fence one-handed, ignoring the howl of pulling bruises, and tore around the house just as Luca came skidding out of the barn. Luca! Imra stumbled to a halt, panting, and gripped Luca's shoulders, dragging him close, searching his eyes. He wasn't bleeding, bruised, crying, though he stared up at Imra with wide, confused eyes. What happened? Imra growled. Are you hurt? Luca shook his head quickly, dark hair flying. She's standing up. He grinned and pointed at the barn. Gia stood up. Imra stared at him, 
then closed his eyes and took a deep, slow breath. Bloody hell. He let his hands fall away, scrubbing at his shirt just over his heart, which refused to calm down, still convinced that call of his name had been a cry of mortal peril. God damn it. You practically gave me a heart attack. I thought you'd been hurt or something had happened. He opened his eyes. Luca peered at him sheepishly through his lashes, scuffing his boots in the dirt and twisting at his lower lip with his fingers. Sorry he mumbled. I'm sorry, I didn't see you, and I don't have your cell number. His eyes lit with hope. Come see? Imra dragged a hand through his hair, then winced when his shoulder pulled. He'd be feeling that in the morning. This boy was going to kill him. Show me, he said, then followed after as Luca grinned and raced into the barn. Inside, Gia knelt in her stall, her head up and alert, while she nosed at bristles of hay and lipped them without much interest. In the adjacent stall, Myrta had tucked herself into a corner and was busy grooming herself with fumbling, uncoordinated movements, licking at her foreleg and, more often than not, missing and burying her nose in the hay. Luca stood over Gia, his face crestfallen. I swear she was standing up. She's upright. Sitting on her own. That's far better than she was last night. Imra knelt in the hay and pressed his palm, then his ear to Gia's flank, listening to the steady, pumping beat of her heart, then her breaths. When he waved his hand in front of her face, she shook her head, gaze tracking his hand, before fixing on him irritably. He chuckled and scratched between the nubs of her filed horns. She is weak and likely won't be able to stand on her own for more than a few moments here and there, but it's a start. He shifted his scratching down to under her chin. Don't you think so, little one? Are you feeling better? She promptly clamped her teeth down on the leather band of his wristwatch and started to chew. Imra snorted and gently tugged free. I'll take that as a yes. Luca watched, leaning against the wall of the stall and fidgeting. Myra really helped her, he said. That's what Myra does. She's the best vet I've ever known. She's really that good? It's a family practice. It's almost in their blood. Imra braced his hands to his thighs and stood. Like Lohara's in mine. Luca looked up at him for a pensive moment, pale eyes shadowed then looked away, plucking at his lower lip. I wonder what's in my blood. Trouble. When those green eyes sparked and darkened, Imra chuckled and rested his hand atop Luca's head, fiercely resisting a craving to stroke fully through those black strands. The best kind of trouble. Luca offered a wan smile, but little more. Imra extended his hand. Give me your phone, Angyulka. With a wrinkle between his brows, Luca fished in his pocket, retrieved his phone, and deposited it in Imra's palm. Imra tapped through to his address book, then entered his own phone number and saved a new entry before handing it back. No more shouting across the fields. That wan smile turned sheepish. No more shouting across the fields. Luca's thumbs flew over his phone and Imra's own buzzed in his back pocket. There. Imra tugged his phone out and read the new text on his screen. Sorry for yelling. Forgive me? Heart, heart, heart. He snorted. Forgiven. He saved Luca's number and stowed his phone again. Think you feel up for a ride, since Gia's coming out from under the weather? Luca brightened as if the sun had just lit up a grey morning. Really? Now? Wash up and... At least have a sandwich, but yes, no. Imra's nerves were still too frayed to go back to the apples. Better to have Luca where he could see him, until his mind convinced his heart Luca wasn't about to be snatched away by some terrible accident. Okay, Luca said, then grinned, bouncing on the balls of his feet. Okay. Okay, Imra repeated, then exhaled, shaking his head. Luca was already gone, the house door clattering shut. Did that boy ever sit still? 
23. Imra had never seen anyone fall off a horse as many times as Luca Ward, then get back up and climb right back on. They'd had a quick lunch, thick sandwiches eaten in bites between explaining how to bridle a horse, how to handle Jophia's soft mouth with a rope bit, how to soothe her into holding still for the saddle and stop her from puffing out her sides to thwart the girth strap. He let Luca saddle her himself, then made him do it again until he got it right. Luca, red-faced and gasping as he lifted a saddle that weighed as much as he did soaking wet, while Imra hid his smile behind his sandwich. He tried so hard. But he didn't quit, and Imra respected that. Now and then he touched a hand to Luca's shoulder or the small of his back to nudge him in the right direction, then pulled back immediately and put another step of space between them. Each time Luca looked at him oddly, but Imra moved on quickly, pointing Luca to another bit of tack, Jophia's hooves, the parts of the saddle. On the fourth try, Luca finally settled the saddle properly. Imra wasn't sure who was more relieved, the boy or the horse. Jophia flicked her ears back and let out an irritated snort, but planted her feet and held steady while Luca gripped the saddle fore and aft and tried to lift his leg high enough to get his foot into the stirrup. His boots slipped, and he laughed breathlessly. She looks a lot taller this way, he said. I don't know if I can get my leg up like that. Imra swallowed the last bite of his sandwich. You get used to it. Have to get your seat for horseback riding, and that means finding your legs. Here. Before he could talk himself out of it, he caught Luca around the waist and lifted him. Luca gasped, clutching at Imra's shoulders, staring down at him with the thick fringes of his lashes trembling. He was so small, Imra thought dimly, but could hardly hear himself for the roaring of his blood in his ears, strange and hot. For all that lanky height, he was so slim that Imra's hands easily spanned his waist, meeting front and back with that hot skin pressing to his palms through Luca's thin shirt, as Imra lifted him up to Jophia's back and set him down astride. Luca only clutched at his shoulders harder as he struggled with spreading his thighs over the mare's broad back. His fingers dug through Imra's shirt and into his flesh, a strangely pleasant feeling, until those soft fingers hit one of the bruises spreading under his shirt. The dull shock of pain snapped Imra from his reverie, and he pulled back, clearing his throat. His head felt strange, and Luca was just looking at him, still gripping tight at his shoulders until Imra twisted free and left Luca grasping at Jophia's mane. Imra looked away, biting back a snarl at himself. Let me saddle Andrash, he said. Just stay there, get used to it. We'll head out in a minute. Sure, Luca said faintly. Imra swore under his breath closed his eyes, and turned away from that stricken look. The blue roan gelding was a shield between himself and Luca, one he took advantage of as he distracted himself bridling and saddling Andrash, then swung himself up. Hold the reins in both hands, he said through his teeth. Firm grip, but not tight. Don't pull. Try to always keep some slack, and draw tight only when trying to guide her one way or the other. The reins are for steering and stopping, nothing else. You control speed and forward motion by how you hold your seat and with your knees against her side. Knees, not heels. Heels dig and can hurt her. Sit up straight, squeeze your knees gently, and she'll walk. Sit forward, squeeze more, and she'll trot. She's trained to respond to your seat, so if you sit as if bracing for speed, she'll give you speed. Oh! Luca looked small and pale and terrified, sitting stock still atop the tall, leggy horse. How fast can she go? Faster than you can handle right now, Imra said dryly. Let's try walking. Let go of her mane and take the reins. Stay sitting upright and very, very gently squeeze her sides. Got it.
Luca gulped a noisy swallow, then transferred his grip from mane to reins so quickly Imro would think he was a man hanging from a ledge, swinging hand over fist and afraid to let one finger slip. Luca's thighs tensed, and Jofia took two obedient steps forward, then drifted to a halt when Luca gasped, immediately going stiff, before letting out a whooping laugh. She moved! So she did. The best language of communication between horse and rider is body language, Angyoka. Talk to her with your body, and she'll talk back. Imre used his knees to guide Andrash into stepping backward, making room, then turned him about with a light tug of the reins to pace slowly toward the barn exit. Try to follow me. Take it slow. Okay, okay. Imre twisted in the saddle, watching Luca. Luca gripped the reins with utter concentration, knuckles white, and squeezed his thighs. He was too far forward in the saddle, his seat stiff, but Jofia still responded, taking three more steps forward, then stopping when Luca wobbled and went loose, grabbing at the saddle. He took several audibly shaky breaths, flicked Imra a wide-eyed look, then tried again. And again. And again, moving forward in fits and starts while Imra led him a few steps at a time, until he seemed to get the hang of it and Jofia settled into a steady walk, plodding placidly out of the barn and into the yard, where she promptly reared up, tossed her shoulders, and pitched Luca arse over elbows into the dirt. He went tumbling and landed hard with a yelp. Imra fought the urge to dismount and go to him. This was part of learning. Jofia came down lightly, then turned and nosed Luca, pushing her muzzle into his cheek. Luca groaned, rolling onto his back and shoving at her face. Oh, he muttered. I don't like you. Jofia lipped his fingers. Imrit chuckled and guided Andrash closer and leaned down to offer his hand. Up, try again. To Jofia, there's absolutely no reason for you to be on her back unless you give her a reason. If you don't know why you're there, she doesn't either. I'm there to go places or something. Is that your only reason? Luca squinted at him sourly, then slid his warm, slender hand into Imra's, before sliding up to grip at his wrist. Imra grasped Luca's fine-boned wrist and hauled him up lightly, lifting him onto his feet. Luca dusted dirt from his hopelessly stained clothing, then scowled at the mare. Why do I need a reason at all? You need confidence in what you want. If you don't have it, she'll feel it. You'll make her nervous, and she'll want to get away. Body language, Onyulka, body language. Luca played his lower lip between his teeth, then said slowly, She's beautiful. He stopped, then started again. When she moves, it's beautiful, and she looks like she can fly. A nervous glance toward Imra. I want to know what it feels like to fly with her. Something melted inside Imra, at that look, and he gave Luca his hand once more. Then get back into the saddle and find out. Luca flashed a small, fierce, toothy grin and nodded. He gripped Imra's wrist in one hand and the edge of the saddle in the other, and managed to get his foot into Jofia's stirrup before Imra heaved him back into the saddle. The boy landed heavily awkwardly, but Jofia held patiently still while he found his seat again, took the reins, and nudged her forward with his knees, and made it half a circuit of the yard before she kicked her hips and hind legs into a sideways twist and tossed him again, then thrust her nose into his hair and blew, puffing him out like a wispy black dandelion. Now I really don't like you, Luca muttered, and Imra burst into laughter. Up, he said again. Luca glowered at him, but he got up and let Imra toss him back into the saddle, and let Jofia toss him back into the dirt. And so it went, again and again, and each time he held his seat a little longer and took to the saddle a bit more smoothly. By the time the sun reached Zenith, Jofia wasn't throwing him on a walk any more. But the second he tried a trot, leaning forward and pressing with his thighs, she pitched him again, 
sending him tumbling with his heels over his ears. Imra circled them at a safe distance, only coming in close to help Luca up until Luca didn't need help any more, and flung himself back in the saddle on his own, brows knit in a thunderously black line of determination, and jaw set tight as he followed Imra's murmured instructions with utter silent focus. He was gloriously dirty by the time the glaring sunlight slanted into mid-afternoon, that pale skin streaked in grit, his hair a dusty mess, his shirt and jeans torn and stained. But the ferocious light in his eyes outshone every bit of filth, pale green snapping hot, pretty mouth drawn into a fierce line that now and then stretched into a feral, cat-like grin when Jophia actually did what he wanted. Imra watched as Luca circled the yard at a slow and careful trot, his body lifting up slightly from the saddle with each of Jophia's light steps. Wild hair flying, lashing in and out of his face and cutting his eyes into blades of tender new grass. That grin was back, triumphant, a grin that was half joy, half war cry, and Imra's heart went slow and heavy as Luca leaned his entire graceful body into a turn, moving with Jophia's body language and flow with a moment of perfect fluidity. Luca completed the circuit, then drew the mare to a halt next to Imra with a light tug on the reins, settling his body back in the saddle. Tossing his hair back, he looked up at Imra, panting and breathlessly flushed, eyes alight. I'm doing it, Imra. I did it. Not bad for your first time. That grin was still there, and Imra caught himself leaning toward it, then jerked back enough to make Andrash take a little sidestep. Let's try out in the field, see how you do on the trails. Just a sec. Luca fumbled in his pocket, clutching the reins one-handed and dug out his phone. With a nudge of one knee, he sent Jophia bumping up against Andrash and Luca bumping up against Imra. He stretched his phone out at arm's length. Take a selfie with me first. He leaned shoulder to shoulder against Imra thigh to thigh, his skin so hot under cotton and denim, as if he'd absorbed the afternoon sun into himself and gave it back tenfold. Imra's stomach bottomed out, a deep pull of muscle tension tightening in his inner thighs, and he grit his teeth, struggling to hold his seat. Why? he ground out. So I can post it to Facebook and make Zave jealous of how much fun I'm having. Luca angled the phone his head practically resting to Imra's shoulder, cool hair washing against his neck. Imra caught a glimpse of his own face on the screen, glowering, almost sullen, glaring away from Luca's bright smile, before he fixed his gaze on the fence. Fine, he muttered. Luca laughed. Oh, my God, Imra, you have to smile. No. Try, please. Imra thinned his lips and Luca laughed again. That's not a smile. That is my smile. Luca snickered, then snapped the shot before turning his head toward Imra. Why are you like this? Imra frowned. Like what? Never mind. Luca propped his chin on Imra's shoulder, its delicate point digging in lightly. Just never mind, Imra. Light breaths slipped under his jaw curled over his ear. Imra turned his head. The tip of his nose brushed against the impertinently kittenish tip of Luca's, skin to skin. The small, strange smile on Luca's lips vanished, and in the shadow of his lashes his eyes were clear and soft, asking a question Imra didn't dare let himself answer. If he spoke a single word, if he moved his lips the slightest bit, that mouth, that pink, overripe raspberry of a mouth, would touch his, and already Imra could taste him, a hint of something like berry chapstick and a drugged honeysuckle wine sweetness that was just Luca, kissing the infinitesimal breath of air that separated their lips. No, he told himself, but the word was faint and small, and the pulse of blood in his aching mouth was so very, very loud. Luca's lashes lowered, his gaze dropping to Imra's mouth. 
The flush in his cheeks deepened, a color prettier than any Imra had seen outside sunset over the dales. Luca's lips parted further, and Andrash flicked his tail, brushing against Jophia. The mare started, dancing away and taking Luca with her, gasping and clutching at saddle and reins both, his eyes wide and dazed and utterly lost. Imra jerked back to reality, heart pounding throbbing. What the hell had he been thinking? He hadn't been thinking. That was the problem. And if not for the horses, he'd have damned himself in a moment and a breath just for the taste of raspberry lips. Luca was still watching him, still that unspoken question. Imra only shook his head and guided Andrash into turning away. Trail, he grunted, set his knees to the gelding's side and let him take off, until Luca was only a secondary cadence of hooves at his back, part of the backdrop, pushed to the furthest reaches of his thoughts. As it should be, Imra told himself. As it damned well had to be. 24. Luca barely had time to stare after Imra's back before Jophia decided to play follow the leader and shot after Imra and Andrash, leaving Luca yelping and clutching at the saddle, then her mane, then her reins. The butterflies in his stomach turned into stinging hornets, prickling with a sweet thrill of terror and exhilaration as the mare took off in a canter, following Imra down a narrow beaten trail that led between pastures of budding plants and other fields that were just crushed corn stalks ground into the earth in rows. Luca barely had time to take in more than flashes of green and brown and the occasional reflective blue glimmer of a slow-moving brook when it took everything in him to keep his seat. Keep his seat, and not completely lose his head. He'd only been playing around, resting his chin on Imra's shoulder. But then Imra had turned his head, and that soft silver-gray beard had flowed against Luca's cheeks, and that kind, firm mouth had hovered over his own. The axis of Luca's world had shifted to rotate around that moment, that whisper of silence, that singular place where their breaths met and mingled, while blue eyes looked into him as if Imra saw every bit of the trouble he called Luca. Then the horses had pulled apart, and Imra had stared at him like he'd been splashed with cold water, only to turn and run, because that was what Imra was doing, running, running from Luca. And Luca was afraid of what he would say if he caught him. And so he gave himself to Jophia, focusing on the strength and fluid power in her body, the way her muscles bunched under him until her movements rolled up through his thighs and his hips, responding when he shifted. The nervous, lovely terror in Luca's blood was half Imra, half the rush of wind and the burn of sun and the heave and surge of horse flesh and the pitching earth rushing past and he leaned into it and let the wind slap the sting of tears from his eyes, until he felt nothing but the weightlessness of flight as Jophia raced down the dirt path. Up ahead Imra was a dark lash of the roan's tail and the broad stretch of the man's shoulders, silver hair flowing and tossing in the same rhythm as the gelding's mane. Imra held his seat with a solid power and confidence, his body gliding like an extension of the gelding's, kinetic motion rolling up his hips and arcing through his spine, and tossing all the way out to the tips of his hair. Luca let himself watch him for just a single longing moment, but looked away when Imra drew the roan up, easing gently to a prancing halt at the edge of a broad pasture full of yellow grass and lovely purple flowering plants and clover, the air thick with their green, heady scent. Over two dozen goats danced around each other in little leaps, sprawled in sunny patches, nibbled at the clover. On the far end of the field, Vila sat at alert attention, watching over the herd with her head held high and her nose lifted to the wind. Luca pulled on the reins carefully. Jophia slowed but didn't stop, and he tried again, laughing. Come on! The horse snorted, then danced backward with a few high, jouncing steps, before settling to a stop a few feet away from Imra. Luca leaned down and patted her shoulder, 
stroking her sleek, burning hot hide. Good girl, see you do like me. You didn't fall off, Imra drawled. I'm a little surprised. Lucas straightened, glaring at him. Were you trying to make her throw me? No, I like to let them have their heads where it's safe on the paths. It's good for them to stretch their legs, after staying stabled most of the day. The fact that you didn't end up in the briars is just a pleasant shock. But Imra wasn't quite looking at him, his gaze on the milling herd of goats, and Lucas sighed. You like doing that? he murmured. Doing what? Giving an honest answer, but not a true one. But nothing, was all he said, shaking his head. Are we bringing the goats in now? Not yet. We're pulling a few out, so I can show you how to herd and how to work with a trained dog. Why? Luca wondered. Why are you teaching me how to do these things when you obviously don't want me here? Imra derailed his train of thought with a loud, piercing whistle through his teeth, followed by a series of clicks. Vila perked like a soldier coming to attention, her ears lifting, her gaze trained attentively on Imra, who pointed two fingers to his eyes, then to three grazing goats toward the edge of the field, following each one with a click of his tongue. After the last click, Imra pointed firmly toward the shallow, thread-thin brook that marked one boundary of the field. Vila started forward, tail high, and confirmed with a sharp bark, then shot off to one side, arrowing around on a path that let her cut between the three goats and the main herd. With a nudging nose and soft yips, she worried at them, irritated them into moving, then kept on their heels as they left off grazing, and with annoyed bleats, trotted toward the brook. Herd animals are single-minded creatures, Imra said, reciting information almost tonelessly. Once you get them moving in a certain direction, they'll keep running until they're worn out, or until they hit an obstacle. The trick is keeping them going the way you want. If they see something that frightens them, they'll veer off from the set path. Or with goats, they'll do it just because they bloody well want to. They're spry and agile and can turn on a coin, so you have to watch them close, flank them. The only way to change their direction is to cut off their path, until they have no choice but to go where you want. The dogs will always be better at that than you out in the field, faster, more responsive. Out here it's your job to back them up once things get moving, not the other way around. It only takes a few dogs to manage a herd, but if things go south, they'll need you. You and a horse are bigger, more effective blockade than a dog. Luca listened quietly, processing everything as best he could, but with every word the aching familiarity built into a horrible, crushing pressure inside him. So basically one to either side, like a corridor. It's better with three. Usually with Vila and Shetty they flank while I bring up the rear for effective coverage. Is that what you and Dad and Mum are doing to me? Luca asked, his stomach a hard knot. He stared miserably at the crest between Jophia's ears. Flanking and herding me until there's only one way I can go. Imra's gaze snapped toward him, then softened. He nudged his horse closer to Luca, until their knees bumped. One large hand slipped into Luca's line of sight, covering both of his, completely eclipsing them in Imra's warmth. They might be, Imra said softly. I'm not. Then he pulled back and spun the roan about into a trot, taking off across the fields, the dull thud of hooves nearly drowning the words that drifted back. Come on, take the left. Follow my lead. But Luca stared after him and curled his fingers, rubbing his thumb over his knuckles, where he could still feel the coarseness of that hard and weathered palm. It took two tries before Luca figured out the right pressure to get Jophia to go trotting after Imra. They splashed across the brook just in time to meet the goats as they forged through and came out dripping and complaining in high, blatting cries on the other side, Vila nosing at their haunches. On the other side of the brook was an empty field, mostly green tangles of roots gone to mulch and mixed in broken bits with loose furrows of dirt. 
Luca didn't understand what he was supposed to do, until with a whistle Imra began driving the goats in a circle around the field, Vila flanking. Luca hung back and watched, until one of the trio tried to break off and sprint for the farthest hedgerow. Without thinking, Luca squeezed Jophia's sides and sent her shooting forward with him clinging to her back, half holding her mane, half holding her reins, instinctively leaning the way he wanted her to go, straining toward the goat's trajectory. She obliged, long legs flying, and they shot across the goat's path. It stumbled back, nearly sneering at them with a nasal sound, and veered back toward the other two with Luca on its hooves. Like that? he asked breathlessly, falling in at one side of the mini herd while Vila dropped back to the rear. Just like that, Imra said. Now keep going. They spent the afternoon that way, chasing goats through the field, while every time Luca thought he had the hang of it, Imra brought in a few more, until they were herding ten increasingly aggravated nannies in circles, while Luca just tried not to fall and shivered every time a gust of cool breeze cut the afternoon heat and sliced right through his sweat-soaked shirt. When two broke off and made a determined sprint for the brook, Luca leaned that way so hard he almost spilled off. But Jophia was there to catch him, her body flowing under his, stretching into a ground-eating gallop that made his head spin as the wind of their passing tore the breath from his lungs with snatching fingers. He laughed, standing in the saddle and bowing over her neck, exhilaration belling out his chest and swooping out his throat in a whoop. The mare kicked up clods of dirt as she took a sharp pivot, swerving nearly to the ground, then lunged into the goat's paths. The nannies retreated and rejoined the herd, and Luca clung to the horse's back as she cantered back and fell into position. Too fast! he gasped, struggling to suck in mouthfuls of cool, sharp-tasting air. Imra watched him, his body jouncing easily with his roan's steady canter, seeming to have eyes for both Luca and the herd at the same time. Goats run fast, Angyoka. The horse must be fast to keep up. This horse likes to dump me on the ground. I'm just waiting for her to try it again. So be a nettle and stick to her back. Imra shoved his hair from his face. Sweat darkened pale silver to a deep pewter, shimmering and throwing back the sun in shifting shades. She'll learn to respect you, sooner or later. I thought you said she was like me, Luca grinned. I don't respect anyone. Wretch, Imra snorted, then lifted his head sharply. Straggler. Luca followed his gaze. A half-grown kid had broken off from the main herd across the brook and wandered too close to the fencing hedgerow and a gap leading out into dense, untamed forest. Luca gripped Jophia's reins. I'll... But Imra was already off, snapping Andrush's reins with a sharp, commanding sound, leaning over the massive gelding's neck. The roan leaped across the grass, the thick bulk of its muscles bunching and straining, nearly a hundred stone of horseflesh and man hurtling across the field as if shot from an arrow, the gelding's mane washing against Imra's intently set face, Imra's mane a banner of silver. He moved like the horse was an extension of his body, hardly seeming to touch the reins, controlling the gelding with twists of his hips and the flexion of straining thighs, every sharp turn drawing his waist into a sinewy curve, with his shirt pulled tight in sweat-dappled patches and his broad shoulders cutting the air as they swerved. Left, right, the skittish kid playing chicken trying to get past, darting around the gelding's legs and nearly tangling itself up. But Imra reared the gelding back, both human and equine bodies coiling into near-impossible contortions, sleek power so completely under control down to the last muscle. And as the horse's hooves came down, Imra leaned down and scooped up the kid mid-stride, pulling the struggling thing against his chest as the gelding thundered back toward the herd. A dull, burning pain scraped into Luca's palms, pulling him from staring to realize he'd been rolling and grinding Jophia's reins in his hands, working and twisting them with his fingers, until the raw edges of the leather abraded at his skin. 
he exhaled slowly and made himself look away. There was a funny feeling just under his skin, like he had another second skin made of heat and it fit his body too tight, slithering over every inch of him in a clinging film. And it got worse the more he tried not to look at Imra, when all he wanted to do was watch him move. He'd never seen someone with the kind of utter control Imra had over his own body, carrying himself with the complete confidence of someone who expected every last inch of himself to be equal to any demand. It was that confidence that made Imra so magnetic, because it never bred arrogance. Humble, yet not servile, self-effacing, yet never cowed. Luca wished. He just wished he knew his place in the world with the kind of certainty Imra had. Instead, Luca felt like a scrap of paper, folded and tucked in someone's pocket, carried around out of habit, but not really good for anything. Imra deposited the kid back with the main herd, then splashed Andrash across the brook again to rejoin Luca. Luca grinned at him. That was really cool. It's just part of the job. Imra whistled for Vila, commanding her with a series of short, sharp tones. Vila bounced on her paws, barked, and shot after the practice herd, nipping their hooves and driving them back across the brook to rejoin the main throng. Let's leave them be and let them graze and calm down until time to go in. Luca watched Imra from the corner of his eye as he settled the roan next to Jophia, both horses facing the herd. Beyond, the pastures stretched out into the rolling green and gold carpet of the dales, that red undercurrent starting to give way to rich brown, occasionally splashed with the last brave bloom of a patch of colourful flowers or the thick, tufted leaves of stands of trees. From here, the Lohera farmhouse was just a glint of sunlight off window panes and the slate of the roof rising out of green vines, with the barns spaced behind it like toys, and beyond, the reaching orchard branches marching on toward the flat, silvery sheen of the small river that bordered Imra's property. Beautiful, Luca thought. He'd forgotten the Yorkshire Dales were so beautiful. What do we do now, then? he asked softly. Watch them, Imra answered. Breathe. Be. Luca stole another long look at Imra from beneath his lashes. He was right there, his knee almost brushing Luca's, his hands resting casually tangled in the reins and draped between his thighs. Yet he seemed so far. But in his stillness was something of the easiness Luca remembered. The silent warmth he'd wanted since he'd shown up on Imra's doorstep and realized he'd been missing that particular silence for ten noisy, confusing years. Breathe, he repeated, then exhaled and settled in the saddle, letting his gaze sweep over the land once more. Be. Okay. Breathe. He breathed in the scent of horse flesh and sweat, and the taste of Imra on the wind. And, lidding his eyes, he tilted his head back toward the sun, and just let himself be. 25. By the time sunset came and Imra gave the signal to start the herd moving, Luca was ready to just be a puddle. He couldn't feel his arse. He wished he couldn't feel his thighs. Jophia looked like a delicate, slender thing, but there was nothing delicate or slender about the rib cage that had kept Luca stretched open all afternoon. Yet he wouldn't have traded those quiet hours for anything, watching the goats and letting the sun bake his shirt dry of sweat and saying not a word to Imra, because he didn't need to. Imra was there and not running away from him for now. But he was tempted to tell Imra to run back to the house and fetch the Land Rover, because Luca didn't think he was going to make it. Not when they had acres to travel and he was supposed to be on the alert for breakaways or potential stampedes. They covered the slopes at a swift, steady walk, one that let him get used to adjusting his seat when moving at an incline, 
But by the time they merged the herd with the second group and joined Shetty to their guard phalanx, Luca was gritting his teeth as the impact of every step shook up through him and rattled his sore bones. But he didn't complain. This was Imra's world, and he did this every day. Luca wasn't going to let his city-soft muscles get in the way. He'd survived today. He had. He wanted to be the kind of person who could survive anything. A blaze of sunset, it made him think of a hibiscus on fire, pink searing and burning at the edges, had doused itself in the cooler purple waters of twilight by the time they rounded the last straggling goat into the paddock, closed the gate, and led the horses into their barn. Luca rode Jophia right into her stall, then slid down her side and collapsed bonelessly into the hay. Ow! Tuck! Imra said firmly, leaning over the stall door. He propped a broom against the stall. Then sweep while I lock up the goats. My legs are killing me. Luca thunked his head back against the wall. My everything is killing me. Can't it wait until tomorrow? You can have a soak when we're done. Imra leaned his elbow on the door. Part of keeping animals is caring for them. Not putting them back on the shelf like a toy and forgetting about them until you want them again. We sweep, we bed them down, and then we clean up and have supper. I'll let you off the hook for cooking so you can soak off the bruises. Luca groaned, then dragged himself to his feet and draped himself against the door, leaning hard on his arms, shoulder to thick shoulder with Imra. Please stop reminding me I'm supposed to be a responsible adult. Imra leaned over and pushed him with his shoulder. Please stop making me remind you. Oi. Luca leaned back and answered with his own push. Stop trying to be fierce when you say that. Stop, Imra said with a gleam in his eye and another push, pointing out that I'm approximately as fierce as a shepherd pup. Luca grinned, leaning in, drawn by that gleam. You're a little scary when you're annoyed. Name the last time I was annoyed. Thinking. Luca leaned in until their foreheads almost bumped, dropping his voice to a stage whisper. Thinking really hard. Imra's eyes darkened, his subtle knot smile tugging at his lips. Before vanishing as he thrust back and disappeared down the side of the stall. Sweep while you think, floated down the aisle, and Luca slumped, dragging a hand over his face. God damn it. Sighing, he applied himself to taking care of Jophia, even if he could barely lift his sore, weak arms to grip a saddle and had to drag it off to let gravity do the rest. He rubbed her down as best he could, refilled her feet and water buckets, then stroked her soft nose before kissing right between her eyes. Thanks for not being too mean to me today, he murmured and scratched under her jaw. I'll just have to toughen up until I'm strong enough for you. When he stepped out into the aisle, Imra was nowhere in sight. Luca caught up the broom and set about sweeping down the aisle, thought it pointless to sweep dirt off more dirt. He still swished up the loose dust and hay and debris, tamped the packed earth down, and left the aisle as smooth as he could, pausing only to check in on Gia and Murta. Both nannies were resting easily, and had licked their pails of feed paste almost clean. He smiled and let them lip his fingers, then dragged himself back to work. He was just hanging the broom up when Imra rounded the barn doorway, dusting his hands off. Don? As much as I can be. Why don't you put in concrete? Luca asked. Then everything wouldn't get so dirty. Gets too cold in the winter. Bad for the hooves. Concrete scrapes at the horse's and goat's hooves. The hard surface doesn't absorb impact. Shock, it bounces it back. Can hurt their bones. Luca flushed. Oh, I hadn't thought of it that way. I'm not antiquated, Luca. Imra shrugged, slipping his hands into his pockets. I'm practical. I'll take the hard way around if it's best for my animals. It's not about me. Imra leaned against the door of Andrash's stall. Luca leaned next to him, folding his arms over his chest and fidgeting with the sleeves of his filthy shirt. I get it, he murmured. I do. 
You don't want to hurt them, but you sell them to people who might kill them, don't you? Not if I can help it. Full lips set in a thoughtful line as Imra tilted his head back, looking up at the rafters. Most of my sales are to other milk farms. We'll trade more often than sell. Keeps our stock fresh so we avoid too much inbreeding, and introduces healthy genetic variants. I've some buyers coming up from South Yorkshire this summer to look at the next group of kids. Luca perked. He had a vague memory of little bundles of fur and bright eyes and tiny hooves bouncing about on spring-loaded legs. There'll be kids, baby goats, in April and May. Oh! The spark of excitement snuffed as quickly as it had lit. I won't be here then. Imra drew in a deep breath and seemed to take his time letting it out before rumbling, your prison sentence is up in January, young Yoka. Prison sentence? Yeah. Imra said nothing else. Neither did Luca. But after several silent moments, Imra pushed away from the stalls and strode toward the exit. Luca lifted his head, staring at his broad back. Imra? Without looking back, Imra paused. Huh? Luca swallowed his nerves. Why are you avoiding me? You've been here for two days, and I've spent nearly every waking moment with you. Luca's ears burned. He wrapped his arms around himself, forced his thickening tongue to move. But you look at me, then look away like you're trying not to see me. His lips tasted sour with upset every time his tongue tip touched them. I missed you, but every time I'm too close to you, you find a reason to move away. Silence. Then, careful and slow and bland, I'm not avoiding you, Angyulka. Luca couldn't stand it. That tone, that empty nothing tone when Imra told untruths. He sucked in a hitching breath, glaring down at his feet and scrubbing his shirt sleeve against his face. Go ahead. Avoid me. I wouldn't blame you. Luca? My parents don't want me around either. He shrugged, pressing his lips together to stop their trembling. I'm just a problem for them. I need to get my shite together, grow up and get out of their hair. I'll get out of yours, too. They don't think that way. And then that slow burn warmth was there, and Imra's hand enveloped Luca's shoulder. And I don't either. I am sorry, Luca. I'm sorry I made you feel like I was avoiding you. Luca looked up into grave eyes, darkened to near midnight by, he didn't know, chagrin, sorrow, regret. Then why do you act like that? It's complicated. Imra squeezed Luca's shoulder gently, then let go. Let's say I'm trying to be a good host. Don't. Luca caught that hand before it could go far. Even wrapping it in both his own, he couldn't completely cover Imra's thick, massive fingers, but he still tried, pulling Imra's hand to his chest, holding it over his fast-beating heart, silently begging Imra to feel it. All my good memories, the ones that feel real, are here, he whispered. I don't want to feel like a guest here. Please. Imra stared down at him gaze fixed on their hands, unreadable beneath the gnarled twist of his brows. Slowly he spread his hand underneath Luca's, until his fingers splayed on his chest, his palm pressed flat, a brand scorching through Luca's shirt to imprint on his flesh, spanning nearly from his shoulder. The heat in that hand burned the breath from his lungs, like trying to breathe near the mouth of an active volcano. And still, he leaned into it, because it was Imra's touch. I'll try, Imra whispered, then pulled his hand away. Luca fought himself not to lean after him. The back of his throat drew tight, and he had to look away and take several deep breaths. He didn't know what he'd expected. I'll try was something, and it was all he could really ask for. Luca, Imra said. Yeah? Would you... Imra faltered, then grunted under his breath before starting again. Would you like to make a bonfire and cook outside tomorrow night? The first big frost will come soon, and after that it'll be too cold. 
could be our last chance. Lucas stole a glance at him, but Imra was looking up at the rafters again almost too studiously, and Luca couldn't help a faint smile. That big fucking oversized dork. He was trying. I'd like that, Luca murmured. Can we roast hot dogs? Imra snorted. Did you see hot dogs in the icebox? Town's only ten minutes out. Can't we go have a shop? No hot dogs, Imra retorted firmly. I'll show you something better. If you'll be patient, I'll even let you have beer. Let me, Luca wrinkled his nose. I'm of legal age to drink, you know. It's my brew. I don't let just anyone taste it. Imra paused, then added almost under his breath, Primarily because I'm not quite certain it's not shite yet. Rolling his eyes, Lucas slumped against the stalls at Imra's side again. I'm honoured to be your guinea pig. I prefer lab rat. Better results from sample groups. You're kind of a dick, Imra. I know. Imra answered simply, and Luca laughed. You're also kind of ridiculous. Imra blinked. Am I? Yeah. Yeah, you are, Luca thought fondly, and leaned over to rest lightly against Imra's side. And when he laid his head to Imra's shoulder, Imra didn't pull away, and Luca closed his eyes and let himself wish, just for this breath and this moment and this now. Yeah, he repeated softly, and curled his fingers against the thick curve of Imra's bicep. And it's kind of a good thing. 26. This, Imra thought, was what Myra had meant by be careful. In the flicker of living room hearth light, Luca was all ivory, amber, and shadow, the orange flame glow turning his eyes into the green gold of evening fireflies. He sprawled on his back on the chevron patterned rug before the fireplace, sandwiched between the quietly dozing heaps of Vila on one side and Shetty on the other. He'd changed into his pajamas after a soak in the downstairs bath, and before the quick pasta Alfredo dinner Imra had thrown together, and now Luca's oversized shirt rucked up above the waist of his loose boxers, bearing a pale crescent of his flat stomach as he held his phone over his head in both hands and scowled up at it. Imre had tucked himself in one of the deep, plush rockers flanking the leather-upholstered sofa, his thumb holding Shardick open at the spot he'd left off, but he'd not read a single line for watching Luca over the tops of the pages and past the rims of his reading glasses. He'd wanted to set down proper boundaries between them, but his proper boundaries had left Luca hurting and raw, looking up at him with pleading eyes and pressing Imra's hand over the fascinatingly frantic beat of his heart and begging, Please, please don't push me away. Yet keeping Luca close posed a problem of an entirely different nature, one that left Imra struggling, caught at a crossroads where every path led to ruin. How was he to protect that sweet, fragile, vulnerable heart, when every choice he made could destroy what tattered bits of trust Luca had left in him. Luca's phone pinged. Luca answered with a disgusted sound and let the phone drop to his chest, then sprawled his arms over his head and glared into the hearth. Dad says hello, sends his love. Ah? Uh? Imra arched a brow and set the book down against his thighs. Is that all he said? No. Want to talk about it? No, Luca retorted firmly, then turned those snapping green eyes on him. What are you reading? Imra lifted the paperback enough to show the cover, with its haunting bear mask framed in a ring of claws. Shardik? Luca pushed himself up on one arm, catching his phone as it tumbled down his chest, and squinted at the book. By that bloke who wrote Watership Down... Ah, you remembered? Yeah. Luca fidgeted, his toes moving against his athletic socks before he levered to his feet, wobbling a little before catching himself and peeling from between the drowsing dogs. Wait here. Then he was gone, pattering from the living room out into the foyer. Soft retreating steps on the stairs, 
the creak of the fifth step, and then that slight weight making the quietest of thumps overhead. Imra arched a brow and tilted his head back to look up at the ceiling with a touch of amusement, following Luca's path to his room by racing footsteps that passed overhead and then back again, before they were back on the stairs and past the creaking, groaning step and slipping back into the living room. He spilled into the firelight glow breathlessly, then stopped. A book clutched shyly to his chest. Its cover was worn and tattered, thick stock in simple pale brown stamped with a lithograph print of two rabbits among winding foliage. Imra blinked, then chuckled, sinking deeper in the chair with a strange pleasure melting through him. You kept it, he said. You gave it to me, Luca whispered, as if that was explanation enough, and held the book as tightly as if it were his most prized possession. Did you ever read it? Over and over. Luca opened the dog-eared cover with a delicate, reverent touch, his fingers graceful as they turned the pages, his eyes lidded as he traced his fingertips down the lines. Dandelion's my favorite. I like storytellers. Would you like me to tell you a story, young Yilka? Imra closed Shardik and set it aside on the glossy oak end table and stretched out a hand for Luca's book. Or read you one. Ah? Huh? Luca's brows rose before he broke into a brilliant smile and skittered closer to drop Watership down into Imra's palm. Yeah, yeah, I'd like that a lot. Luca reclaimed his place on the floor with the dogs, dragging a quilt off the sofa with him and nestling himself down into a bundle of pup and bright-patterned yarn and pale skin. Imra cradled the book in his palms and carefully folded the front cover open with his thumb. The pages and cover had that soft feeling, almost like matted felt, the texture of a book that had been handled many, many times. When he'd given it to Luca, it had been nearly new taken from his own shelf, and given to the boy as a parting gift on the last miserable day of an otherwise contented, idyllic summer that Imra hadn't known at the time would be the last summer his house would be full of wards, with Luca always underfoot, and Marco turning brown digging irrigation ditches under the sun, and Lucia sneezing over combing and trimming the goat's pelts, but refusing to give up the task to someone else. The very last time he'd seen Luca, Imra had given him this book, he realized. A whim, because Luca had read it over and over on nights just like this one, the fireplace warm and crackling, and the living room cozy and quiet. Imra traced the lines of his own handwriting on the inside cover, the ink still dark. With love, my Angelka, the inscription read, and a pang struck his heart and stilled the breaths in his lungs. Imra. Be careful, Myra whispered in counterpoint. The primroses were over, Luca prompted, leaning toward him with his eyes bright, that pale cat-like face so open, so eager, and suddenly Imra didn't understand at all. Didn't understand if he should be careful of Luca's heart or his own, when those clear, guileless green eyes were so tangled up in his thoughts he could hardly lower his gaze to the first chapter. Ah, he agreed, took a deep breath, and began. The primroses were over, he read. The primroses were over, and it would be a long, long winter with Luca always at hand, but ever out of reach. 27. And when Luca fell asleep by chapter 6, tangled among Vila and Shetty like a puppy himself, Imra wrestled with himself for over an hour as he watched how golden light played over the soft contour of Luca's cheek and fell lovingly over the long, smooth stretch of his neck, gathering like liquid amber in the hollow of his throat. The fire's flicker glided down slender, coltish legs, gilding their graceful curves and angles, and Imra followed the trickle of light over the slim twist of narrow hips, the arcs of thin shoulders inside the folds of the shirt, the articulation of long, soft fingers half buried in Shetty's pale pelt. Luca had pillowed his head on Vila's flank, and his hair blended in with her dark fur in an iridescent shine. 
In his sleep, he breathed through parted raspberry lips, and it was in those lips that the firelight gathered like pools of ambrosia, waiting to be tasted, sipped, taken of in deep and thirsty draughts. Imre tore his gaze away, clenching his jaw. He'd told himself no, and he'd meant it. Perhaps Luca was a man now, for all that he had his mother's youthful, girlish prettiness paired with his father's lissom build. But man or not, he wasn't the man for Imra. Imra was, probably to Luca, still Anka Imi, not a man, not a human with aches and that deep lonely twist in the centre of his chest, not a person, but an idea, an impression, a sense of place and protection and home. Someone Luca trusted to be safe, to be the shelter even his parents couldn't be right now. Even after the shock of years turning their meeting at the railway station into a first time all over again, Imra couldn't let himself forget what his place was with Luca, and he couldn't betray his trust that way. But nor could he leave him as he was right now. No matter the warm rugs scattered all about, a cold, hard stone floor was nowhere to sleep, especially after the beating Luca had taken today. Imra had given him a tin of ointment to mix with his bath water to ease the soreness, but Luca would likely wake complaining of bruises in the morning, and a sore back, if Imra didn't get him up to his room. He set the paper back aside and sank to one knee, gently shaking Luca's shoulder. Luca he whispered. Wake up, Angyulka, just long enough to get to bed. But Luca only moaned low in his throat, curling up and snuggling deeper into the dogs. Vila lifted her head with a low whine and nudged Luca's shoulder with her nose, then leaned her head against Imra's arm. He made low shush, shush sounds under his breath and stroked her flopping, tufted ears before leaning down to kiss the top of her shaggy head. Good girl, he whispered, then eased his arms underneath Luca, bundling him up in the quilt, and lifted him against his chest. Then closed his eyes, breathing in raggedly as Luca immediately curled up and nestled against him, tucking himself into Imra, as if he belonged right there in his arms. God, Imra's heart had never felt so heavy, and yet his stomach was light enough strange enough to lift him to his feet with Luca cradled close. He made such a small bundle, his weight a delicate nothing that nonetheless printed every impression of his body against Imra's flesh. He smelled like the pups, Imra thought, as he lingered on the fire-gold dusted curve of his lashes, the way the impudent tip of his nose tucked into the crook of Imra's neck, warming his skin with his sighing, sleeping breaths. Like the pups, the lilac ointment from the bath, like Luca, some indefinable and yet painfully familiar thing, subtly reminiscent of warm, sweet beeswax, a scent that reached down inside Imra and found old and buried threads of memory and emotion, pulled them all out of shape, tangled and twisted and wove them into something new. And that new thing hurt, with all the raw edges of something fresh-born and still jagged and sharp and unpolished enough to cut and abrade with every touch. Imra swallowed back the thick knot of emotion in his throat and carried Luca up the stairs, curling protectively around him on the narrow flight and angling to keep from bumping his head, his feet. Upstairs he elbowed the door to Luca's room open and bent to lay him in his bed. But as Imra moved to let him go, Luca twined one arm around his neck. The fingers of his other hand crept into Imra's beard, burying in, deep and clinging with a soft, electrifying touch. Imra sucked in a sharp breath, his heart thudding. Imra, Luca murmured, still asleep the whole time and completely unaware of what he was doing. Imra closed his eyes, prayed for willpower, then gently clasped Luca's delicate wrists and tugged his hands free. Carefully, he laid Luca out on the bed and pulled the covers up over him. Luca tossed restlessly, then curled up on his side, burrowing into the pillow, one arm flung across the bed as if reaching for something, his fingers splayed into a white star against the dark blue sheets.
Imra splayed his own hand and pressed it palm down to the sheets, so that his fingertips just fit into the spaces between Luca's, without quite touching. Be careful, he warned himself, then rose, backed from the room, and eased the door closed until it latched without a sound. Be careful. But it was getting harder and harder to listen. 28. Luca didn't remember falling asleep last night. He only remembered that Vila and Shetty had smelled like clover, and Imra's voice had been low and sweet, melding with the crackle of firelight until the hypnotic sound had lulled Luca into a daze. He must have staggered up to bed. He was lucky he hadn't killed himself on the stairs. Or broken something, considering how much everything hurt. Wincing, he stretched onto his back and let his pummeled, bruised body sink into the mattress. He didn't want to think about what he must look like under his clothing, when hard-throbbing spots of pain pounded over every inch of him. Jophia had worked him over but good, and he was probably going to walk bow-legged for the next few days. He didn't remember life at Lohera being so hard. Then again, he'd been a little rugrat before, too small to do anything but get in everyone's way, and now and then tote something around to be marginally useful. He'd helped with picking apples, he remembered. Imra had lifted him up as if he'd been lighter than an apple blossom, and Luca had climbed into the highest branches and thrown the apples down into the bushel baskets. When they'd moved from tree to tree, Luca had perched on Imra's shoulder, his heels dangling down over his chest. He couldn't remember if Luca had been so tiny or Imra had been so broad that he could fit on one shoulder with room to spare, but he had a feeling it was a combination of both. He couldn't help smiling as he reached over his head to brush his fingers along the tiny bells hanging from the scarf above the headboard, creating a glissando of sound. As his arm fell, he ran his fingertips along the wilted crown of clover blossoms he'd left over the lamp. They were starting to brown, but as they wilted they let loose a thick, heady fragrance that mingled with the breath of cold morning seeping through the window pane. Luca closed his eyes and just let himself breathe that scent, soaking it in down to his bones. He couldn't remember any time in the last ten years that he'd woken up smiling like this. But he couldn't hear Imra or the dogs downstairs, and the light through the window was bright enough to tell him it was well past the time Imra normally rose. Luca pushed himself up on one elbow and swiped the touchpad on his laptop, waking the screen. His eyes widened. 8.17 a.m.? Fuck. He started to push up, then caught the blinking message notification in the browser window left open on his taskbar. He clicked over. He had over fifty notifications with comments and likes on his selfie with Imra, and new messages from Zave. Xavier Lagari. You tit. You post that and disappear. He's so hot I might turn gay. I want details. Like, now. Luca closed the messenger window with a laugh and rolled out of bed. He'd answer later. Right now, he just wanted to see Imra. His laughter became a hiss as his spine twisted, and bruises throbbed up through every inch of his sore, screaming body. He felt like every muscle of his being had been pulled and stretched like taffy, then left to mould into the bed, and now it didn't want to move from the shape it had hardened in. But he dragged himself fully upright, bracing on the wall and uncranking himself until his back popped in a horrible crunching sound, enough for him to straighten completely and hobble from the room, down the hall, down the stairs. The kitchen was empty, though he could smell faint after-impressions of baking, something savoury with a touch of spice. A note waited on the kitchen table, written on yellow legal paper, its edges curling and its corner weighed down by the jar of green apples. Let you sleep in today. Don't get used to it. Stretching and a shower will help the soreness. Breakfast is warming in the oven. Check on Gia and Murta. Then meet me in the orchard. Lucas scanned Imra's scrolling, archaic handwriting with its graceful, slanting letters and flowing curl. 
His signature was just a tall, slashing loop of a calligraphic eye. The pit of Luca's stomach tightened with a quiet sweetness. Imra might have pushed him hard yesterday, but he'd let him rest, and now... Now Imra was waiting for him. He'd just have to work harder, get stronger, so that one day he'd be up with the dawn, and Imra would never have to wait for him again. Luca grinned, set the note back on the table, and headed back upstairs to shower. 29. Imra had filled over half a dozen bushel baskets with apples by the time he heard his name, called over the orchard with a laugh and seeming to break the mid-morning light into bits of shattered crystal. Imre! He adjusted his position on the branch he straddled, plucking an egromont from its twig and looking down through the boughs. Crisscrossed by a latticework of branches, Luca strolled down the rows, lanky and graceful in clinging jeans and a tight-fitting black turtleneck in warm, snug knit with three-quarter length sleeves. He walked with a subtle limp he no doubt thought he was hiding. Imra bit back a grin. Stubborn. Catch, he called, and tossed the apple in his hand downward. Lucas snapped his hands up to catch it, then stood blinking at the apple clutched between both palms as if wondering how it got there. His expression cleared, and he angled an impish look and one-sided smile up at Imra. Morning. He polished the apple on his shirt, then took a pointed, rather deliberate bite, as fierce as a pup savaging a bone. Still smirking, he kicked a few steps closer to Imra's tree, tilting his head back to look up at him and swallowing. You're going to break that branch? Not if I balance myself correctly. Luca laughed. Don't you think someone lighter should be up there? Think you can handle it? Imra braced a hand against the trunk and leaned over, looking down into those clear, laughing green eyes. I thought you were afraid of heights. I am not. I never said that. With a chuckle, Imra swung himself down. The branch gave a threatening creak as it bowed, before snapping back up as Imra touched boots to ground and let go. A shower of leaves drifted down, and he shook them out of his hair. But Jofia's so very tall. With a snort, Luca buried his teeth in the apple again, mumbling, Anything's tall when you're falling off it. Best not fall, then. Luca looked up at the tree, back to Imre, up at the tree, back to Imre. Then tossed the apple, smiling so wide his eyes illuminated like breathless green fire, and stepped closer to Imre, a challenge lighting his face. Going to lift me up? Not the original plan, Imre started to say. But then Luca was swaying closer, and instinct brought Imre's hands up to catch him around the waist. Soft knit yielded under his fingertips as if sinking his fingers into equally soft flesh, and this time he couldn't mistake the slim flaring ridges of Luca's hip bones, the way his lower back started to curve outward, just below the edges of Imra's palms. Luca tilted his head, his cheeks flushed with the cold. It had to be the cold, Imra told himself, just as the cold was the reason why his chest felt tight, his breaths like razors. Hold on tight, he said, and lifted Luca up. Luca laughed, clutching at Imra's arms, then letting go and reaching for the branches overhead. Agile as a cat, he pulled himself up, until slim thighs slid against Imra's palms, then Luca's calves, and then he was gone, climbing higher, spry and nimble as a sprite who tucked himself to sleep among the leaves and boughs each night in his moonlit bower, leaving Imra's empty palms tingling. Luca braced himself, standing with his feet spread between the uppermost branches, then peered down at Imra through the leaves, hair falling across his face in a tangle. Just like we used to, he called. Just so, Imra answered. Then ducked as an apple came raining down, shooting toward the half-full basket and narrowly missing clocking him in the shoulder. Oi! Luca's merry, delighted laughter answered. I remember you being faster. I remember you being less of a brat. Then your memory's broken. Another apple sailed downward and dropped into the basket. 
I have never not been a brat. No, you haven't been, Imra thought fondly, a warmth in his chest that not even the early autumn chill could dispel. Not once. They set to work then, and for a few sweet minutes it felt as though Luca had never left. As though the passing years had happened at Lohera, every apple harvest finding Luca a little taller, a little older, a little wiser, a little spryer, and Dimra a little less alone. As if he'd not spent the last ten years doing this by himself, now and then hiring hands with time to spare from the nearby farms. As if he'd as if he'd not been left behind, time stopping at Lohera while the world moved on without him. Heads up, Luca called, just as he came swinging down to a thick, low-hanging branch. Imra pulled from his thoughts and realized he was standing there, looking down at the rosy, red-gold apple in his palm as if reading secrets in its subtly dappled skin. He looked up. The tree was completely denuded of all but leaves and a few shriveled by-blows that would fall off on their own soon, and one pretty young man, straddling a branch with his legs swinging, berry lips as ripe as the apples. Luca grinned. Which basket do I go in, discards or keeps? Imri snorted, pitched the apple in the keep basket, and reached up for him. Get down here. Lucas spilled forward without a moment's hesitation, and Imra was struck by the carefreeness of it. How easily Luca trusted that if he fell, Imra would be there to catch him. And catch him he did, snaring him around the waist once more, swinging his momentum about mid-fall and lifting him up to perch Luca on his shoulder. He weighed practically nothing, and Imra clamped one arm across his lap to keep him from flying away. While Luca laughed and leaned into him, Imra's head tucked into the cradle of his waist and hip, one slender hand reaching across to brace on Imra's opposite shoulder, so very warm through Imra's shirt. Luca's weight was a pleasant softness nestled against him, his honeyed scent flooding Imra's nostrils. Still too big, Luca teased. Big enough to handle you. Luca let out a choked sound. You really don't hear yourself when you talk, do you? Imra tilted his head enough to eye him sidelong. There is nothing wrong with my hearing. Never mind. You're hopeless. Luca grinned, then pointed toward the next tree. Forward! Imra had started to step forward, but now he stopped, digging his heels in. I am not Jophia. You're a lot easier to ride. Luca retorted, blinking with a wide-eyed innocence that did nothing to hide what an utter little cat he was. Imra growled. Luca! I didn't say anything. Yet that laughter made a liar of him. Laughter that Imra couldn't help but echo, even if it was hard to laugh when every ounce of willpower was caught in burying that brief flash of imagery, that moment's stray thought. The awareness of Luca's thighs pressed against his palm, and that hot, slight, graceful weight propped against him, tangled around him, leaning so very close. Apples, he reminded himself, and stepped forward to the next tree, positioning himself underneath and giving Luca a boost up into the branches. Apples. Up you go, he said, holding fast until Luca pulled out of reach and told himself he wasn't disappointed, as that warmth escaped his fingertips and left him holding nothing but air, and the promise of a very, very long day. Long week. Long months. And Luca had only been here three days. Thirty. By the time they broke for lunch... Luca had worked most of the soreness out of his body, even if now and then he still felt the saddle bruises as Imra tossed him up onto another branch. His stomach leaped each time, a thrill like riding a roller coaster, and every moment of that thrill was Imra's thick, heavy hands on him, and not a bit of it for the rush of gravity trying to pull him down when all he wanted was to fly. Lunch was leftover steak, asparagus and potatoes tossed together with lettuce and celery into a salad and served cold, before they were out in the orchard again. Teasing laughter had become easy silence long before, 
and Luca almost lost track of the time as he settled into the quiet, satisfying rhythm of working with Imra. Only when the sun kissed the edge of the land did they stop, piling bushels of apples into the hand barrow and wheeling them in before mounting up and heading out. Today, Jophia didn't throw him, and today, when Imra whistled his signals to the dogs, Luca followed as well, learning to recognize each command without thinking, and a glow of pride took root deep inside his chest when he cut off two straying nanny goats without having to be told, veering Jophia to round them back up and bring them back in line with the herd. Imra didn't say anything. But Luca liked to think the long look Imra gave him was tinted with approval nonetheless. Once the goats were in, the horses bedded down, the stables swept, Gia and Myrta fed, paste mixed with solid food now, and they stood on their own to crane their necks for their bottles, Luca headed for the shower, only to hear Imra beat him inside with one of his low, rumbling chuckles, shutting the door in his face. Luca laughed, staring at the door. What in the actual fuck, Imra? You take long showers, floated through the door. Let me clean up first so I can set up the bonfire while you wash off. I don't like it when you're logical. I don't like it when I smell like sweat. I do, Luca thought, and bit his lip on that secret thought. Just let me know when you're done, he called, and retreated to his room to pick out something to wear. Something to wear, like this was a date. Luca plucked at his lower lip, settling on the edge of his bed with a jumper clutched against his chest. This wasn't a date, he reminded himself. Wasn't anything. It never could be. It didn't matter what he wore. Imra wasn't looking. Luca sighed and kicked his half-unpacked bag, then rose to start putting the rest of his things away in the chest at the foot of the bed. He was here, and he wasn't even unhappy about being here. He might as well settle in, instead of acting like he'd be leaving with the dawn. Even if that urge to run was still there, though he didn't know quite what he was running from. By the time he'd finished folding things away, the water in the shower had shut off. A light rap shook Luca's doorframe, before Imra's shadow beneath the door moved away and the sound of his bedroom door latching drifted down the hall. Luca lifted his head, staring at the door, then looked down at the pretty wraparound cardigan he'd been about to fold and put away, a translucent black knit with a cowl collar that he'd borrowed from his mother's closet years ago and never quite remembered to return. Fuck it. Maybe Imra wasn't looking, but if Luca wanted to look nice, he'd do it for himself. He could already hear Imra downstairs by the time Luca picked out a pair of soft-worn, ripped jeans in faded blue and shut himself into the bathroom. The entire room was still filled with steam, the scent of hot, damp soap, and a certain after-impression of Imra that Luca breathed in and let curl in the pit of his stomach until his thighs drew taut and he felt strange, his mouth too soft, his throat too tight. Standing naked beneath the spray, surrounded by clouds of billowing steam and taking that scent into himself, felt somehow sacrilegious. Luca closed his eyes, tilted his head back into the spray, and let the falling droplets strike his lips. Trickles slipped past to tease over his tongue, metallic tasting and hot and he shivered, drawing the soap and flannel down his body, and told himself this trembling, yearning feeling that pricked all throughout his body wasn't wrong. He stayed until the water ran cold, then dashed out, quivering and chilled, and scrubbed himself off with one of Imra's thick, fluffy cobalt blue towels. He dressed quickly, wrapping himself in the soft, clinging cardigan. Its sleeves fell well past his wrists to nearly cover his hands, while its wide fold-over neck fell over his shoulders and bared his collarbones. He wondered if he should bring a thicker jacket, or just dress warmer. But as he stared at his reflection, his hair a wild, damp mess of black, the cardigan wrapped in tight folds around his waist and hips, his jeans nearly painted on, his cheeks as red-flushed as his lips, his heart tightened oddly. He looked pretty. 
He could see his mother in himself, in the pointed tip of his nose and the taper of his chin and the translucence of his skin. And even if he was just fucking torturing himself right now, he wanted to look pretty, wanted to feel like someone could want him, even if it wasn't that big fucking lunk of an oblivious, clueless, blockheaded man. He rubbed at the tightness in his throat, then shoved his feet into his boots, bunching the hems of his jeans to fit into the boots' high ankles, before heading downstairs. The kitchen lights were dimmed down to just a few golden lamps, the house silent. Imra was gone, as were the dogs. Another note waited, pinned underneath the jar of apples, this time written on a translucent scrap of wax paper. Follow the light. Just that. Luca frowned, turning the bit of paper over, then tucked it into his pocket and stepped outside. The night was clear and cool, the breeze just chilly enough to be pleasant against the warmth in his cheeks, the sense of night settling in, green and dark and soft. He understood what Imra meant by follow the light as Luca looked up at the tallest hill overlooking the house. Atop that hill a beacon of golden firelight shone, flickering and leaping hot, throwing shimmering sprays of orange firefly sparks up into the sky to dance with the stars amidst a spiral of smoke. Subtle plucking notes of music wove across the night, the gentle thrum of vibrating guitar strings. That melody lured, melancholy and sweet and beckoning whispering for him to follow the tugging pull in his heart and let himself be drawn along. Lucas scrubbed his palms against his thighs, then took a deep breath and strode to climb the hill. With every step up the slope, the tantalizing sense of roasting meat grew stronger, joining with the smoky scent of burning wood. That soft strumming music was joined by a familiar voice, deep baritone humming low, weaving in and out of the delicately plucked notes, creating a mesmerizing blend that drew Luca closer, closer, until he crested the hill. A massive bonfire blazed at the rounded peak, set in a shallow pit in the center of a wide circle of earth that had been stripped and cleared of all grass. Skewers dug into the dirt at the very edge of the blaze and leaned in just enough to sear and crackle the cubes of meat, mushrooms, and other vegetables speared on their tips. Several large blankets had been layered atop each other to one side of the bonfire, the firelight flickering over patterns of radial zigzag flowers and mandalas in deep maroons and blues. Vila and Shetty sprawled on one side of the blankets, dozing at Imra's side. Just outside the circle of the fire's light, the blue roan gelding cropped idly at the grass, dark against deeper darkness, just another part of the night. Imra sat on the blanket with his legs folded, his guitar cradled in his lap, the position drawing his battered, tattered jeans taut against tight-flexed thighs. His hair fell over his shoulders in damp waves and left dark spots on a clinging blue-gray henley as he bowed over the instrument and stroked its strings with such delicacy in those large fingers, coaxing haunting notes from an aching sweetness, blending them with the low melt of his voice in harmony, words Luca couldn't understand. Fixed in moss, quiet sorrow. In the stark shadows, the Indian heritage of the rock shone in deeply burnished skin and softly beautiful lips, and the sharp crest of Imra's nose, in the proud peaks of his cheekbones, and the thickness of long, curling lashes, blacker than the night could ever wish to be. Luca's breath singed, and he stopped just at the crest of the hill. He couldn't seem to move. Darkened blue eyes flicked over the curve, unbeatable, menacing, 
gentle, sensitive touch stroked along the neck of the guitar, toying with the frets, raising soft quivers of sound. But I was thinking of Palotaha and Prekuids, the day after tomorrow and the day before yesterday. Blue eyes once more lifted to Luca, meeting his gaze, stealing his breath. And how so much changes in the spaces in between. Luca's heart skipped, a faltering note in the melody of the night. Yeah? I. Something seemed to hover unspoken between those words, but then Imra looked away, fixing his gaze on the fire. One hand fell from the guitar to stroke softly between Shetty's ears, raising a low whine. Would you like to hear a real song, Angyoka, rather than me making things up? Yes, Luca answered too quickly, then flushed, pulling himself back just as he'd started to lean forward. I mean, I would. Yes, I'd like that. Imra chuckled and transferred his grip back to the guitar and strummed a few poignant preliminary notes. This one is called Zulda Zerdu, Zulda Hegiish. Would you like to hear it in Hungarian or Romani? Romani. Even if Imra's voice was lovely, entrancing no matter what language he spoke, there was something about the depth and timbre of it when he spoke Romani that cut deep into Luca's heart, and he'd missed it. He remembered, when he was a little boy, that Imra had spoken Romani often, whispering to his animals, murmuring to himself, even exchanging a few words with Luca and his parents when they could understand what they'd picked up from him. But he'd hardly spoken more than a few phrases here and there since Luca had arrived. What had changed? Ah, was all Imra said before trailing off. His fingers stilled on the strings, and he gazed into the fire silently for long moments. Yet before Luca could ask what was wrong, Imra's hand struck the belly of the guitar lightly, fingertips tapping out a rhythm setting time. He nodded his head in time, gaze focusing, and after a few more steady beats, those clever, swift fingers twined deftly in the strings, calling forth notes in sweet, aching tangles, at once lively and lonely, melodious and melancholy, a fast-moving river of morning pouring through swift twists and turns of song. And Imra's voice joined that song. Baritone whispers that wrapped themselves around Luca's heart and pulled so hard, he felt that rough beating organ must leap out of his chest, so desperately did it want something. As if it would live inside Imre, flow past his lips on those lyrical notes in fluid Romany to take up inside his chest, paired side by side with the heart that gave rise to song so lovely and so strange that it made beautiful, dark magic of the night. That spell held Luca so intensely, his breaths gathering in his chest and never letting loose, his blood following the tumbling spill of notes that painted a portrait of loss so deep it left him hollow. As if whatever Imra called out for was missing from inside Luca, and the only way to ease that emptiness was to share it, lessened somehow between them. And while Luca knew Imra didn't sing for him, never for him, still he felt the quiet loneliness in that lilting baritone voice with every heavy, painful beat of his heart. He was beginning to recognize at least the words of the refrain by the time those deft fingers slowed on the guitar strings, even if he couldn't understand the meaning. Imra's voice trailed off dying into a breathless silence as the last ringing note faded into the firelight. There was nothing but the silence, the sound of their breaths, and the wet glimmers lining Imra's eyes, clinging to his lashes in precious droplets. Luca caught a breath, pressing a hand to his chest, gripping tight to his shirt or he would reach out, reach out for Imra, and never let go. Imra? he whispered, and Imra came to life, the statue he'd become once more, moving, breathing, a man of flesh and blood instead of ancient and sorrowing stone. It's nothing, Imra whispered, voice thick. Distant eyes focused on Luca, 
tearing into him with the raw pain reflected in those depths, before Luca looked away, dragging the backs of his knuckles against his eyes and taking a deep breath that heaved his shoulders. My family settled in England many generations ago, but there is a long story of roving in our history. People make magic of the roaming ways of the Rome, but many times we left because we were chased away, driven out in our bare feet onto roads lined with nails. Imra curled his fingers against the guitar again, raising an echo of sound. That is what the song is about. Na de mila pero mende. Don't let suffer more the feeble. He pressed his lips together, head bowing, moonlit hair falling to shroud his face. Some things carry with them ancestral pain, Angyuka. No, no, Luca couldn't sit here with this distance between them and that roughness in Imra's voice and this pain scouring the inner walls of his heart. He shifted across the blanket, slipping over to settle next to Imra, hip to hip, knee to knee, and he leaned over, resting his shoulder against Imra's. He didn't know what to do, how to ease that ache. And so he only tried to be there, to tell Imra, to tell him, I'm sorry, he choked out thickly. It is not your fault, Imra said. But after a moment he leaned back, subtle, but there, that massive weight seeming to push Luca steady. We hold, and we stay. As we say among the Rom, we are many stars scattered in the sight of God. Luca didn't know what to say. And so they held, and they stayed together, as the fire burned and the sparks reached up for the stars. 31. Not until the roasting meat began to smell of char did they pull apart. Imra laid his guitar to one side and leaned forward to turn the skewers, while Luca rubbed at his arms and tried not to feel the chill in the wake of Imra's warmth. He still ached inside, but something about sitting in the quiet together had eased it, somewhat. He'd thought Imra would pull away from him, put distance between them. It almost hurt more that he hadn't. Imra finished with the skewers, then sat back, leaning on one brawny arm. With the other he tugged a covered basket closer. The food is almost ready. Would you like a drink? Luca hesitated, then nodded. Sure. Imra flipped the basket open. The interior was lined with ice, and inside sat a covered pitcher of frothy amber liquid. He retrieved two mason jar mugs from another basket, scooped a few cubes of ice into each, then carefully poured each full, stopping just short of the building frothy head foaming over. With an arched eyebrow, he offered a mug to Luca. Take it slow on an empty stomach. Luca tilted his head curiously, then curled both hands around the mug. Cold condensation chilled his palms. He took a careful sip. The loamy, bitter taste of beer flowed over his tongue, countered by a tart sweetness and popping into a lovely fizz. He blinked, then took another deeper sip, savoring it and letting it roll around in his mouth before swallowing. What kind of beer is this? Apple beer. Like cider. Imra chuckled and took a sip from his own mug, speckling his beard with foam in light little spatters along his upper lip. Not quite. It's just beer with apples. It's sweet, fizzy, I like it. Perhaps I am not such a terrible brewer as I thought. Nah. Luca couldn't resist. He reached over and wiped the foam from above Imra's upper lip the prickles of his beard scratching against Luca's thumb. Not that bad at all. Luca's thumb grazed Imra's upper lip, its delineation so stark that it cut like a crease of paper against his skin, heated pressure and an almost velvety texture that clenched him up in so many delicious knots. Imra stilled, his lips parting. Storms clouded his eyes, crackling with a dark-lit, intense charge as he watched Luca in silence. Luca froze. He couldn't breathe. Not when Imra's mouth was so hot under his touch, his breaths washing over Luca's skin, the silence between them sparking. 
If he dared, he could just... Oh, God. Imra pulled back sharply, tossing his head to clear his hair from his face, turning away before Luca could catch more than a glimpse of an unreadable expression. Hurt shattered that breathless moment into pieces and scattered them across the dirt until Imra spoke. Dinner's burning. He was already rolling forward onto his knees, beer wedged in the dirt and catching the skewers to pull them back out of the fire. Lucas stared at him dully. Right. Dinner. Imra had pulled away because dinner. And because Luca shouldn't be touching him that way. He swallowed back his disappointment, marshalled a smile, nestled his mug in the blankets, and shifted to his knees to dig in the basket. Plates and utensils were stacked inside, separated and cushioned by cloth napkins. Here, he said, setting the plates out on the blanket in easy reach. Imra reached for a fork, and Luca intercepted, putting it in his hand before sinking back on his heels to watch, as Imra quickly raked the sizzling meat and vegetables off the sticks, arranging them on the plates. When he was done, he tossed the skewers in the fire, then dropped back into his seat and nudged one of the plates toward Luca. Shouldn't be too burnt. Char just adds flavor. Give it a try. Luca reclaimed his place at Imra's side, but with the plates and their drinks between them like a boundary line reminding him not to cross. He bit his lip, then picked up a cube of brown-seared, dripping meat with his fingertips. The heat soaked into his skin, threatening to burn, before he popped it into his mouth and let that warmth melt over his tongue as he bit down into meat seared succulent enough to practically dissolve. Sweet, savory flavor burst in his mouth, rich and almost luscious, and he let out a low moan as he chewed and swallowed, closing his eyes and taking his time to absorb every bit before it went down. What is this? Venison steak tips marinated in sweetened Worcestershire sauce and berry ale. Luca started to lick the sauce and flecks of char from his fingertips, then froze. I'm eating Bambi? Imra let out a short, rough laugh and picked up a bite of his own. You're eating a buck the foxes brought down but couldn't finish off. He'd have starved to death slowly if I'd not put him down. Eyeing him, Lucas snorted and reached for another bite, picking up a glistening toasted mushroom cap. You don't like killing anything, do you? Not unless it's the most merciful solution. If not for grocery stores, I'd likely be a vegetarian. You're so odd, Imra. Imra tilted his head, watching Luca through the curtain of his hair. How so? You're this big, hulking, sulking brute— but you've got sensitive hands and sensitive eyes, and you're really this gentle giant who won't kill meat animals and nurses sick goats. With a dry look, Imra shifted to stretch out, lying back with his bulk propped on his elbows, long legs stretched out. His body twisted in a powerful pull of sinew as he reached over himself to snag another bite from his plate. I can't tell if that was a compliment or not. It was. Luca looked down at his hands, plucking at the mushroom. Just as quickly the rich scents and flavors had roused his appetite. It soured, curdling in his stomach. You make me feel safe, he swallowed. Not many things do that anymore. An odd stillness settled over Imra. Has someone been making you feel unsafe at home? Not unsafe that way, just... Luca shook his head. Not on steady footing. Luca? What's the matter? Fuck. Luca bit back a frustrated sound, closing his eyes. He hadn't wanted to put this on Imra, not when he was already enough of a burden. He'd be upset. Luca's parents were his friends, and he was dealing with Luca as a favor. The rest of this? It wasn't Imra's problem. And maybe it was the beer, but Luca suddenly wanted to cry just burst out crying, burrow against Imra, and beg him to be safe always when nothing else was. Everything else changed, fell apart, turned sour and awful, but Imra? Imra never changed. Imra was Imra, solid and faithful and immovable as the foundations of the earth. 
there. Luca choked, then breathed in and tried again. They're getting divorced, mum and dad. Imra's inhaled breath said everything, followed by a measured silence. Then, I'm sorry, he said. I didn't know. They've wanted to for a long time. The only reason they didn't is me. Luca opened his eyes, staring at the fire until it burned its image into his retinas and smiled bitterly. So that feels fucking great. I've been making my parents miserable way longer than I actually intended to. I don't think it's like that, Angyulka. Isn't it, though? He dropped the unappetizing bit of food back on his plate, then just let himself fall back, sprawling on the blanket, staring up at the sky. They were going to get divorced as soon as I turned eighteen. I'd known since, maybe, I don't know. I think I was eight or nine when I overheard them fighting, then talking things out like they were already negotiating with barristers at the table. We hadn't even moved to Sheffield yet, and they were planning ten years in the future, counting down every day until they were free of me and free of each other. And I... The stars overhead, a wheeling galaxy so bright it turned the sky purple and crimson, blurred into a mess of colors and lights. I got scared. I got so scared even more the closer I got to eighteen, and I guess I started doing daft stuff, and it made them scared too. Scared enough to stay together to try to solve the problem of Luca. He sniffled, dashed at his eyes. He was struggling not to break down in front of Imra when Imra was so strong, but he'd been holding this inside himself for so long, an ugly truth he'd never even told Zave. Refused to even look at head on, because that just made it even more real and even more terrifying. If they solve me, he said, if I do everything I'm supposed to do and live the way they want me to live, my family will fall apart. And I know I'm not supposed to care, because I'm an adult now and it's off to uni and then a life of my own, and their life isn't my life anymore. But he smiled but it was just this stretching grimace that made his lips tremble. I care. They're my mum and dad. My whole life they've been my mum and dad. But being my mum and dad has been making them miserable, and I'm selfish because I still don't want them to stop. I'm sorry, Luca. I... I never imagined. They kept up a very convincing act. There came the sound of plates hissing against the blankets then clanking, and then Imra's silhouette blocked the firelight, leaning over Luca, his warmth falling around him in a cloak, hotter than the radiant waves from the bonfire. Imra propped himself up with one arm reaching over Luca, hand braced to the blanket, caging him with Imra hovering over him. Silvered hair tumbled down in waves, brushing against Luca's cheek throat and shoulder like spider silk and starlight, little lifelines drawing him up and up into those warm, sorrowful blue eyes, the creases around them speaking a wealth of silent emotion. But you're no one's problem, Imra murmured. You don't need to be solved, Angyulka. Don't I? Swallowing thickly, he looked up into Imra's eyes. It was easier when we moved away. And you didn't see us any more. They don't hate each other or anything. I think they're even friends. They just want different things. And I guess they realized after me how incompatible they are. They live in the house, but have wholly separate lives, and still think I don't notice. That happens that way sometimes. It's regrettable, but some relationships just don't work. It's not that one person or the other was wrong— just that they were wrong for each other. Luca's lips trembled. His eyes welled again, no matter how he tried to stop them. But why did it have to be my parents? Because even parents make bad decisions sometimes. Imra's fingertips softly grazed just beneath one of Luca's eyes, brushing away tears, calluses so gentle despite their roughness. But I think they would agree... You were the best decision they ever made together, no matter their other mistakes. Don't do this. 
Luca thought, staring up at Imra with those large hands on his skin and the bulk of Imra taking up his world, blurred through the prisms of his tears, and yet so familiar Luca would know every aching shape of him in the darkest of nights. Don't be so gentle with me. Don't make me love you like this. Don't do this at all. Then they can't really yell at me for mine, he straggled out weakly. I... I guess growing up is making bad decisions and owning it instead of ducking it. Something like that. Imra smiled slightly, knuckles tracing tingling lines against Luca's skin as he brushed his hair back from his brow. But it will be all right, Luca. He couldn't stand it. That touch, that warmth, so close yet so far away, when everything Luca wanted to ease this awful pain eating away inside him, was completely out of reach. With a hitching breath, he twisted away, ducking out from underneath Imra and sitting up, reaching desperately for his beer and cradling it in both hands. He pressed his mouth against the rim of the mug, staring into the fire, holding his entire body tense to the point of pain, because if he didn't, he would tremble. Imra was slow motion in his peripheral vision, silently rolling back onto his back, then shifting to sit up. Those blue eyes touched him, questioning him with their heavy weight, but he wouldn't look. He took a gulp of his beer, the liquid sloshing against the glass and against his lips, and closed his eyes, swallowing it down and letting the slow, pleasant burn work down his throat and through his flesh until it eased the awfulness inside him into something he could live with. You know what really bothers me? he whispered. Hm? There's this silly part of me, this completely daft and childish part of me, that wants to believe in fairy tale love, in that kind of love that just consumes everything and becomes such a part of your life that you can't live without it. You make them better, and they make you better, and you lift each other up until you can do anything together. And even when you fight, you never stop loving each other, and you always find a way. He muffled a miserable sound against the rim of the mug and closed his eyes. As long as his eyes were closed, he wasn't crying, wasn't fucking streaming fat, wet tears down to plop and splash into his beer, wasn't breaking inside, struggling to speak. I I used to think marriage fixed everything and made you love each other forever, like those wedding rings were some kind of fucking magic talisman. But it's hard to believe in that, when the two people I need to love each other most are falling apart right in front of my eyes. Their love doesn't have to make you stop believing on Yulka, Imra rumbled. A light touch brushed Luca's shoulder, then firmed, curling, Stroking, soothing, and rhythmic. Nor does love have to be about marriage, or even about anything romantic. Lasting love of any kind needs neither a priest nor a ring to endure. Luca lifted his head, once more meeting Imra's eyes. God, for such a granite slab of a man, he had so much trouble masking his emotions, and he watched Luca with such concern that, for a moment, Luca could almost believe Imra could ever love him. No, Luca whispered, and Imra smiled gently. No. Somehow it didn't make him feel any better. He was such a fucking mess, and trying so hard not to fall apart all over Imra, trying to get his head on straight and stop being a nit when Imra had made dinner and built this bonfire and it was supposed to be a nice night. Luca braced himself with another sip of his beer, breathing in deeply, squaring his shoulders. I... I should tell them I know. Why? So they can stop this? Luca answered. The words were more bitter than the aftertaste of beer on his tongue. Maybe out there is a life that'll make them happy. I should stop making them hold on to this life. Go have my own life. Let them find theirs. They'll still be my parents. He sighed, shrugging. Just parents on different paths. I want them to be happy, so that's the right thing to do, isn't it? If it feels right to you, then it is. 
Imra's hand fell away, and he once more leaned back on his elbows, staring into the fire. Another part of growing up is letting go of those codependent familial bonds, but part of being family is never letting those bonds completely die. Imra trailed off with a thoughtful sound, then continued. As we grow, relationships change. We become more of one thing, less of another to the people we love, and they become more of one thing, less of another to us. With parents, with siblings, it's easy to think of them as extensions of yourself. But then, suddenly you grow up, and you're at odds with them, and they're at odds with you, and you have to see each other as separate people for the first time. He chuckled softly. It feels like cutting a piece of yourself out, a chunk of your body and soul, and looking at this alien organ, trying to imagine it had once been inside you. He shifted his leg enough to bump his thigh against Luca's in a little nudge. That's terrifying on Luca. It's all right to be afraid of that. It's part of what's most frightening about adulthood. I feel like if I were really an adult, I'd already have moved out on my own. I wouldn't be so dependent on them that I have no choice but to let them push me back and forth between them. It's possible to be an adult in some things from a very young age and never grow up about others for the rest of your life. Everyone takes a different path. But I can't make my path forge in down the middle between them, can I? He bit his lip. If they're two halves of a beaten heart, I'm the thread that stitched them together. There's something poetic in that, but... He shook his head shifting to lean on one hand. Threads, just thread. It's not a thing on its own. It's just a tool to make other things. Then it came, warmth covering his hand, the roughness of a calloused palm over his knuckles. He lifted his head sharply, chest tight. Imra still looked into the fire, that beautiful face serene and thoughtful, but his hand rested over Luca's, linking them in a moment of quiet comfort. There is that as well, Imra murmured. Luca flushed, averting his eyes, or he would fall apart. He lifted the hand holding his beer so he could scrub his sleeve against his eyes, then laughed shakily. This is some really, really strong beer. It rather is. Imra chuckled but didn't move that hand. That hand that held Luca to earth, that seemed to whisper an unspoken reminder that, even if it wasn't the kind of love he craved, he was still, still loved, and that love mattered too. I'm still working out a few kinks in the brewing process. I like it. Should bottle it and call it two sips. Two sips? Because that's how much it takes to get you drunk. Imra laughed one of those rare, rough, roaring laughs, brief yet so wholehearted that he threw his head back with it in a shower of steel and silver and iron hair, white teeth flashing. Then he retrieved his own mug, lifting it and extending it to Luca. To two sips apple beer. Luca clinked his mug to Imra's, beer sloshing. To two sips, he said, and tossed back the rest of his drink. To was he thought as he swallowed the fizzy, sweet, sour brew. To wishes and wantings that can never come true. But never in a lifetime would he dare to say that aloud. 32. Imra almost hadn't recognized Luca when he'd come up the hill to the bonfire. Even though he was always a pretty thing, there was something different about him tonight. He wore a black cardigan that wrapped in elegant layers around his slim frame, his bare shoulders peeking impudently past the cardigan's wide collar, white caps frothing a dark sea. With his hair still damp and messy, his eyes wide and uncertain, the bonfire's blazing light falling over him in a sheet of gold, he looked so delicate the wind might well blow him away, send him flying like a dandelion clock dancing on the wind. For a moment, Imra had wondered how it might feel to dance with Luca, spinning him about until he laughed. Then he'd bowed over his guitar and told himself as long as he kept his hands on the instrument, he'd keep them off the boy. Yet it was hard. 
so fucking hard, when Luca was so fucking hurt, and when Imra didn't know the words, sometimes the only way he knew how to comfort was with touch, with closeness. Everything made sense now. The abrupt move to Sheffield, the shroud of hurt Luca wore around him, dulling that brightness, the strangeness of Marco just banishing him to the fields. Imra still didn't know what to do with the information. In uni, Marco and Lucia had been inseparable. He'd never seen two people more in love, and in those younger days, he'd secretly been envious of them. He'd never had anyone look at him the way Marco and Lucia looked at each other, as if the world had fallen away, and there was nothing left but galaxies swirling around them as they lost themselves in each other. He'd thought their relationship was fine, that everything was all right. Maybe he'd been as much of a naive idealist as Luca. He lingered over that as they ate in companionable silence, wondering. He'd long accepted he would likely spend his life alone, but he'd at least had the comfort of knowing his friends had something, someone. Yet when all they had to bind each other was Luca, and the weight of that was wearing Luca thin and tearing him to pieces, Imra didn't know what to do with that, how to fix it when he couldn't. And so he only let Luca have a silence he seemed to need, and kept that soft, slim hand clasped under his own, a reminder that if Luca needed to talk more, Imra would listen. But even when their plates were clean, Luca remained silent. Imra watched him sidelong. The boy looked so lost, pensive, as though he'd come apart at the seams and some vital part of him, some weight of him, had slipped out and away and left him empty and searching for it. Imra bit the inside of his cheek, but told himself to hold his tongue, wait him out. Nothing would come of pushing Luca before he was ready, no matter how desperately Imra wanted to ease that look on his face. And so he watched the fire, shifting only to accommodate Vila when she laid her head across his lap. There was a peace in this that he hadn't felt for some time, and he settled into the silence, no longer counting the minutes until a sensible farm owner would be in bed, and not riding high on the sweet drifting buzz of apple beer, watching a bonfire crackle with the most beautiful boy he'd ever seen resting at his side. Imra? Luca murmured. Imra pulled from his reverie, glancing at him. Luca was still watching the fire, his eyes half-lidded, their green slightly glassy. He toyed and plucked at his lower lip, plumping it to fullness. Hmm? Why didn't you ever... Ever... You know, meet someone, settle down? Luca shrugged one shoulder. You can't be the only gay British Hungarian Romany goat farmer in the world. There's someone like you out there, isn't there? Someone right for you? Imra arched a brow. His heart labored roughly, pulsing into a sharp pang. You assume I'd only be attracted to someone just like me? No, I. Luca bowed his head, cheeks flushing. I don't know. I don't know what I'm asking. Hmm. To answer what you did ask. Imra exhaled heavily, lowering his gaze, watching Vila and tangling his fingers into her ruff. She let out a soft, pleased whine and leaned into him. It's not so easy for me. I can't separate sex from love. It's not how I'm wired. He paused, struggling for the words to explain. I've heard it called demisexual lately, but I suppose before we had those definitions, some would just call it being an old romantic. I only know it means that I can't be with someone, can't touch them or anything more, unless I at least believe I could truly love them. And yet here he was with his hand curled over Luca's, and the memory of that long, lithe body pressed against him, until even now his body remembered the print of Luca's flesh and lean frame. No. He took a deep breath, continuing. Most of the men I meet base initial attraction on physical interest, and want physical chemistry before emotional intimacy. My particular ways often don't suit them very well, nor do their needs suit me. 
It's a certain incompatibility of being, I suppose. Sometimes I envy them the freedom to simply follow their desires. That sounds lonely, Lucas said softly. It has the potential to be. More than potential, if he were honest with himself. If he really wanted to look, there were ways to find other men like him. Websites, apps, simply dating about. But he'd never wanted that. He didn't know what he wanted, but something was settling inside him, a quiet ache that said he'd find it if he just looked at it head on. But I have many other loves in my life. I am alone, but not lonely. Luca's warmth shifted closer. You're not alone right now, either. Imra lifted his head and found wide eyes watching him, watching him as though there was no world but Imra. "'watching him as though there was nothing between them "'but the stars above and the slow, sweet air of their breaths. "'Imra thought he'd known loneliness before, "'but that pain struck hard, struck deep, "'as he stared into eyes the clear green of a translucent spring brook "'and lingered on parted berry lips "'that seemed to offer everything he could never have. "'He could hardly breathe, "'each inhalation a rough thing inside his chest.' He tore his gaze away, fixing on the fire, the heat, the night, anything but Luca. It's good to have company on the farm again, he forced out, trying to keep his voice level. Luca's hand curled beneath his, slowly forming a fist, then slipped away, leaving only cloth warmed by their joined body heat and nothing else. Yeah, Luca said listlessly into a silence Imra was afraid to fill. I guess it would be. 33. He didn't have to worry about the silence for long. Luca had drained his second mug of beer in minutes, almost desperately. Imra had pondered stopping him, but right now the last thing Luca seemed to need was someone questioning his decisions, his autonomy. So he only let Luca do as he wished, then gently pried the empty mug from his lax fingers as Luca's eyelids began to droop, his body slouching forward. When he fell onto his back, one arm stretched over his head and his slender fingers curled, Imra caught himself lingering on the sleek flow of his body, the perfect carelessness of his sprawl, the way his hair spilled over his fingers like ink splashed over white paper. Then Imra looked away, and made himself think of anything but how Luca had looked during those few moments he'd stretched beneath Imra, and looked up at him with those pale eyes so vulnerable, so sweet. When he glanced back, Luca was asleep. And while Luca slept, Imra let himself look, let himself linger on the pale, delicate lines of his face, on the way his lips parted on slow, sighing breaths, on the graceful taper of his body and the narrow lines of his hips and the subtle parting of his bent thighs. He was in so many ways a stranger to Imra now, the boy he had been. That child who'd followed Imra everywhere wasn't in this young man who moved as though his body were made of music and laughter, who carried his hurts inside as if they were jewels to be hoarded, small and shining things that belonged to him and only him. Only now was Imra beginning to understand just how much Luca had closed off, walled away inside himself, now that he understood what had happened at home. No matter that Marco and Lucia had sent him off like a recalcitrant child, Luca was more a man than Imra thought anyone realized, and had been carrying a responsibility no one should have to bear for far too long, struggling to support it with those slim shoulders while no one held him up at all. And yet, when he looked at Imra, it was as though something was struggling to break past, something that begged for someone, anyone, to just... Let him be small, for a few moments. Let him stop pretending that he could handle everything, when those tears that even now left his lashes dried into curling, pretty spikes had said he very much couldn't. That urge, that ache, that need to protect him, to shelter him, rose strong in Imra once more, so overpowering he almost couldn't breathe with it. He caught himself reaching for Luca, his body moving of its own volition, 
and stopped, with his fingers hovering just above those parted lips. It would be so easy to touch them, to feel their softness and their warmth, in this one stolen moment where there was no one to see, to judge. God, no, no, if he did he wouldn't be able to live with himself. Luca was asleep, defenseless. It wouldn't be right. As if it could ever be right were he awake either. Imra pulled back, clenching his fist and pressing it to his chest, over his pounding heart. He would keep Luca safe, he told himself. If he stood alone at home, if no one would hold him up, Imra would for as long as he was here. There was no rite of adulthood, no ceremonial passage that said in order to be a man, Luca had to face everything alone, alone and unloved. Do you love him then, Imra? Of course he did. He had always loved the Ward family, had always, always. Are you lying to yourself, Imra? That soft voice taunting him was Luca's, with that throaty burr that turned every word into a husky beguilement. And when he thought of slim arms around his neck, of a soft voice in his ear whispering, I'll always love you, Imra, it wasn't the boy in that memory. It was the man who lay before him now, resting peacefully and oblivious to the tempest raging through Imra's heart. He made himself pull back. Distance. He needed distance. Needed to busy himself. He kicked dirt over the bonfire and stood, breathing roughly, watching it smolder out before beginning to pack everything up. By the time he'd packed both baskets, separating dishes and leftovers into one, trash into the other, and secured them to Andrash's saddle, Vila and Shetty had wriggled over to flank Luca, snuggling against him for warmth in the chill that had descended with the fire doused. Imra shooed them to their feet, then knelt and gently shook Luca's shoulder. Luca. Dark lashes fluttered, then closed again. Hmm? Imra smiled faintly. This was turning into a pattern. You can't sleep here. Think you can make it back without falling out of the saddle? Hmm. Luca. Hmm. With a sigh, Imra watched the stubbornly sleeping boy for a few moments longer, then slipped his arms underneath him and lifted him up, slight and slim and gangly against Imra's chest. Come on. I've got you. Luca remained limp, as Imra carried him to Andrash and lifted him carefully astride. He managed to prop him draped over the gelding's neck, and hurried to fold up the blankets and stack them behind the saddle, glancing over his shoulder every few moments to make sure Luca hadn't fallen off. Once he was done, he swung up behind Luca, catching him between his arms and pulling him back to keep him safely cradled against Imra's chest, caught between his flanking thighs. And even if he shouldn't, as he nudged Andrash forward and set the roan on a gentle trot toward home, Imra leaned in and nuzzled into Luca's soft, dark thatch of black hair, breathing in his honeysuckle scent and letting himself feel the warmth of him wrapped up safe in Imra's arms where he belonged. But he doesn't, he told himself. He can't. Marco would kill you both. Even that one moment, that breath, felt like a betrayal of his friend's trust, a violation of his own honor. Sitting straighter in the saddle, Imra made himself focus on keeping the trail in the dark and guiding Andrash home. Even if, once Luca left again in January, it wouldn't feel like home again for a very long time. 34. The last thing Luca remembered was the taste of apple beer and the sky wheeling overhead into a streaking mosaic, the sense of wood smoke and Imra, and how soft the blankets were underneath him. Then nothing. But he came to with his head fuzzy, his vision blurred, and the world rocking back and forth. It took him a moment to realize only two of those were because he was tipsy. He was wrapped in the most glorious warmth, as if he'd pressed up against the radiator in the coldest winter, all steel and comforting heat soaking into his bones.
Only that steel had flex and flow, the stretch of taut skin over hard-corded muscle, rocking and rolling against him gracefully. He was in Imra's arms. He tilted his head back, looking up at Imra from below. His vision tried to clear, focus, but there were still too, too many of Imra, shadow creatures wavering atop the more solid Imra, who looked out over Luca's head, gaze distant, brows a tight line. That movement was the horse, he realized. He was on the horse with Imra, and Imra's powerful thighs were wrapped around him. Hips pressed to his hips, undulating forward with each of the roan's slow strides. It roused the most delicious slow feeling in his blood, and he leaned back harder into Imra, letting himself sink into it. Imra blinked as Luca moved, then looked down. You're awake. Tiny bit. Luca's mouth felt thick and soft, his tongue not quite obeying, but he managed to smile and tack on a small. Hi. Hello. Imra's silky voice flowed against Luca's ear, breaths curling against his neck, and he sighed with pleasure. Sorry, he mumbled, and let his head roll against Imra's shoulder. I guess I can't hold my beer. It was rather strong beer, Imra chuckled, and, ah, oh God, the sound was a roll of thunder and the tremor of a stampede shivering into Luca's back. And you did work hard today. I'm not surprised you're tired. You're not tired. I'm just more used to not showing it on Yuka. And I'm accustomed to this. This is my life. It's not yours. Imra's arms tightened against his sides. You're doing a good job. I'm proud of you. Luca's stomach tightened, and he clutched his fingers against the saddle. A hot flush ran through him from head to toe. You are? Of course, Imra answered simply. Why wouldn't I be? No reason. Luca shook his head and immediately found that to be a mistake when everything swam dizzily. He winced, closing his eyes and laying his head to Imra's shoulder again. Thank you. There's no need to thank me. You're the one doing the work. It's nice to have help around here again. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe I could come back. Luca wanted to say. In the summers, on breaks, come back to help, to be with you. But his tired lips didn't want to say the words. His tired heart didn't want to risk another crack. And so he only said, nothing, and let himself drift again, falling into a half-doze and fighting himself with every step of the horse's lolling gait, not to tell him rather that he felt so very, very, Good. 35. He didn't wake again until they were in the barn, and the change in the roan's stride shifted him to awareness just as Imra swung down. Thick hands encircled Luca's waist, holding him in the saddle. He lifted his head, blinking muzzily down at Imra. If I lift you down, Imra rumbled, do you think you can make it into the house on your own? Not drunk, Luca slurred. Just sleepy. Either way, you're drifting. I can make it. All right. Imra swung him down then, swirling him as though lifting him in a twirling dance, while Luca gasped and clutched hard at his arms. When his feet touched ground, he swayed forward, falling into Imra's chest, stumbling into the solid rock of him. He winced, hunching into his shoulders, and peeled his face from Imra's chest long enough to peek up at him. Sorry. Now you see why I was worried. With a chuckle, Imra set him to rights, easing him upright gently and then letting go. Go up and get changed for bed. I'll be in in a few to make sure you didn't pass out in the middle of the foyer. Not drunk. Inside on your car. Luca stuck his tongue out at Imra, then turned and marched toward the house, and promptly tripped over the toes of his own boots. It was only a little stumble, rocking forward and then catching himself again, but he scowled and glared over his shoulder, pointing at Imra. Not drunk. Imra held both hands up. 
I didn't say a word. And he remained silent as Lucas stalked through the barn and toward the house, until soft words drifted after. I hear hydrating helps with the hangover. Lucas snapped a middle finger in the air, then stomped into the house with the dogs milling around his ankles. He really wasn't drunk, just a little bit tilted, and he made it up the stairs without killing himself, then into his room. Kicking his boots off was the easy part. Wiggling out of his jeans was harder, and he sprawled on the bed, wrestling and wriggling when his hands didn't quite want to obey his commands, and his fingers were a little numb and floaty. He'd just flung his jeans across the room, swearing, and stumbled into clean boxes by the time he heard the door open downstairs, and then the creak of the fifth step. He glanced up from rummaging for a T-shirt as Imra passed his open door, just a glimpse of bronzed flesh moving in and out of his vision as Imra stripped out of his shirt on his way to his room. But that glimpse nagged at Luca. Had that been... He bit his lip, then peeked out after Imra. But he was already gone, vanishing into his bedroom. Luca crept down the hall and peered around the door, watching as Imra tossed his shirt onto his bed. His shoulders, chest, and back were dark with broad, spreading bruises, more on the right side than the left. Underneath his tawny skin the marks had turned the dark, livid, painful-looking purple of a second-day bruise. Luca curled his hand against the doorframe, worrying at his lip. When did that happen? Imra started, shoulders jerking slightly, then glanced over his shoulder. Both brows rose before he looked down at himself. Yesterday? He shrugged. I fell out of a tree in the orchard. Luca frowned. Oh, when I... He winced. He'd been so excited he'd not even been thinking. I'm sorry. I was careless. Don't worry about it. Does it hurt very much? No more than I'm used to. Imra turned to face him, raking a hand back through his hair. Being a farmer is rather like letting nature use you as a punching bag, then coming back for more. Still, it looks painful. Luca twined his fingers together, scuffing his socks against the floor. Do you have any salve or anything? There's the ointment from the bath. Imra answered. Works just as well directly applied to skin. Could I, I mean, do you want me to? Imra fixed him with a long, measuring look. Some odd shadow passed over his face before he exhaled. Will it make you feel better? Luca nodded quickly. Yes? Then yes. Okay. Luca tumbled back and tried not to think too hard about what he was doing, what he'd asked for, what he wanted. Okay, be right back, he said, then fled with his heart thumping erratically in his ears. 36. Imra was beginning to think he might be a masochist. He should have told Luca no and sent him to bed. Instead, he'd laid the fire in the bedroom hearth, and now was sat here on the edge of his bed, waiting for those soft, pattering footsteps to return. He wasn't accustomed to letting anyone touch him, or anyone wanting to care for him, to look after the various bruises and injuries he accumulated daily when managing a farm by himself, and he wasn't sure what to do with the twisting in his chest as Luca ducked back into the room still in that pretty cardigan that wrapped so close to his body and left those lovely shoulders bared, the tin of lavender salve clutched in one hand. Luca fidgeted in the doorway for a moment, then drifted closer, unscrewing the tin. The faint scents of lavender, eucalyptus, and clover permeated the air, and Luca bit that plush, soft lower lip, drawing it into his mouth and playing at it as he sank down to sit next to Imra with a good foot of space between them. Is this okay? he asked shyly. No, Imra thought. No, because Luca was looking at him with such trusting innocence, and all Imra could focus on was that pink glistening lower lip and the fact that Luca was in his bed 
both half-dressed, and God every moment of disinterest he'd felt when other men had tried to entice him with pretty lips and sly glances and roving hands was coming back to bite him when he could hardly breathe for the scent of lucre on the air, overwhelming even under the ointment. But that was Imra's problem. It shouldn't have to be Luca's. He could keep his wayward thoughts under control, and so he took in a deep, slow breath, then smiled. Of course. Luca answered that smile with a hesitant one of his own, washes of pink spreading over his cheeks, then shifted to climb further on to the bed, moving on to his knees behind Imra. Try to hold still, okay? All right. Imra closed his eyes, braced himself, and told himself he could handle this. It would make Luca feel better, ease that hangdog look of guilt in his eyes, so he would stop blaming himself for minor injuries Imra was accustomed to. But the moment those heated, salve-slicked hands pressed against his back, he had to bite back a groan, tension rolling through him as soft skin slid against his flesh. Luca froze. Did that hurt? No. Nimra swallowed, shaking his head. No, it's all right. But it wasn't all right. It was far from all right as that hesitant touch swept over his back, then firmed, stroking the slick ointment into his skin. He hardly felt the dull pain of pressure against his bruises. He only felt the faint warming burn of the ointment as it absorbed his body heat and gave it back to him, and the delicate touch of slender fingers that grew more confident by the moment. Each brush of those fingertips shot through him and tightened in his thighs. He clenched his hands against his jeans, struggling to breathe slowly and evenly as he let his head roll forward. Every touch both melted him and coiled his tension tighter sinking into his flesh in trails that lingered with a pleasant, deep simmer. Was Luca slowing down? Those soft fingers slipped lightly between Imra's shoulder blades, then spread against his skin, a five-pointed star branding into his flesh. Is that better? Luca whispered, husky and quiet. He swayed closer, body heat almost touching Imra's back. Imra held himself perfectly still, his mouth dry. Hmm, does these things a bit, I? I, Luca's voice trembled, and then that splayed hand slipped upwards, stroking, lingering, building a dark and dangerous fire in Imra's gut as long slender fingers teased under his hair and curled against the back of his neck. Does it feel good, Imra? Imra lifted his head sharply. He could have sworn aloud, but his mouth wouldn't move. Frozen, his entire body captured as Luca slid his arms around his neck, leaning into him from behind and pressing the entirety of that lithe body against him, molded close and making his flesh tingle and prickle everywhere Luca touched. Imra took a shaky breath and curled his hand against the boy's forearm. This... He wasn't. He couldn't be understanding this. He had to be misreading. Imra, Luca whispered, then slid around his body, slinking against him, all sweet angles and slender grace, until Imra's lap was full of smooth limbs, pale thighs spread to either side of his hips and straddling him, lissom frame pressed against him chest to chest, stomach to stomach, hip to hip. Imra. Fuck. Fuck. Imra couldn't breathe. Somehow his hands had found their way to Luca's hips, and as he lifted his head to look up at Luca, their noses touched. Those sweet, berry lips were so close, parted, Luca's breath shallow and loud, soft fingers tangled in Imra's hair. Imra shuddered with a low groan. No, he told himself, until Luca kissed him. That lush, overripe mouth pressed sweetly to his, slack with a needy, delicious wanting that drew Imra in, overwhelmed him, drowned him in the taste of honey and apples and fever-flushed warmth on Luca's lips. God, he'd never imagined that plump, taunting mouth would be so soft, yielding so utterly to his, pressure only making those pretty lips mesh and meld with his all the more. 
and then the hot barb of Luca's tongue stung him with a darting lick, only to return for another taste, slipping shyly deeper and fuck, fuck. Imra melted as weakness rolled through him, a warmth that burned in his spread thighs and tightened in his stomach and tingled in his palms. He couldn't stop himself. He stole a sip of the ambrosia that had tempted him for days, drinking of those lips as though they were wine, intoxicating and intoxicated. And even as Luca moaned and swayed into him, Imra swore, breaking back, pulling free of those hypnotic lips. Luca, he rasped. Luca, don't. Why? Luca's lips... Those perfect lips, now wet and swollen, and Imra couldn't look or he would break, trembled. You don't like me? Imra! Luca rested his brow to Imra's, fingers stroking through his hair in luxuriant, coaxing touches that felt far too good, shivering down to Imra's toes. I missed you. I missed you so, so much. You're not thinking straight. Imra gently grasped Luca's wrists, stilling his touch. You're drunk, Luca. I won't take advantage of you. It's not taking advantage. I know what I'm doing. I know what I want, Imra. I do. This is not the time to decide that, Imra said firmly. What would your father say? Fuck my father! Luca exploded, eyes welling with a burst of tears. He jerked at his wrists with a sobbing breath. Fuck him! He's an asshole, and I shouldn't have to ask for his permission. He wants me to be an adult, so he doesn't get a say. Imra sighed, carefully tightening his grip on Luca's wrists, then relaxing. He would still be upset, and disappointed in us both. Luca pouted. My dad knows you're gay. He knows I'm gay. He still sent me here. Exactly. Imra let his hands fall away, and forced himself not to settle them on Luca's hips again, instead bracing them on the bed to either side of his own body. Because he knows that just because I'm gay doesn't mean I'm some predator, and he can trust me with his son. But can he trust his son with you? A subtle rock brought Luca's hips against Imra's own, and Imra hissed through his teeth as pressure and friction tore through him, rousing things he'd thought he'd buried leaving him trembling as he dug his fingers into the duvet. Those pretty bare shoulders enticed him, begging to be kissed, licked, nibbled, bitten all the way up to the rapid flicker of Luca's pulse against his long, slim throat. Luca, he rasped, tensing his entire body to keep himself still, to keep from rocking up to meet those slender hips, that hard pressure. Y you, you shouldn't. You shouldn't, Luca whispered, and teased his lips in an open-mouthed brush against Imra's, sparking through him fiercely. I should. Imra caught that beautiful face in his palms, burying his fingers in wild black hair, stilling Luca. It was all he had the willpower to do, when he couldn't bring himself to pull away from those lips hovering so close, straining toward his. And yet for all that Luca was pushing... Almost begging, he was also shaking, his fingers curled against Imra's shoulders, digging in sharply. Imra swallowed thickly. You're terrified right now, he rasped. Do you even know what you're doing? I know enough. That's not what I'm afraid of. Imra, please. What are you afraid of, then? You not wanting me. Imra looked up into those wide, wet eyes, shimmering behind the haze of tears, and cursed himself once more. Onyoka. He brushed his thumb against the first trickling spill, shaking his head. It's not a matter of desire, it's a matter of what's appropriate. Luca stiffened. You still see me as a little boy, like family. No. God. This would be easier if he could. You are a young man. A beautiful, entirely maddening young man. Not a child. And I do not see you in a familial light. So it's just that I'm too young. Or I am too old. You're not that old. Old enough to hurt you, Luca. Sighing, Imra leaned into Luca. 
I can't bear the thought. But Luca jerked back, pulling his head from between Imra's palms, glaring at him. I'm not fragile, he hissed. When Imra only looked at him helplessly, those budding tears burst over in fast-racing wet streaks, pouring down Luca's cheeks like a sudden thunder shower against window glass. I'm not. You just, you just, why don't you just, just say? He tumbled out of Imra's lap. Imra reached for him, but Luca twisted away, stepping back, stabbing Imra with a look of bitter recrimination. Just leave me alone, Luca bit off. Then, with a harsh hitching sound rising past his lips, he turned and fled the room. The door slammed closed in his wake, leaving Imra alone. Alone with the sense of lavender and honeysuckle, the taste of Luca's kiss burned into his lips, and guilt a terrible and heavy thing, doubling the weight of his soul. 37. Six steps. Only six steps to his bedroom, yet by the time he crossed those six steps, Luca was blind, with tears, with frustration, with mortification, with harsh and ugly realization. He flung himself into the bed and curled around a pillow, burying his face into it to muffle his sobs, as if, as long as they didn't carry down the hall, he could pretend Imra wasn't there to hear them, pretend Imra wasn't there at all, and hadn't proven to him what Luca had always known, deep down, even if he hadn't been able to admit it. Imra was only attracted to men he could love, men he could see himself falling in love with, the kind of love that for Luca was just a childish dream. And Luca had thrown himself at him like a desperate, drunken prat, and Imra had rejected him, pushed him aside like the pathetic little shite he was. Imra didn't want him would never want him, because Luca would never be someone Imra could love. 38. Imra didn't sleep that night. Everything in him wanted to follow Luca, dry his tears, pull him close and soothe him until the aching, bitter sobs that Imra could hear, even from down the hall, quieted. But he couldn't. He couldn't. He had to do what was right. And what was right was sending a quite drunk young man to bed on his own, even if it meant shattering his heart. What if he hadn't been drunk, Imra? What if he'd been sober, tumbled soft and pale into your lap and begging for you? He couldn't answer that. Every path his thoughts turned down only ran up against that confusing roadblock of can't, shouldn't, won't. He wasn't accustomed to this kind of confusion— he liked to render problems down to simple decisions, but there was nothing simple about this. Not when he'd told Luca exactly how Imra worked, how he was wired, and yet Luca pushed all his buttons and made him question everything he knew about himself, about what he felt for the boy, about what he wanted, when his body still tingled with the touch of those soft, warm hands. Groaning, he dragged his fingers into his hair, burying his palms against his eyes, and listened to those hitching, sniffling sobs until they quieted, and told him the agony of this ache was exactly the punishment he deserved. Luca was too young. He was Marco's son. He was... he was... He was so fucking tangled up inside Imra, and Imra swore under his breath as he touched his fingers to his lips and tasted Luca on the tip of his tongue. 39. Luca cried until his throat was raw and his eyes were tired and he couldn't keep them open any longer. He never felt like he fully fell asleep. Every time he started to sink deep, the horrible thing clutching in the center of his chest dug its claws in and punctured another hole in his heart. And he woke completely close to dawn, his head throbbing, his vision bisected in white slashes, but the hangover headache didn't hurt nearly as much as the memory of Imra pushing him away and looking at him with something too close to pity for Luca's liking. With a muffled whimper, he buried his face in the pillow. He didn't know how he was supposed to go down there and look at Imra over breakfast, talk to him, work alongside him as though nothing had happened. If Imra hadn't already called his father and told him it was time to take his wayward son back, 
Luca had been a prat, a drunken, immature prat, throwing himself at a man who didn't want him. It was better to be mostly certain of rejection than to know for fucking sure. He lay there for over an hour. If he moved, he'd throw up, or just throw all his things into his bag and bolt before Imra woke, make the four-mile walk into town on his own, and take the nearest train to anywhere he could afford with what little was in his bank account. Maybe he could just disappear, become someone else, someone who could forget he'd ever been such a little nit and start over completely new. God, he was full of the most bullshite fantasies. Groaning, he rolled over and swiped a hand over his laptop keyboard, then dragged it off the nightstand and onto his chest. Facebook Messenger said Xavier had been active less than a minute ago. Luca sure as hell hoped so. He opened their chat window, then snapped out several rapid-fire messages. Luca Ward. Zave. Help. FML. No, seriously, just fuck it. A new message popped up almost immediately. Xavier Lagari. Uh-oh. Trouble in paradise? I got drunk last night on Imra's weird apple beer and threw myself at him. Bow chicka. No bow chicka. Fuck you. He didn't want me. What did he say? Luca hesitated, eyes welling again as he replayed the scene again, Imra fending him off with those rough hands, that look, almost haunted, heavy and rueful. He scrubbed at his face, then rattled out. Luca Ward. A bunch of shite about me being drunk and not taking advantage and stuff about my dad... It's really hard to kiss a guy who's talking about your dad, Xavier Lagari. But did he actually say, I don't want your narrow white ass, Luca Ward? I hate you. And he didn't say it like that, no. He didn't have to. I don't know. You were drunk. He was probably doing the right thing, being a gentleman. I wouldn't want to fuck a drunk girl, like she might not even remember it in the morning, and it's just not cool and all kinds of messy, and I might hurt her and shite. Remember that whole special day class back in A-levels about drunk consent not being or something like that? So maybe he was doing that, trying to be good to you and all. Maybe. Luca considered it. For a few moments, Imra was just that kind of noble. Daft, fucking loyal sheepdog of a man. But Luca couldn't and wouldn't hang his star on that. It was just asking for more heartbreak, more unrealistic expectations, feeding the notion that if he just tried again sober, this time it would be all right, and Imra might... might actually see him as a man, and not a boy. He thunked his head against the pillows miserably, and dragged his hand over the keyboard. God, he wished he'd been drunk enough to forget the whole thing ever happened. Luca Ward or maybe he just didn't want me. Xavier Lagari. Debbie Downer. Realistic. Rick. Okay, that was bad, but you just gave me an idea, one that might save me from death by endless mortification. Yeah? Yeah. Text me later and tell me. Gotta go, class. Love you, you skinny, ignorant prick. You and that silver tongue. Later, B.B. He closed the I.M. window, then pushed himself up against the headboard, plucking bitterly at the pretty cardigan he'd passed out in, now stretched out from sleeping in it. He'd probably ruined it, unless he could shrink-wash it back into shape. He seemed to be good at ruining things. His gaze drifted to the clover wreath on the lamp. Its petals were almost completely brown now the stems limp and dark and an odd, watery, rotting shade, its smell cloying. It was dying. Nothing he could do could save it. And even if his little gambit worked with Imra, nothing would ever be the same. 40. Imra lay motionless in his bed until morning, staring at the ceiling and asking himself questions he had no answer to, chasing himself in tormenting circles. By dawn the hearth-fire had burned down to embers, and Vila and Chetty had come bounding into the room, crowding up onto the foot of the bed and huddling there for warmth. Chetty laid her head over his knee, looking up at him with a mournful whine. 
She'd always been the one more sensitive to his moods, and she leaned hard into him now, watching him with sorrowful eyes until he stroked over her head and caressed her silky, tufted ears. Come on, girls, he said, and rolled out of bed. Let's go do something about breakfast. Mundane things, ordinary things. As if he hadn't just ruined his relationship with one of the most cherished people in his life. He threw himself into cooking, rolling dough and first cutting it into pie crust, before flattening the rest into squares. He washed over a dozen apples, cored and sliced them, tossed them in sugar and cinnamon, and first filled the pie crust before folding the dough squares around apple chunks to make triangular fritters. With a sprinkle of extra cinnamon and sugar, he put the pastries in the oven to bake, then unwrapped sausage and set it to sizzling along with hashed potatoes. The food was close to done, the smells just hitting that peak blend of rightness, when soft, tentative steps on the stairs warned him Luca was coming. Even without looking, he could sense the boy creeping, as if trying to move without being heard, but that fifth step gave him away every time. Imra steeled himself, fighting to suppress the quaking in his stomach and the crackling, brittle edges cutting away inside his heart, and breathed in deep before making himself look up with a smile, watching Luca through the kitchen doorway. Good morning. Luca froze on the stairs, a fawn poised before flight, looking at Imra with wide, hurt eyes that tore at Imra's gut and laced him up in bindings of regret and sorrow. Luca stood so forlorn, hunched in as if making himself small, one hand digging into the opposite arm and stretching the knit sleeve of the cardigan he still wore. He wet his lips, then whispered, Morning. Im returned the heat down on the stove, then turned to fully face Luca, folding his arms over his chest. He didn't know what to say, but there was no beating around it, and he wasn't fond of waffling. Are you all right? he asked. Luca parted his lips, then closed them again, expression stricken, before he dropped his gaze to his stocking toes. Hangover from hell, he mumbled. But I'll live. I've had worse after a bit of raw hundred proof. City life, Imra said dryly. But that's not what I meant, Luca. He sighed. About last night. Luca's shoulders tightened. His voice rose to a pitch peak, cracked, then settled again as he said, Oh, sorry I passed out on you. Did you have to carry me back? I don't remember. Andrash did most of the heavy lifting. What do you remember? Luca shrugged. Sparks? Watching the stars? Things are a bit fuzzy after that. Imra studied him, a frown pinching between his brows, deepening the pressure headache of a sleepless night. Luca looked anywhere but at him, and the longer Imra watched him, the smaller he shrank. So, that was how he wanted it then. Imra would respect that, if that was what made Luca feel safe. Okay, Luca, he said softly. Okay. Okay, Luca repeated, his voice tiny. Okay. And Imra told himself his chest wasn't aching with the pangs of loss, when anything lost had never been his to start with. Told himself he wasn't burning with the need to take Luca into his arms and kiss that hurt away, as he picked up the spatula and pushed the crackling, popping sausage in the pan. Breakfast is almost done, and we'll take the edge off the hangover. Then we can take out the herds. Okay, I'll, I'll go wash up and get ready. Luca turned away, but then paused, one hand on the stair rail. Imra? Yes? Are we still friends? Soft, pleading, vulnerable, heart-rending, and Imra fought against his closing throat, fought against his frozen tongue to speak, to say the only words he could, if they could ease even the smallest amount of fear in that throaty voice. Of course, Luca. Always. Luca said nothing. There was only a pregnant silence, and then the creak of the fifth step as he retreated up the stairs. 41. Imra didn't know why he was surprised when Luca began avoiding him. 
Luca came back down dressed for breakfast with his phone out and his earbuds in, and whenever Imra looked up he always got the sense that Luca had been looking at him just the moment before, yet every time his gaze was locked on his phone, tapping away, the cord of his earbuds creeping between his lips and catching between his teeth. Imra let it go and simply set out a plate in front of the boy. He didn't know what to say to Luca anyway. Didn't know what to think. He wanted to blame last night on the apple beer, on anything else but that Imra himself was a terrible man, but he was no more fond of lying to himself than he was to anyone else. And if he was honest with himself, Luca had been distracting him from the moment he'd stepped off the train. That distraction became torture with the tacit knowledge that Luca, Luca desired him. Or had that been the apple beer talking? Apple beer and the lonely ache of just wanting someone to understand him. If it had been a moment of intoxicated desperation, no wonder Luca wanted to forget, pretend it had never happened. For Luca's own sake, Imra should probably send him home, talk to Marco, help them sort things out. But as he studied that bowed head of crow-black hair, he couldn't even think about making that call. Right now, the last thing Luca needed was to be rejected again and flung back into that tense role as the last standing beam keeping the walls of his home from collapsing in. He needed safety, security. So Imra would have to get himself under control and provide that. And until he could, maybe Luca's distance was for the best. Yet it ached when, the moment he'd cleared his plate in record time, Luca slipped from the table and vanished out the back door without looking back. Imra dragged his palms over his face, thudding his elbows onto the table with a sigh. Fuck. That morning was only the beginning. After Imra finished his breakfast and washed up, he headed out to find Luca in with Gia and Murta, feeding them and listening to their heartbeats. Imra left him with the goats and saddled both horses, a silent invitation that Luca was welcome to join him in taking the goats out. And a few moments later, Luca emerged from the nanny's stalls to swing up onto Jophia's back, moving much more smoothly than he had just two days ago. But he didn't say a word to Imra as they rode out. He spoke to the dogs, calling to Vila and Chetty, laughing and scratching behind their ears. He murmured to Jophia, stroking through her mane. He called out to the goats as they trotted up the hill, spurring them on as he chased Jophia on their heels. Yet not a single word for Imra. Not even on the ride back. Luca's earbuds appeared out of nowhere, and they were back in his ears, the cord back in his mouth, before they even found the trail. He nudged his knees into Jophia's side and took off, standing slightly in the saddle and leaning forward. Imra caught only a glimpse of his face, fierce and stone-set, hard with a quiet determination Imra had never seen before. Imra let him run, until he was nothing but sun-dapples over pale skin, the flow of dark hair, the shimmering blonde lash of Jophia's tail. Back at the farmhouse, he set Luca to finishing out the last of the orchard. There were only a dozen trees left to be picked. Luca could handle that himself, and it would give them both the space they needed. When Imra asked, Would you mind? Luca only nodded, looking somewhere past Imra's shoulder, eyes glassy and distant. Imra closed his eyes, taking a deep breath, ignoring the twist in his chest. When he opened his eyes again, Luca was already walking away. Imra watched him while he stacked the handcart with empty bushel barrels, then headed out. Imra should follow him. He needed to check the beehives and see if they'd produced enough surplus honey for one last harvest, before closing up the hives for winter. But it could wait another day. Right now, it was easier not to see that detached, emotionless look on Luca's face. Luca stayed out in the orchard through lunch, and this time Imra brought the goats in alone. When he returned, there was only the silhouette of Luca in the bathroom window, and when he went inside and upstairs, a closed bedroom door. He ate dinner alone, and left a tray outside of Luca's room. 
And so it went. Luca would stay close long enough to learn what he needed to do, whether it was trimming the goat's hooves and horns, checking the growing new fields of alfalfa and clover, or walking the pastures to recognize and pull deadly weeds that could harm the goats. Then he'd be off, working until he sweated, throwing himself into every moment of it with a diligence that would be admirable if Imra wasn't so worried. The boy was skittish as a cat, and if ever they brushed close enough to almost touch, he jerked away, expression glassing over in a way that shot daggers into Imra's chest. Imra had done this. He'd done this by shoving Luca away when he was vulnerable. How was he supposed to do the right thing when every right thing to do was completely wrong? He didn't want to push. He couldn't push. Couldn't do anything but wait for Luca to come to him, even if Luca never did. And there was always enough work to keep busy, and those earbuds standing solid as a wall between them in the quiet moments. Always enough work to never look directly at each other, to turn every conversation into a dry, emotionless exchange of information, to let them go their separate ways to the tasks that made the farm run smoothly, and all the smoother for a second pair of hands sharing the labor. But there was never enough work to fill the empty ache in Imra's heart, where Luca's laughter had lived for those few short days. 42. This wasn't working. Luca had thought he could make himself believe the lie, if he just held on to it long enough, if he just acted like nothing had ever happened, until the rawness of that night faded and everything could return to normal. Silent warmth, easy laughter, teasing conversation, the comfort of home. But Lohara didn't feel like home any more. Not when, with every moment that Luca didn't fill with work and more work, he flashed back to that night, Imra cursing under his breath, pulling away from him. Luca, don't. Luca, don't. He'd been such an arsehole, writhing all over Imra, drunk and off his fucking rocker, then throwing a tantrum. He just wanted to forget, but his brain was as much of an asshole as he was. Good memories were fleeting things, their warmth easily dulled with time and faded into nothing, while every bad thing that had ever happened remained sharp and fresh and clear. Listening to his parents fight, curled small in his bed with his knees hugged to his chest, staring at his toes and humming music under his breath as if that could drown it out. Kids in second form pulling his hair, shoving him into walls, calling him queer bait and pansy and fucking fairy fag. Stuttering in front of the class in the middle of a fifth form speech assignment and the snickers that followed. Coming home with perfect marks anyway, and his parents smiling thinly and looking right through him, because they were trying so hard not to see each other that they didn't see him either. His first cigarette and puking on Zave's shoes. His first beer, and puking in Zave's lap. Sneaking off from home and slinking in the corners of dark, dank, smoky gay bars, hoping someone would see him, but even more hoping no one would recognize him and tell his parents he was out skulking around places like this. Going home alone when everyone looked through him just the way his parents did, mortified and sick that he'd thought anyone would ever notice him. There had been will, but he'd never been under any illusions that he was anything more than the path of least resistance for Will, but at least Will had made him feel wanted. At least Will didn't pull away from him and growl, Luca, don't. He closed his eyes, gripping the ladder leading up to the hayloft in the storage barn near the orchard. He needed to stop, stop reliving every moment of it, stop digging the wound deeper. Stop being weird around Imra and running away every time the man came within arm's reach. Imra probably already hated him. Luca just needed to stop making things worse. But he didn't know how. When every time he caught those dark, thoughtful blue eyes, every time he glimpsed Imra moving with that effortless ease, every time Imra looked as though he might reach for him only to pull back, his heart tore in two, fragile as wet tissue paper, and he ran not from Imra, but from the ache of longing and the sting of rejection. This was normal, he told himself. People were rejected all the time. They swung, they missed, they moved on, 
even if they were in love, even if... Stop. He had work to do. Over the past week, they'd cleared the fields of weeds, brambles, poisonous plants, anything that could hurt the voraciously omnivorous and not particularly discerning goats. Imra was in the barn, milking nannies who were already starting to run dry as their kids weaned. But he'd asked Luca to bring down some old hay bales from the loft that had gone bad with damp and mildew, but could still be used to insulate the orchards and the apple tree's roots. If he focused on that and nothing else, he'd get through today. And then curl up in bed and hold his pillow close, as if he could ease the ache in his chest if he'd just applied enough pressure, a tourniquet on a broken heart. He pulled himself up the first rung of the ladder, then hissed, stepping back down. Fuck, the soles of his feet were starting to blister, his socks were too thin for days of hard labor in these boots, and even though he'd tried double layering, he'd still managed to rub swollen bubbles against his heels, the knuckles of his toes, the balls of his feet. As long as he was standing on even footing, the pain was just a dull bit of background noise. But the second he pressed his full weight down on the rung, it shot upward into his gut with nauseating intensity, a sickening and heavy burn. He took a deep, shaking breath and braced himself to try again. Luca? The barn door creaked open at his back, and Imra's voice drifted through. While you're up there, would you mind checking for the spare feed buckets for the stanchion? One of the girls is bucking, and she kicked one loose and cracked it. Luca stiffened, gut dropping into a leaden knot. Sure, he ground out without looking back, and gripped onto the ladder rungs again, pulling himself up as quickly as possible, away from Imra, away from the gaze he could feel watching him with a sort of mournful question that seemed constant lately, unspoken and yet hovering in the air between them. Pain stabbed through the soles of his feet. He ignored it, ignored the rasping burn, even as it made his toes curl and brought tears to the corners of his eyes, stinging. But as his foot came down, one of the blisters on his heel burst. Agony shot through him as raw flesh dragged against fabric and boot leather. His foot slipped, his grip slackened, and the world tilted back, the barn rafters skewing crazily as he fell. There was one dreamlike moment when he didn't understand what was happening. A moment in which the barn roof seemed to recede in slow motion, and he saw his own hand in crystal clarity, reaching for the ladder rungs that were already too far away, the toes of his boots kicking up just beyond his fingertips. Then time accelerated in a terrifying flash that tore through him in a frigid rush and trembled every organ in his body, and locked up his muscles as gravity wrapped him in a hard fist and slammed him down. He had one second to curl up, brace for impact, before he crashed into the warmth of Imra's body, captured in steel bands of arms, his fall halted abruptly as Imra caught him, lifted him against his chest, turned into the force of impact in a rapid swinging spin before stumbling to a halt. Breathing hard, Imra stared down at him, eyes wide, naked fear stark in the sharp, scintillating edges of his deep blue gaze. Bloody Christ, Imra gasped, his grip hard on Luca, grasping him too tight, fingers digging in. What happened? Are you all right? Heart thumping, Lucas stared up at Imra. He'd rather have crashed into the ground and broken every bone in his body than this. Wrapped in Imra's arms, carried by that easy strength, sheltered by that protective nature that made Imra Imra. He hadn't even heard Imra moving, but he'd been there, ready to catch Luca when he fell, without hesitation. Luca's hands had fallen against Imra's chest, and underneath his palms he could feel the rushed, powerful beat of Imra's heart, racing as swiftly as his heaving breaths, as sharp-edged as the raw emotion in Imra's eyes. Luca couldn't stand that. That emotion, that concern over him, the fact that even after Luca had made such an arse of himself, Imra was taking care of him, worrying over him, saving him, like the little nit he was. He shoved at Imra's chest as hard as he could, kicking, twisting until Imra had no choice but to let go, 
arms dropping away but rough hands grasping Luca, steadying him as Imra set him down. Luca bit back a cry of pain that came up his throat like vomit as his feet touched ground, sucking it in like a withheld scream as he twisted away from Imra's touch. Fine, he forced out through his teeth. I'm fine. Imra only stared at him, that penetrating question in his gaze once more, aching and haunted by melancholy, by something almost like grief. That gaze pulled at Luca, tearing at the bleeding wounds inside him, the humiliation that Imra could never understand when Imra was quiet and patient and wouldn't be ripping himself to awful pieces over something so simple as, Luca, don't. Imra would be able to take a rejection in stride. Imra would be calm and understanding and kind and move on with his life. But Luca wasn't Imra. Luca didn't know how to be Imra. And Luca couldn't stand to be near Imra. So he ran. He ran from the barn, the pain in the soles of his feet spurring him on as he thrust out into the mid-morning light and ran without looking back. 43. Imra Claiborne was not a violent man, but he was very close to ripping the earbuds out of Luca's ears and dropping them into the bloody damned rototiller. He sat across the breakfast table from the boy, watching him just to see if Luca would look up, make eye contact, even acknowledge that he was in the room. He'd tried to grow accustomed to Luca's silences, tried to give him the space he needed. But for the past week all he could see every time he looked at Luca was his foot slipping on the ladder, and just how easily he could have ended up a mangled and bloody wreck, torn and broken, if Imra hadn't moved fast enough. That was what kept haunting him. If he'd been a second slower, if he'd started to leave after asking Luca to fetch the spare feed bucket, if so many things, so many things that would have meant he'd failed Luca, failed to protect him. And even if he'd been there, even if he'd caught him at the last moment and taken the force of the impact with his own body, even if he could still taste the rank, bitter terror in the back of his throat while his mind caught up with what his body already knew, that Luca was safe, Luca had run from him. And somehow Imra still felt as though he'd failed him. They needed to talk. This couldn't go on, stabbing at each other with silences, ignoring the bloody gorilla rampaging about the room and tearing everything apart while they pretended nothing was wrong. Imra didn't like deceptions, didn't like lies, but every day was a lie of pretending that nothing had happened, that he didn't know the feel of Luca's hands on his skin and the taste of his lips. And even though he understood why Luca needed that lie... He didn't understand how they were going to survive three more months like this. Luca. Nothing. Luca was tapping at his phone again, and even with the earbuds wedged tightly in his ears, Imra could hear the music he was playing, something with a blasting swift rhythm. He had the cord between his teeth again, working it with his lips, chewing little dents in the rubber coating until, if he wasn't careful, he'd chew right down to the wire. He hadn't touched his pancakes, and it worried Imra. He was skipping lunch every day, barely picking at breakfast, and even if the trays Imra left outside Luca's room each night came back empty, the dark shadows under Luca's eyes made Imra wonder how much of it Luca was eating, and how much he was tossing out the window or feeding to the dogs. Luca! he tried again, but Luca didn't even look up. Imra bit back a snarl bubbling up inside him with a surge of frustrated annoyance that caught him off guard when he normally didn't, ever. His father had been a calm, gentle, slow-speaking man, and he had raised Imra to follow in his footsteps, to choose consideration above anger, to manage his emotions with deliberation and intent. But his father had never dealt with a maddening little cat of a man who would rather drive them both completely up the wall than talk about what happened and clear the air. He ground his teeth, fingers twitching as he fought the urge to snag the earbud cords and pull. Lu! His phone rang in his back pocket. Imra sighed, lifting up just enough to pull it free, then sank back in his chair and eyed the caller ID. Luca stopped his tapping and shot him a sidelong look, 
gaze unreadable, before looking down at his plate, setting his phone on the table, and picking up his fork. Imra swiped the call and lifted his phone to his ear. Good morning, Marco. The fact that Luca didn't immediately tense and bolt said his music actually was that loud, and he hadn't even heard Imra calling his name. Imra exhaled, shifting in his chair to settle sideways so he could lean his head and shoulders against the wall, turning his attention to the phone. Hey, Imra, Marco said. He sounded strange, tentative, strained, his voice tight. How are things going? Everything's fine. You? Life is life. I just wanted to, I, you know. Imra glanced at Luca from the corner of his eye, watching as he stabbed at his pancakes, turning them into mush. You wanted to know how Luca's doing? Yeah. Imra didn't have to hesitate a moment before answering. He's settled in quite well. Hell would freeze and the sky would fall before he would betray Luca's trust by telling Marco a word of the tension between them, the strangeness, that heated and desperate kiss. I've gotten quite a bit more done with his help. Good, that's good, Marco rattled out a little too quickly. I'm glad to hear it. He hasn't caused any trouble. None at all. It's been nice having him around. Even if he was savaging those pancakes more than eating them. Imra held back a smile, fondness blooming in a warm patch in the center of his chest and making his heart beat a little harder, no matter his frustration, his... his... he might as well admit it. He was hurt. But he'd hurt Luca, too. I don't know how you handle him, Imra, Marco said by recognizing him as an adult instead of commanding him like a child, Imra thought. But that, too, he kept to himself. As I said, I think he just needed a change of scenery and time to cool off. He diverted smoothly, then pressed forward. Listen, Marco. Hm? Imra pressed his lips together. Maybe it wasn't his place to ask, but they were his friends. Are things all right with you and Lucia? Eh? Marco's quick, nervous laugh made a lie of every word he said. Sure, we're both busy with work, but things are fine. We're both just worried about Luca. Ah. Imra sagged against the wall, closing his eyes. These bloody wards and their deflections and evasion were going to kill him. At least he knew where Luca got it from. All right, Marco. All right. Just a moment, would you? Luca's right here. Wait, no, I don't think... But Imra was already pulling the phone away from his ear, Marco's voice retreating into a distant, panicked murmur. Imra tapped the button to mute the sound from his end, then waved his hand in Luca's line of sight. Luca! This time Luca looked up. He eyed Imra warily, then pulled his earbuds out of his ears, letting them fall to coil atop his phone. Imra waited, but when he said nothing, continued, It's your father. Did you want to talk to him? Luca immediately stiffened, eyes widening, before slitting into a scowl. What? No. He jerked his face away, glaring across the kitchen. He knows my mobile. He could have used it any time. Imra watched Luca, internally sighing wishing he could reach across the table, rest his hand to that stiff shoulder, tell him with the warmth of touch that it would be all right. But he didn't doubt Luca would pull away from him, so he only tried with his clumsy words. I didn't tell him anything, he murmured. Luca hunched into himself, red washing brilliantly across his face. The legs of the chair scraped roughly. He thrust it back, shoving to his feet. What the fuck is there to tell? He snapped, then turned and stalked off. Imra tilted his head. There was something off about Luca's stride, a subtle hitch. He wasn't sure if it was tension or something else. He might have turned his ankle in the saddle or... Imra? Marco's voice rose from the phone speaker. Are you still there? Imra dropped his head into his palm, resting his elbow on the table and unmuted the phone. Here. He doesn't want to talk to me, does he? Have you tried to call him? 
I've texted a few times. Marco made a rueful sound. I think the only reason he answers is so I don't drive out there to make sure he's alive. Do you think I'd let anything happen to him? That's not what I... Marco made a frustrated sound. No, I'm sorry. I'm trying to act like... Never mind. Marco? Nothing. I'm just not very good at this parenting thing, especially the part about being right and infallible, when right now I'm not really sure I am. Imra rubbed his temples. Do you think it was a mistake sending Luca here? Do you? No, even if your reasons might leave something to be desired. Imra? Marco asked wistfully. Is he happy at Loera? Not right now, but then neither of us are. I'm trying to make sure he is, Imra deflected carefully. Apparently he was learning a thing or two from the wards after all. That's all I really want, Marco sighed. He just seemed so lost, unhappy and directionless. I just wanted him to be happy, to do something instead of wasting his potential. When you have an adult son who's so bloody smart but never seems to want to apply himself to anything, you feel like you failed as a parent. That's not something you can force on him by taking his choices away from him. He's at an age where he can decide for himself, good or bad, and deal with the consequences, good or bad. And Imra was the pot calling the kettle black when he'd flat out told Luca that night that Luca wasn't capable of deciding for himself. But he'd been drunk. That guilt would get its hooks in Imra's heart one way or another, whether it was guilt over desiring Luca or guilt over hurting him by refusing to give in to his advances. He stared at Luca's half-finished, abandoned plate, forcing his attention back to the conversation at hand. What's done is done. We're making the best of things. I'm sure he'll talk to you when he's ready. Will he? Marco asked, and the aching, lost note in his voice nearly broke Imra's heart. He closed his eyes. I don't know. Not his place, he reminded himself. He couldn't get between father and son, couldn't fix their problems when he couldn't even fix the problems between Luca and himself. I hope so, was all he said. It was the best he could offer. Marco, I'm sorry, but... No, I know. I remember the schedule at Lohera. Go take care of your goats, Imra. Will you be all right? Yes. And Imra... A dry, faint laugh. You know I love you, right? You giant grump. Imra chuckled. I love you too, you feckless ass. Later. He ended the call and dropped his phone on the table, then rubbed his fingers to his eyes with a groan. Too many complications. He set himself to finishing his breakfast. He didn't have much time to spare, when he needed to get the animals out in the fields and then spend the day pasteurizing and bottling the last of the milk, marking the labels with expiration dates, putting it in cold storage until market day. But as he stood to clear away his empty plate and put Luca's away in case he wanted it later, the table rattled. No, the phone Luca had left on the table rattled, vibrating with a buzzing chime. Imra glanced down without thinking, automatically scanning over the screen, and immediately wished he hadn't. A new text window had popped up over the lock screen, bold letters he couldn't help but absorb before he could shut them out. Eh, hey, sweet lips, heard you got banished to the arse crack of nowhere. Harrogate, eh? Want some company? Gonna be out near there on holiday this weekend. Could take your mind off it all, baby. I got time, hotness. The contact name was only W.K. Imra felt dirty just reading it, like he'd violated Luca's privacy, not to mention the sheer crassness of it all. But that was how people Luca's age spoke, he supposed. People Luca's age. Imra closed his eyes and turned away. People Luca's age. People Luca might be intimately involved with. People who were none of Imra's business. He shouldn't care. He didn't care. Luca's life was Luca's life. And Imra needed to remember exactly where he belonged in that life before he made any more disastrous mistakes. 44.
The blisters, Luca thought, were his punishment for fucking everything up. He couldn't stand this. The careful distance, the way it hurt to even be in the room with Imra, until he didn't know what to do but run, even though it was the last thing he wanted to do. He didn't know how to stop. Not when he was too mortified to look Imra in the eye. Not when his chest ached and his stomach bottomed out every time he drew close enough to catch Imra's scent. Not when he couldn't stand the pity in Imra's eyes, now that he knew, he knew, how Luca felt. This sad little boy pining after a man who could never want him. Not when the only way he could even sleep at night was to wear himself to the bone. If he was working, he could at least be useful and not this miserable shade haunting around the house. It was the only way he could think of to apologize to Imra for his dreadful behavior, throwing himself into taking care of the animals, taking care of the farm. If they were working, he could be with Imra without having to talk to him. So he wore gloves to cover the first reddened blisters and walked with his back stiff to hide his limp. When the blisters burst and soaked his gloves and socks, he washed them in the bathroom sink and poured stinging alcohol over his skin, wrapped his palms and soles in gauze, then hid them away again, threw himself back into work, and avoided those quiet moments with Imra where he might notice that Luca never took his gloves off. If he was focusing on the pain, he wasn't thinking about Imra, about the silence, about those long, searching looks he could feel, even when he wouldn't look, expectant and patient. About the taste of his lips, and how for just a moment they'd crushed together in a breathless, heated lock. He sat on the foot of his bed, dabbing his feet with cotton swabs by the quiet light of the rising sun. After nearly a month of this, he'd have thought they would heal by now. But each swipe brought the alcohol-soaked swabs away pink. He hissed at the stinging pain, sucking back a whimper. He should have toughened up by now, healed and hardened into calluses, so he would be strong enough to handle this. He couldn't do that right either. His laptop sat open at the bed on his side. Over the weeks that had passed, it had become his lifeline, his connection to Xavier and a friendship he hadn't managed to ruin. He had a few other friends back in Sheffield, but they were the kind of friends he'd only connected with because they happened to be in proximity to each other and bored at the same times. Once they'd drifted off to university, there'd been no reason to stay in touch, leaving Luca a fucking Billy no mates. And though Will still texted him now and then, it was only when he wanted to hook up. Luca still hadn't answered his last few texts. Zave was the only one who still really spoke to him, still cared. Luca couldn't even remember how they'd met, though there was a vague recollection of bumping into each other, books scattering, and nearly starting a fight. How they'd met didn't matter. All that mattered was that Xavier was there, even when things got rough. And Zave was there now, a bloop from Facebook Messenger pulling Luca from his grit-toothed work over his feet to look at the message window. Xavier Lagari. Good morning, sunshine. How are we on day twenty-seven of your maudlin exile? Luca grimaced, set the first aid supplies on the chest at the foot of the bed, and dragged his laptop across his lap, settling cross-legged with his damp soles carefully turned upward to let the wounds air out. Luca Ward. It hasn't been twenty-seven days yet, has it? Xavier Lagari. Twenty-four, actually. And the fact that you had to ask says you believed it could be twenty-seven. Plus, not like twenty-four is any better. It's almost October, for fuck's sake, Luca. Why the fuck are you counting? Clob's got a betting pool going. How many days until you break and start begging for hot sexy goat man's dick? Why are you like this? No, seriously, why? I hate you. You only wish you could. Seriously, B.B., you okay? Like you barely talk any more? No, Luca wanted to say. I'm not okay, and I haven't been okay for weeks. But he only said what he'd said every time Xavier had asked. I'm fine. Really? Yeah? Okay, look, I'm having a sensitive moment, so, like, don't waste it. Talk to me. Tell me all your deepest, innermost feelings. Let me cradle your tender little emo heart. 
Fuck you in your salty ass. Why my ass got to be salty? It'll hurt more that way. Baby, why your love got to hurt so bad? Then a pause. The little animated dots that said Xavier was typing, going on for so long that Luca expected an entire paragraph. But instead, all that popped up was two words. Vid chat. Luca stilled, biting his lip, then tapped out. Why? Because I want to. Maybe I miss your pretty face. Liar. Fine. Sec. He clicked the video chat button on the messenger window, gave the browser permission to access his laptop webcam, then waited for Xavier to accept. A few moments later, the window expanded onto a black screen, then resolved into a grainy video. A close-up of Xavier's neck and jaw, bristles of stubble against dark brown skin the color of deep burnished oak, the white of his T-shirt collar, a glimpse of his dorm room past the curling thatch of hair at his nape. Then he pulled back settling in full view, and dragging a hand back through damp hair with a cheesy, broad grin that bunched his round cheeks up into arcs underneath his eyes. Luca eyed him sourly. Zave was much, much too cheerful for this early in the morning. What? Well, you look like shite, Zave chirped. Please wait while I strip naked and jump into your lap. I'm overwhelmed by your flattery and must have you. Gonna have to pass. You look like ten-day-old ass, and I'm not really into the whole fuck-a-corpse gig, eh? Save the pigs and stiffs for hammering. The fuck are you doing to yourself? I'm just tired. Farm work is hard work. Luca. Xavier sighed, fixing him with a long look, arching a sceptical brow. Luca looked away, wrapping his arms around himself. Hmm? Luca. Dark brown eyes softened. I'm being serious here for once in my life. Come on, baby boy, talk to me. Zave, Luca groaned, then sagged back against the wall behind the bed, rubbing his hand over his chest. I don't even know where to start. I don't think you understand. What I did, it was so, so much worse than just embarrassing myself, throwing myself at him. He sighed scrubbing a hand through his hair, darting his eyes away from Xavier's curiously interested gaze. This wasn't like Zave, this quiet, supportive silence, but it was every bit like Zave to have his back when he needed it. Luca had just never needed it this much before. He plucked at his lower lip, tugging, then continued. He's demisexual. He's not a one-and-done guy, prick first, like sex is this emotional thing for him. Special, eh? And maybe it is for me, too, when he's the only one I've ever really wanted and I love him so much it's killing me and I can't really tell the two apart, but it's different for him. He told me what it's like and then I just... I ignored that and stomped all over his boundaries. He rubbed at his throat, at the ache there. It was so shitty, Zave. It was so shitty of me, and I don't know how to say I'm sorry when I'm pretending the whole thing didn't happen, and he's letting me. He's letting me be this complete fucking prat and act like a shitty dick to him because he's... he's... Luca blew out roughly. He's just like that. He let me walk on him in cleats if it would make me happy. Feels like that's what I'm doing, and I don't know how to stop. Stop pretending for a start, Zave pointed out. It's kind of gotten to be a habit. Habits are made to be broken, my wee baby bird. Zave shook his head with a rueful smirk. Look, you talk about this Imra guy like he hung the moon. So if he's so great, then he's probably open to talking this shite out without yelling and going all spare. Just you two. Sit. Talk. I don't know, I just... A light rap rattled against his door. He froze, heart thumping. Luca? drifted through the door in Imra's quiet rumble, and Luca swore. Fuck! he hissed under his breath, scrambling for his socks. Luca? Zave asked. What is it? Shh! Then louder. Just a second! Luca slammed the laptop closed, yanked his socks on over his aching feet, then grabbed the mess of ruined cotton swabs, bottle of alcohol and roll of gauze, and stuffed them under his pillow.
His gloves were on the nightstand, but if he put them on it would look weird. He tucked his arms against his chest, wrapping them around himself and stuffing his hands into his armpits like he was just cold or... or... it didn't matter. He just didn't want Imra to see his lacerated palms. He took a shaky breath, then called, Come in. After a long hesitation, the door eased open just enough for Imra to lean in. His gaze flicked over Luca, brows knitting, dark blue eyes careful, almost wary. Am I interrupting anything? Just on vid chat with my friend back home. Luca cleared his throat, fixing his gaze on the door frame just over Imra's head. He still, still couldn't look directly at him, not without his heart trying to rip itself to pieces. Nothing important. Ah, Imra said. He held an awkward moment, then said, I'm going into town for the day, to market. There's not much to do if you want to stay home. I'm keeping the goats in while I'm out. Let him go, he told himself. Easier to avoid each other if one of you isn't here. Sit, talk, Xavier said in his head. He sighed, closing his eyes, squaring his shoulders. Do you need help? Imra took so long to answer that Luca thought he must have left the moment his eyes had closed, until... I could use a hand loading and unloading the truck. Okay. Luca's voice cracked. He cleared his throat again. I'll be dressed and ready in a minute. Luca opened his eyes. Imra was watching him strangely, a furrow in his brows, but then he just nodded. Nothing else. Nodded and ducked back out without a word, closing the door behind him. Cursing, Luca fell backward onto the bed, then dragged the laptop's lid up again. He has a nice voice, Xavier said. Lucas scrubbed his hands over his face. Kill me. Talk to him. About what? All the shite stewing inside you? What the fuck good does bottling it up do? Sighing, Luca flopped his hands away from his face and turned his head to glare at the screen. You wouldn't understand. You'd be surprised. Xavier scrunched his nose. How long are you there? January? Yeah. Can you really stand staying like this until January? Luca winced. No. Then why wait? He didn't have an answer for that. He did, however, have a ticking clock and Imra waiting for him, and he still needed to wrap his hands and feet. At least the weather, colder by the day, the windows dewed every morning with frigid condensation that never quite formed into frost, meant Imra would be even less likely to question the gloves. I need to go get dressed, he said, and pushed himself up. Later. Later. Love you, skinny prick. Luca couldn't help laughing. It felt like the first time he'd smiled in weeks. Love you too, asshole, he murmured, then disconnected the chat and stared at the computer with a sigh. Cooped up in the Land Rover with Imra. This likely had not been his smartest idea, but it still didn't rank quite up there with his Hall of Fame high of getting drunk and sloppy all over the man he'd loved since he was knee-high to a bloody damned cricket. Fuck my life he said again, and knelt to lace up his boots. 45. Loading bushels and bushels of apples into the back of the Land Rover was the easy part. Even if, through Luca's gloves and the gauze underneath, the edges of the bushel basket's grips cut into his palms, leaving him grinding his teeth to keep from hissing in pain where Imra could hear, Luca was getting used to ignoring the pain. He didn't think he'd ever get used to ignoring Imra. Luca kept his eyes on his feet as Imra counted over the baskets, several heavy sealed boxes, rattling coolers that exuded smoky chill breaths, and a crate of covered jars, before helping him secure the camper over the Land Rover's bed and snapped the clamps into place, turning the flatbed into a covered compartment. But when Imra let himself into the driver's seat, Luca hesitated staring at the handle of the passenger's side. It wasn't a long drive into town, it wouldn't be so bad, and then Imra would be busy and maybe he wouldn't need Luca there at all, so maybe he should just stay here and... Coming? 
Imra asked mildly. Sure, Luca mumbled, and pulled the door open to climb into the passenger's seat. He fumbled with the seat belt. It took six tries to actually buckle himself in while Imra waited patiently, not starting the engine until Luca was settled and huddled against the door, staring out the window. He told himself he couldn't smell Imra, couldn't feel him, couldn't hear his every movement, not one bit. Fuck. Fuck. He closed his eyes as the Land Rover pulled out of the drive and onto the road. The shivers of the engine rumbling up through him were making him queasy, turning the terrified unease in the pit of his stomach into a quivering slurry, sloshing miserably about. He dug in his pocket for his phone and his earbuds, then stared down at them. He couldn't keep doing this, shutting Imra out, avoiding it. Imra wasn't the one who'd fucked up, and acting like this was just punishing him for something he didn't even do. But Luca didn't know what to say how to start, and he closed his eyes, balling up his earbud cord in his fingers, fighting for words. But all he could find was a whisper of his voice, barely managing to force out, I hate this. Hmm? Imra asked. Hate what? The silence. Luca bit his lip, then tugged and fretted at his earbud cords. You never talk to me any more. Imra remained quiet. Luca risked a glance from the corner of his eye, but Imra's gaze was on the road, distant and contemplative, his fingers lightly tapping on the steering wheel. Finally, you haven't seemed to want to talk, Imra said, slow and measured, then nodded toward Luca's fretting, cord-entangled hands without taking his eyes from the road. And it's hard to talk through those. Yeah, I... He pressed his lips together, forcing his hands to still, the earbud cord wrapped so tight it cut into his fingers. First a sharp burst of pain, then numbness as the circulation slowed. I guess I've been tired and thinking about a lot of things. Anything you want to talk about with me? Nothing you need to hear. It wouldn't help. Luca lifted his head, making himself look at him fully, forcing himself to be brave. I've been kind of an asshole, ignoring you. He darted his tongue over his lips, then before he could lose his nerve. I'm sorry. Imra's lips curled at the corners, even if he kept his gaze turned forward, something softened and gentled around his eyes. You don't need to apologize. Maybe not, but I should. I, I messed some things up. I didn't listen right. I wasn't fair to you. About what? Luca couldn't answer that. Not when his pulse was roaring fit to drown out his voice. Not when he could hardly breathe in more than shallow, scared gasps. He pressed his hand to his chest, then looked away out the window. He hadn't realized how much time had passed, but he could see the rooftops of Harrogate over the next hill, and at some point the road underneath them had turned from dirt to pavement. Never mind, he said softly, rubbing at his chest. He'd... At least, he'd apologized. You meant it when you said we're still friends? Of course, Imra answered without hesitation. Why wouldn't we be? Lucas smiled faintly. That queasiness in his stomach settled, even if it left behind an acid, melancholy taste of bitter longing. Of course it was that simple, because of course that was Imra. No reason, he murmured. So what's this market thing? You don't remember the weekly farmer's market? Imra frowned. I was supposed to go last week, but we were busy. Luca shook his head. He tried to remember a farmer's market, but Harrogate was nothing but a memory of tea at some very fancy place where his parents made him wear nice clothing, all overwhelmed by memories of Lohera Farm and the bitter feeling that if they'd never left Harrogate, his parents wouldn't have stopped loving each other. I don't remember much about the town, honestly. I think maybe I blocked it. He shrugged. When I got off the train, it felt like I'd never been here before. Nothing felt familiar until Lohera, except that ugly-ass rail station. You were young when you moved away, Imra pointed out gently. I called ahead to reserve a stall. We'll be selling off the extra apples while they're still fresh, 
and some raw honey I bottled before you came. I'll be meeting with buyers who will come out for the manure from the goat barn. I might be able to negotiate a trade. Usually I trade with the Caldwells a few kilometres down the road for fresh hay, since I don't grow my own, but they lost half their crop to damp rot this season and they've none to spare. The market is a good place to meet other farmers from farther out and make a trade here and there. So, you sell shite? Luca wrinkled his nose. Ew. Imra laughed, quiet and brief. Not you. Goat manure is better fertilizer than cow or horse manure. It's higher in nutrient value for the soil with a lower pH. Sciencing it doesn't make it less gross. It's nature. Nature is gross. Lucas said firmly, earning another laugh. If you say so, Angyulka. Angyulka. Lucas' breaths caught. He hadn't heard that nickname for weeks, hadn't heard anything but brief murmurs of Luca to get his attention, followed by terse instructions that he barely stayed long enough to absorb before running away to throw himself into work. He couldn't endure that word, that nickname because it made him want to be Imra's angel, want to be. Stop. I say it's gross, he forced out, and managed a smile even if his lips trembled. And I say you still sell shite. Yes, Luca, Imra responded with wearily amused patience. I sell shite. Luca snorted out a laugh before he could stop himself, so sudden it scraped his throat. But it released the tightness in his chest, letting him breathe in great gulping giggles. And then Imra was laughing too, and they were laughing together. And God, everything was all wrong, but still at least there was this. At least they could laugh, easing days and days of silent tension. At least they were talking again. At least Imra had accepted his apology. At least Luca hadn't lost his friend. 46. Luca might not remember Harrogate, but the tall classical buildings felt familiar nonetheless, their architecture evoking that sense of home. And as Imra pulled the Land Rover into the parking lot off the market, Luca leaned over to peer down Cambridge Street, a busy riot, with dozens of shopkeepers setting up their stalls, several customers already wandering around even though most of the stalls were only half ready. The zigzag brickwork of the street was familiar, clean and pale, and a vague memory teased at him of the fluttering green canopies of pop-up pavilions, the taste of scones, the snap and billow of banners flickering in the breeze. Sun through the canopies, he remembered, being small and looking up to see the sun turning canopies translucent, shining through the tiny holes in the canvas weave. I've been here he murmured, pressing his fingers against the window. You'd come up to market with me and help out. Imra killed the engine and unsnapped his seatbelt. You'd sit on the table and count people's change for them, swinging your legs. Luca laughed. I don't remember that. It happened. You were my good luck cat. I always had more buyers when you were there. I'm not a cat. You aren't? Make up your mind. Am I an angel or a cat? But Imra just gave him an amused look, shaking his head and slipping out of the Land Rover. Luca huffed, then shook his head as well and climbed out. A rush of scents washed over him, riding the sharp bite of chill morning air. Baking pastries, fresh-cut flowers, leather, tart citrus fruit, hay, the smell of livestock, fabric dye sizzling spiced meat, so many other things it almost made him dizzy, thick and almost as overwhelming as the sheer noise of it, people chatting and calling out to each other, heavy boxes and items slung about and thudded to the street, clanging tent poles. Imra popped the camper top with a squeal of hinges. Luca pulled himself from staring at the flurry of activity and slipped back to Imra's side. Where's our stall? Not far. Imra hauled out a bushel basket and passed it to Luca, then stacked two more into his own arms, thick biceps bulging and straining against his shirt, fit to split the seams. He tossed his head, a few silvered strands drifting across his face. This way. Luca tried to lift the basket of apples enough to brace it a bit more against his chest, then winced when pressure cut into his palms.
He caught a hiss under his breath as the gauze under his gloves scraped, leaving behind a worrisomely wet feeling and shocking pain through his hands. Imra paused, glancing back. Are you all right? Is it too heavy? No. Luca shook his head quickly and forced a smile, then used his thigh to push the basket up so he could wrap his arms around it instead of holding it by the handles. I'm fine. Lead the way. Imra lingered, watching him oddly, but then turned and led him through the busy crowds. Several people called out Imra's name in greeting as they passed. Imra always acknowledged with a nod and a rough sound, but didn't slow until they reached an empty stall with a little folded paper placard reading, Reserved, Imra Claiborne Lohera Farm. Imra and Luca offloaded the bushel baskets, then snagged a rolling, folding hand cart that had been left under one of the stall's tables and dragged it back to the Land Rover. Unloading was a matter of minutes with the cart, and in two trips they'd brought every bushel, basket, box, crate, and cooler, and piled them in a haphazard stack behind the stall's front. Imra shook out a rolled canvas banner printed with Lohera and a stylized, silhouetted, blooming clover flower in white on cobalt blue, and draped it over the stall's front. Luca watched him, biting his lip and fidgeting, then glanced over his shoulder. The bright colors drew him like silver to a raccoon, and the smell of baking pastries gnawed at his stomach and made his mouth water. He toyed with his sleeve. Could I go look around a bit, or do you need me to stay? Imra glanced up from checking a portable refrigerator that had been built into the stall's side, raking Luca over with an amused look. Hungry? I wouldn't even know where to start. He bounced on the balls of his feet. They have pie? Luca pointed toward a booth a few down, where a tall woman with sun-streaked blonde hair was just setting out fresh, steaming pies along a wooden counter. Im returned his head, then chuckled. They are one of my largest buyers of Lohera apples for their pies. Would you like to stop by? Yes. Imra didn't mind the patient indulgence in Imra's glance, nor did he mind working through the building crowds toward the pie stall when Imra's bulk forged a path that made it easy to follow. He didn't even mind the line that was already forming at the stall, with its sign reading, Shaughnessy Bakery in scrolling, cheerful script. But he minded very much when the woman behind the counter caught sight of Imra, lit up with her eyes bright and breaths coming swift, and flung herself from behind the stall and into his arms. Imre, the woman crowed, hugging him tightly. What a delight! We missed you last week! Imra went subtly stiff. Luca didn't think the woman even noticed, but Luca did. His jaw hurt, and he didn't quite understand why until he realized he was grinding his teeth. He was being irrational, being a prat, but it was hard not to notice how the woman looked up at Imra with her cheeks flushed and her lashes fluttering, when it was the same way Luca looked at Imra too. Imra loosely gripped the woman's waist and gently pried her away. Morning, Sally, he drawled. Had some things to handle at Lohera last week. You open yet? Not quite, but you know you're always welcome to anything you want. She dimpled, then glanced past Imra at Luca. Her voice immediately turned sugary, like he was five fucking years old, as she said. And who is this? Did you bring your nephew, Imra? Luca bristled, simmering, mouth opening to snap something back, but Imra intercepted smoothly. Family friend, he rumbled. You don't remember the wards from in town. This is their son. Oh, you're Lucia's boy, she laughed. She had a pretty laugh. She was pretty, an older woman in her late thirties or early forties, with that certain refinement that turned the advancing lines on her face into marks of grace, yet a casual, friendly openness that Luca was trying hard to focus on, rather than the sudden urge to bite her face off. At least on recognizing him, that syrupiness had left her voice to leave warm familiarity. You're pretty as your mother. I'm so jealous of those eyelashes. He forced a smile, even if it felt more like a baring of teeth. You can get the same thing in a tube of Maybelline.
Sally had started to offer her hand, but then faltered, blinking, and looked back and forth between Imra and Luca, as if looking to one of them for guidance. Luca mentally kicked himself. Fucking arsehole. He took a deep breath, made his teeth unclench, and offered his hand an apology, trying that smile again. Sorry, I'm Luca. She hesitated, but then shook his hand, her smile returning, albeit wary. Nice to meet you, Luca. Imra fixed Luca with a long look, arching a brow, and Luca fought not to shrink back. But Imra only sighed and diverted Sally's attention with, Luca was hoping to try one of your pies. We could smell them the moment we stepped out. Sally brightened. Oh, of course. This way, please. Luca hung back, plucking at his lower lip, the pit of his stomach heavy. But then Imra caught his eye and tossed his head, a subtle, beckoning gesture. And even if Luca was embarrassed as all bloody hell, there was no way he could say no when Imra called. Sally's wariness evaporated as she proudly displayed an array of fresh pies just out of the oven, talking about her process, ingredients, experimental flavors, with clear pleasure in her work and an excitement that made it hard to dislike her. And she nearly beamed when she segmented out little sampler slices for both Luca and Imre, and Luca tried the blueberry crumble and nearly melted, as sweet, tangy blueberry and sugar and pastry burst on his tongue in a delectable wash, while Imra rumbled his appreciation of a slice of walnut strudel pie. Imra and Luca swapped samplers, pushing bites of one thing or another on each other, until they were laughing and Sally glowed with pride, and suddenly it wasn't so hard to like her at all. Especially when, after Imra finished discussing supply with her and Luca trailed him back to the Lohera stall, Luca realized within an hour of opening for business that Sally's reaction to Imra wasn't exactly uncommon. He'd barely had time to help Imra set out the most attractive bushels of apples, interspersed with cloth-wrapped wheels of goat cheese and clear golden jars of honey, before a line started to form. He'd proposed setting out a sample platter, and when Imra had agreed, Luca had busied himself picking out one of the smaller, personally-sized cheese wheels from each type and cubing them with Imra's pocket knife. So he didn't notice, at first, just how long the line at the Lohera store was when people blended in and out of the crowd. But a particular high falsetto giggle pierced his concentration, and he glanced up, watching as a blushing woman with a thin, delicate nose and a cute brown pixie cut blushed and giggled over picking out apples, watching Imra from under her lashes. Luca quirked a brow, biting back a smile, because Imra didn't even notice. That fucking lunk. The entirety of his attention was on the apples, on picking out the nicest ones to bag up an even dozen for her, while she was throwing out hint after hint. And she wasn't the first or the last. Luca couldn't help watching, trying not to be obvious, as a litany of coy smiles and fishing commentary and accidental brushes of hand to hand over exchanged pound notes passed through in a parade. He just kept his mouth shut, hung back, kept the sampler platters refreshed, and fetched anything Imra asked him to get. From plastic bags to zip ties to sample cups for milk to a fresh receipt pad, while the stock dwindled minute by minute, hour by hour. Things slowed down around the lunch hour, when people wandered off to buy ready-made food from the kebab stalls and Sally's pies, and wherever that delicious scent of baking bread was coming from. Luca finally had a chance to sit down, when he'd been constantly replacing the shelf displays as they were bought out over and over again, leaving Imra free to handle transactions and deal with ogling customers. But now Luca sank down atop a crate, trying not to wince when, now that he was no longer standing, his sore, aching feet burned. His hands weren't doing much better, but at least the gloves and bandages had insulated them from too much more damage— and kept a clean buffering layer between him and the food he'd been handling. Imra eyed him thoughtfully, then levered himself down to sit on the edge of one of the tables. You all right? Wasn't expecting it to be this busy. 
Luca laughed, scrubbing his hair out of his face. I'm good. Want something to eat? Not sure I could afford anything here. I'll bring you something. Imra lingered on him, watching him until Luca had to avert his eyes from that intense gaze. You look tired. Take a rest, I'll be back. Okay, Luca said, unable to help smiling as he watched Imra push to his feet, then stride away with those long, lazily powerful steps that made him stand out in any crowd. This was better, he thought. They'd been working alongside each other for weeks, but not together. Even if there'd not been time for much with the deluge of customers, they'd spoken to each other easily and freely, and it was easier and easier to look at Imra without feeling like he wanted to curl up in a ball and cry. He should have apologized ages ago, he thought. Maybe his dad was right, and he really did need to grow up. He relaxed, watching a stall a bit across the way. More of a pen, really, where fuzzy brown and white baby donkeys cavorted and kicked about, while parents brought their children by to stretch their hands out and try to pet the fractious little balls of fluff. Lucas smiled to himself, stretching out in the sun and letting his bones go loose as he watched, and thought he could happily spend the rest of the afternoon like this, soaking up the warmth and listening to the donkeys snort and wicker. But before long, Imra returned with a stack of styrofoam cartons piled in one arm, and two glass bottles of lemonade dangling from his fingertips. He sank down atop a crate and dragged another one over to use as a table, then divvied the cartons between them. Luca pried one open to find a steaming lamb gyro with thick sour cream and chives with salted chips, and in the other an enormous wedge of Sally's blueberry crumble pie. He swallowed back the rush of saliva and hefted the overflowing gyro in both hands to take a massive bite and nearly choked on it, as Imra asked mildly, So, did Sally do something to offend you? Luca coughed, swallowed, then wiped his hand against the back of his mouth, flushing as he stared at Imra, then looked away. So much for that being dropped. She called me your nephew, he muttered, and I corrected her. She was drooling over you. Imra quirked his brows together, looking at Luca oddly as he picked up a thick, crispy chip. She was not. Her mouth was quite dry. When Luca only stared at him, Imra cocked his head quizzically. What? Oh, my God. Luca couldn't help laughing. You're a fucking rock. You have rocks in your fucking head. Your brain is leaking out your beard. How could Imra not? How could he be so... Luca dragged a hand over his face, groaning. Lunk, complete and utter lunk. The cheese isn't the only reason you've got long lines, Imra. It's not. How did you survive to adulthood? Luca sighed, watching Imra fondly. He had the damnedest look on his face, like a giant clunky iron robot frozen struggling to pass data that just wasn't compatible with his system. They're flirting with you. They've all been flirting with you, and you're completely oblivious. Imra colored, flushing deeply underneath tawny skin, and muttered gruffly under his breath. That is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. Don't believe me if you don't want to. Luca grinned and popped a bite of lamb into his mouth. I'm just going to sit back, watch, and laugh. With a sour grumble, Imra looked away. But after a moment, without ever meeting Luca's eyes, he reached for something hidden under one of the styrofoam cartons that Luca hadn't noticed. A delicate purple crocus blossom, pale at its heart, and blending into darker, more vibrant violet along the crinkled edges of its petals. Luca watched curiously, then stilled, chest seizing, as Imra leaned over and tucked the flower into his hair nestling it just above his ear, the cool kiss of its petals brushing his temples, dewed with moisture, the stem weaving into his hair. Those rough fingers grazed his temple, the upper curve of his ear came a breath away from brushing his cheek before Imra withdrew, leaving Lucas staring, frozen, 
a flutter of warmth starting in the centre of his chest and trembling its way up to burst across his face until not even the noonday sun could rival the heat under his skin. Imra? he wanted to ask, but he was too afraid to open his mouth, to let himself think too hard, to wonder what it meant when knowing Imra it might mean nothing at all but an innocent and kindly whim. And Luca couldn't want, couldn't wish, couldn't bear to destroy his own heart again. And so he said nothing, while Imra lowered his gaze, looking almost as though he might be avoiding looking at Luca, as he said, Eat your lunch before the customers start coming back. He picked up his gyro, then added in a low, irritable growl, and there will be nothing to laugh at. 47. There was plenty to laugh at. Luca didn't know how he kept a straight face when, for the rest of the afternoon, Imra was an absolute fucking mess, and it was the most adorable thing Luca had ever seen. He almost felt guilty for pointing out how many of the customers had been flirting with Imra, trying to get his attention, because as people began drifting back to their stall after lunch, in return from calm, graven stone, unshakable and collected, into a clumsy, fumbling wreck. He dropped things. He stammered. He avoided eye contact. He blushed. He ruined receipts, until Luca had to step in and gently take the receipt pad from him and finish ringing a customer up, while Imra glowered sullenly at his feet and stuffed apples in a bag. He was like a boy who didn't know what to do with a love note passed in grade school, all elbows and flustered grouchiness, and Luca had never wanted more than to curl his fingers in that thick, lush beard, tug him down, and kiss him. The ache nestled between his ribs, a quiet thing that was somehow more bearable than before, settling inside him like a precious secret rather than a pernicious infestation with vicious and biting teeth. He kept his laughter to himself when he didn't want to fluster Imra any further, but he couldn't stop smiling, and the more Imra sulked, the broader Luca's grin grew. Though now and then he stopped and touched the flower tucked above his ear and told his heart to hold itself still. Hold itself still, and not take Imra's gentleness and softness for anything more than what they were. He was just finishing with a soft-lipped man, who looked quite disappointed when Luca took over for Imra, who was currently skulking in the back of their stall, pretending to look busy checking the near-empty crates, when a familiar voice rang over the street, calling his name with friendly warmth. Luca! Luca ripped off the receipt copy and passed it to the customer, along with his carefully wrapped jars of honey, then glanced up. Myra wove her way through the thinning afternoon crowds, sunlight shining off her bare shoulders in gleams of gold against brown, her violet and yellow sundress patterned with irises and standing out bright against the pale backdrop of the pavement. She wore her hair down today, and her braids swung against her back and drifted across her face as she drew closer, a wicker shopping basket dangling from one arm and covered by a draped cardigan, the other hand lifting in a wave. Miss Landers, Luca waved back, grinning. Hey, hey, you, and call me Myra. She drifted to a halt before the stall, flicking Luca knowingly amused once over. You haven't broken anything yet. I'm impressed. I am not that much of a helpless city boy. He's been somewhat helpless, Imra tossed out from behind him. Shut it, Imra, Luca growled. He works me like a fucking draft ox. I'm not helpless. Myra laughed. Little hard work is good for anyone. How are the goats? Better, Luca answered. They're still weak, but they're eating solid food and murder stands on her own all the time now. Gia has to lie down more, but she's still okay. Her eyes warmed. I'm sure they're doing that much better for your care. I like it, he admitted shyly, then ducked his head. I like working with them. Aye, maybe you've got a vet in you under that pretty face. Let me know if you're ever looking for an apprenticeship. Really? Excitement prickled through him, and he couldn't stop his grin. I mean, I've not declared for uni yet, but okay, okay. 
Myra chuckled, then transferred her gaze from Luca to Imra. You look like you've had a rough day. Imra prowled to Luca's side, glowering down at Myra. He was still red in the face, his hair a tumbled mess from raking his fingers through it, his beard out of shape from dragging his hand over his face repeatedly. I don't want to talk about it. Lucas smirked. He just figured out half the reason his shite sells so well is because he's gorgeous. Well, you've just ruined the charm of it now. Myra grinned wickedly. Half the fun is that he doesn't even know. Imra made a strangled sound. Fire red darkened the tips of his ears, and he scowled thunderously. I would thank both of you to stop that entirely. Oh, do stop sulking, Myra chuckled, shaking her head, hand on her hip. Look at it this way. Now you've twice the pretty men, twice the business. There's a gaggle of grade school girls who've been giggling and watching Luca for the past half hour and pooling their pennies to see if they can afford an excuse to come over. Luca stiffened. What? Myra cut her eyes to the side with a subtle toss of her head. Luca darted a glance sidelong, and sure enough there was a group of girls in their school uniforms, toying with the straws in their collars and watching him, leaning over and whispering to each other with smiles that ranged from sly to sweet to shy to embarrassed. The one boy in the group wasn't any better, hanging back and ducking his head, but now and then darting a nervous, curious glance at Luca. Smile, pretty thing. Myra teased, and he spluttered, looking away quickly and scowling, hating how hot he immediately bloomed, face boiling. I just, I don't, she leaned in conspiratorially. Don't worry, I won't tell them they aren't your flavor of choice. Wouldn't want to cut into your sails. Luca choked on a sound. He suddenly didn't know what to do with his hands, where to look, and he darted a glance at her at Imra, then down at his fussing fingers, twining them together, before looking back up at her shyly. I, I never told you. The quiet sympathy in Myra's gaze almost undid him. She looked at him with a frank honesty that spoke far louder than any words, and for a moment her eyes flicked to the crocus in his hair before returning to his with a small, understanding smile. You didn't have to, pretty thing, she said. You didn't have to. 48. By the time sunset came, Imra was ready for home. Market days always wore him out. Even if he enjoyed reconnecting with the people he knew in town and from the outlying farms, in the end he was more of a solitary creature than a herd animal, and the energy of social interaction was draining. Home right now was a welcome beacon calling him through the descending night, a promise that kept him moving as he and Luca packed the empty crates and baskets back into the Land Rover, bade their farewells, and buckled in for the drive back to Lohera. Luca was quiet in the passenger's seat, but gone was the tense, hostile, repressed silence of before— this was a silence Imra could live with, comfortable and calm, and tinged with both mutual exhaustion and the mutual satisfaction of a day's hard work. He'd missed that while they'd been busy ignoring each other, dancing around each other, looking anywhere but at each other. And even if they'd still not truly talked through what happened, Luca's soft, I'm sorry, had done much to ease the tension and soothe the raw edges of Imra's hurt. He watched the boy sidelong as he dozed against the window, unfazed by the Land Rover jouncing onto the dirt road just off town. Luca's eyes were almost fully closed, just glints of green in the shadows. He still wore the crocus Imra had impulsively bought from one of the florist's stalls, even though the petals had gone limp and begun to curl hours before. Luca shifted with a drowsy sound, turning his head enough to fix a sleep-soft gaze on Imra. Mm. Everything okay? Imra smiled slightly, turning his gaze back to the road and turning off onto his drive. Everything's fine, Anjuka. We're home. Yawning, Luca pushed himself up, scrubbing at his eyes with gloved fingers. 
The back of his wrist brushed the crocus loose, and he jerked, catching it, his breaths hitching as he tucked it back into place. Imra caught himself lingering on the flush in his cheeks, soft spots of pink, and looked away quickly, just as Luca looked up with wide eyes to catch his gaze. He parked the Land Rover, and together they slipped out. Luca rounded the truck toward the rear, but Imra shook his head and beckoned toward the house. It'll keep. You're tired. We'll unload in the morning. It said everything for how tired Luca was, that he didn't argue with Imra in that way he had, like he was so desperate to prove his worth through hard labor. Imra couldn't help keeping a close eye on him as they stepped into the house. He had that odd hitch to his stride again. Imra didn't know if he should ask, if pricking at Luca's pride would just open that rift that had only begun to heal. But as the lights of the foyer fell over them, he stilled as Luca lifted a hand to tuck his hair back, and Imra glimpsed red on his wrist, seeping from beneath the edge of his glove. A single trickling streak, dried and crusted to his wrist, segmented in cracks that matched the seams in his skin. Blood. Imra frowned, stopping and catching Luca's forearm lightly, looking down at the smear of crimson. Luca, you're bleeding. Eh? Luca looked down, then colored and looked away, face setting oddly, at once guilty and deliberately expressionless. Oh, did you cut yourself? No. Imra frowned, then guided Luca to the kitchen with a light tug and gently nudged him toward the table, before switching the lamps on in a wash of gold. Sit, show me. Luca sank into a chair and scrunched down into his shoulders, slit-eyed gaze fixed glassily to the side. He set his mouth in a tight line, made several wordless sounds under his breath, then slowly peeled one glove off, then the other. Underneath his hands were wrapped from palm to fingertips in gauze, and that gauze was soaked in watery patches of dried blood, pink in some places, rusty in others. A sharp, concussive shock thudded through Imra's chest, and he dropped to one knee, swearing. Bloody hell, he growled, reaching for Luca's hands. Luca started to jerk them back, but Imra caught his wrists, grasping firmly, something fierce brewing inside him, something that made it hard to breathe. Don't you dare, be still. Luca sucked in a hitching sound, biting his lip, but bowed his head with a nod and he held still while Imra peeled away the gauze, working carefully, trying to keep gentle but still wincing when Luca flinched and hissed as his reddened, blistered palms were revealed. They were lacerated, the skin split over and over, half healed, split once more, blood seeping from thin wounds and several puffy blisters just waiting to pop. Imra stared, cradling those slim hands in his, his heart aching and his throat tight. God damn it, Luca. Swallowing audibly, Luca said in a small voice, It's normal. They'll callous and then it won't happen anymore. It's not normal. And suddenly that hitching stride made sense, and Imra cursed himself for not realizing sooner just how long Luca had been forcing himself to work through the pain. Let me see your feet. Luca didn't move, kept his eyes averted, but didn't stop Imra from pulling the laces on his boots and easing his shoes off, setting them aside. He was afraid of what he'd find under the double layers of socks. He stripped away one pair, then the other, to find more bloodied gauze, and beneath that, Luca's soles a raw mess of shredded skin and exposed flesh. Luca. Imra cradled slim ankles carefully, turning Luca's feet to look at the full extent of the damage. Why didn't you tell me? I... I didn't want to bother you. I wanted to be able to work. Luca's lips trembled, and he scrunched himself small. Imra couldn't stand it. He couldn't stand it, and he released Luca's ankles to lay his head in the boy's lap wrapping his arms around his waist and fighting against the burn in his eyes, fighting not to fucking break when his Onyulka had been hurting himself and hadn't trusted Imra enough to take care of him. You stubborn little cat. 
he rasped, pressing his face into Luca's thighs. You never bother me, especially not with this. What if you'd gotten infected? Luca leaned against him after a long moment, and then the back of one soft hand rested against Imra's hair. I cleaned them with alcohol. I should have noticed it was disappearing. Imra closed his eyes, struggling to get himself under control. You're off your feet for the next two weeks. What? He felt more than saw Luca stiffen. But I can still help. Imra pushed himself up, looking up at the boy. Not like this, he said firmly. I won't have you hurt yourself further. Calluses happen when blisters have time to heal. Instead of giving them time to heal, you've just added injury on top of injury. It stops now. Luca's face fell, his eyes brimming. Imra sighed, reaching up to brush his knuckles under the beads welling on the lower curls of dark lashes. All I'm doing is insulating for the winter and moving the chickens to their indoor coop. Luca, I can handle that alone. Stay inside. Rest. I, I don't want to be useless to you. You aren't. Imra offered a smile. Even if you never lifted a finger, you couldn't be. Luca pressed his lips together, then whispered, Can I at least do the house cleaning and cooking? Luca, please. Luca, I will start rattling off the walls, sitting in this house, doing nothing for two straight weeks. Luca smiled shakily. Please, Imra. Very well. But, he held a hand up. Only light work. Nothing that aggravates your hands. If you can do it sitting down, do so. I have a few tall stools in the attic that will reach stove height. I'll bring them down tonight. He could see Luca gearing up for another stubborn assertion in the tightening of his jaw and the spark in his eyes, and cut him off with, Promise me, only light work, and not for a few days after you've started to improve. Luca sighed. I promise. Good. Imra rocked back on his heels, then pushed to his feet. I'll run you a bath with Epsom salts. Should help the wounds drain and dry out, and then we'll clean you up fresh. But I wouldn't argue right now, Luca. Imra looked down into those damp green eyes, his heart twisting. He didn't know if he was furious with Luca, furious with himself, or just falling apart inside at the idea of Luca in pain. But his temper was burning under the surface, anger and concern warring in a chaos of emotion he wasn't accustomed to, didn't know how to channel, and didn't want to tempt with the slightest push when it might explode into something he wasn't ready to deal with. Just don't. Lucas said nothing, watching him with wide eyes, but after a moment he nodded, lashes lowering. Imra brushed his hair back, tucking it so that the soft black strands flowed over the petals of the crocus, then turned and left the room before he gave in to the tempest inside him, and did something he shouldn't. 49. He'd managed to calm himself by the time he finished running Luca's bath in the downstairs bathroom, staying close to continuously test the temperature of the water so it would be warm enough to soothe but not hot enough to burn, slowly sifting in a box of Epsom salts and dissolving them in with his fingers until the box was empty. He rummaged in the cabinet then, digging through his rather large array of various bath salts and oils. He didn't often have time for long, hot soaks, but sometimes he liked them after a hard, sore day, or on a frigid winter evening, and the various blends of aromas and textures from the salts and oils helped him relax, drift. He thought now they might help Luca's hands and feet, and he squinted at labels until he found the bottle of pure aloe extract, sea salts, and a bottle of thick tea tree oil. He dumped them into the bath, then swirled it together into an aromatic, steaming mix, little clear pools of oil making iridescent dots on the surface, then dried his hands on a towel and returned to the kitchen. Luca was still huddled miserably in the chair, legs tucked against his side and his hands curled in his lap. Imra sighed, shaking his head fondly as he drew closer and took a knee next to the chair, holding out his arms. 
Come on now. Luca lifted his head, blinking. What? You don't have to carry me. You're not walking on those feet until at least tomorrow. Bandages or socks right now will just make things worse until those blisters have dried out overnight. And since I'll not have you barefoot and stepping into an infection? Imra cocked a brow. Looks like I'm your legs tonight. Plucking at his lower lip, Luca lingered on Imra with a heart-rending look of wide-eyed uncertainty, searching his face before his lashes lowered in a sweep and he leaned in, slipping his arms around Imra's neck. Imra slid his arms underneath Luca's back and knees, and, hands full of soft, sweet-smelling young man, lifted up to his feet. An immediate surge of warmth shot through him to the deepest depths of his stomach, and he inhaled his breath and held it, trying not to drug himself on Luca's scent. He'd thought with the distance he was over this, but the second he had Luca in his arms, head nestled against his shoulder, and breaths fingering through his beard and lashes brushing his throat, that hard, hot feeling pierced his heart once more, and he fought not to think of the taste of raspberry lips or the feeling of slender fingers in his hair, husky voice whispering, Imra, Imra, please. He swallowed roughly and thought instead of Marco, saying, Imra, you fucking asshole! how could you? As he turned to carry Luca into the bathroom. Sinking down, he set him lightly atop the toilet lid, kneeling once more to look at him eye level. Do you need help undressing? Will it hurt your hands? Luca shook his head quickly, clearing his throat. I can handle it. He stared at the bath. You... That smells nice. You did that for me. Of course I did that for you. But you're upset with me. Not with you, no. Imra sighed, propping his forearm on his knee. I'm upset with myself for not noticing before. I'm upset that I was so intent on giving you your space to work things out that I let you work yourself raw like this. Bowing his head, Luca fidgeted at the hem of his T-shirt. I should have said something sooner. You should have, but this was on both of us. Imra brushed his fingers beneath Luca's chin, coaxing those green eyes up to meet his. We live together, we work together, which means we can't do this again. If something happens, we talk to each other, instead of dancing around each other, all right? All right. Yet still, those words waited unsaid between them, those questions. Still, as they looked at each other, there lingered the memory of a kiss, a quiet, desperate plea, and whispered emotions that Imra needed to believe had been the liquor talking and nothing else. He knew he should say something, follow his own advice, clear the air. But some secret part of him, some terrible, dishonorable part of him, couldn't stand it if Luca said, Oh, I, sorry, I didn't mean it, I was just pissed out of my mind. And so he only smiled and leaned in to press his lips to Luca's forehead. Chaste, always chaste, even if he breathed him in for a moment before pulling back. I'll be just in the kitchen making dinner. Call me if you need help with anything. Okay, was all Luca said, even if those soft syllables seemed to promise something more in the hitch of his voice, in the sigh of his breaths. Okay. Leave. Imra told himself. But still it was long moments before he stood and let himself out into the kitchen. 50. Luca listened to the sounds of Imra moving away for long moments before he started to peel out of his clothing gingerly, awkward with only his fingertips. It probably would have been easier to let Imra do it, but right now he was too raw to handle the idea of those rough hands stripping him naked after those rough words had already left him bare. Imra's head in his lap, that choke in his voice. He almost wanted to hate Imra for caring so fucking much because it made it that much harder to stop loving him. Luca left his clothing in a pile on the floor then lowered himself carefully into the bath. The warm water stung at first, and he hissed as he settled against the side, submerging his hands and feet and waiting for the ache to stop. 
He sank down until the water rose up over his chin and stopped just below his nostrils, letting him breathe in the warm, tingling scents rising on curls of steam to envelop him and ease his rattled nerves. He had to stop letting Imra get under his skin. There was something wrong with him, he thought. He couldn't ever be satisfied with things that would make most people content. He had a solid path to university and a career of his choosing, if he'd just choose, and he'd rather throw it all away to drift between pillar and post, not even sure where the days and nights went in a haze of circling thoughts and clouds of smoke and the buzz of beer or gin or whatever the fly-by-night friends he'd had in Sheffield pressed into his hand that day. He had Imra's friendship, something he'd thought he'd ruined, and still... Still, he wanted more. Fucking knob, he muttered, only it came out in bubbles that rose to the surface and popped, and with a groan he sank down in the water until it closed over his head and let himself drift. He remained like that until he couldn't breathe any more, then surfaced and reached for a flannel to slough the water off his face. As he rose from the water, the wilted crocus came loose from his hair, floating along the surface. He caught it and set it gingerly aside on the toilet lid. He felt better, at least, soaking in the soothing water and letting it ease away the burn of his shredded flesh. He could have ruined his hands if he'd kept going like this. He was a knob and a wanker. He stared down at his reddened palms, the broken skin puckered and white above pink flesh. Myra had said he was good with the animals. So had Imra. These hands had helped piece sick animals back together. Maybe, maybe that was what he wanted, what he wanted to do. And if he'd cocked up his hands, he could have ruined that before he'd ever had a chance to try. Knob, wanker, and a shite, he hissed, then growled and settled to scrubbing himself off. When he was done, he pulled the stopper from the tub and watched the water swirl down the drain, leaving him damp and shivering and curled in the bath. He wasn't supposed to stand up, but he was bloody naked and... Oh, fuck. He reached over to snag the massive, thick bath towel Imra had left atop the toilet and draped it around himself like a cloak, pulling his knees up to his chest. He felt fucking pathetic, but... Imra? He called tentatively. A few moments later, Imra's shadow appeared under the bathroom door. Everything all right? I are just... Luca cleared his throat. I'm done, and you told me not to walk. A particularly lengthy silence followed. Then, are you decent? He hunched into the towel. Got a towel over me? The door creaked open, almost warily. Imra peered inside, then relaxed and stepped in further, and crossed to sit on the edge of the tub. I'll take you up to your room and leave you to dress, then bring your dinner in bed. Does that sound fair? Luca wrinkled his nose. I know I sound a rat prat, but I don't want to eat alone in my room like it's punishment at boarding school. You don't sound a prat, Imra said with a chuckle. All right, I'll bring you back down after you've dressed, and we can eat in the living room. We can even watch a film. Better? You don't have a telly. You aren't the only one with a laptop, Pratt. That's still a lot of toting me around. You weigh less than a feather. And then Imra's fingertip was pressed lightly to the tip of Luca's nose, leaving him crossing his eyes, staring at the coarse ridge of his knuckle. Those are the only options. I want to fetch and carry for you, even if what I'm fetching and carrying is you. So, bed, or let me talk you about. You can pick one, but no more excuses for either. Lucas scowled and snapped his teeth at that finger. I told you you're not my father. Not even close. What I am, however, is a friend who knows your shite for what it is, and won't let you hurt yourself any further. You know my shite, eh? Luca eyed him sidelong then snorted. All right, living room. I pick option B. Then let's get you out of that tub so you can stop shivering like a wet kitten and get you into some clothing. Before Luca could protest, heated arms slid around him, 
muscles straining against the seams of today's Henley, pale grey this time, and enveloping him in molten stone with nothing between him and Imra but the towel that barely wrapped around him enough to be decent, his bare arse an inch away from touching open air, his legs completely exposed and draped over Imra's arm. Luca froze, heart constricting and palpitating in erratic shudders and clutched at the towel, arranging it over himself and drawing it tighter, and trying so very hard not to. Not to anything. He risked a glance up at Imra, as Imra carried him from the bathroom with hardly a moment to snag the crocus before he was out of reach, but Imra was looking over his head, gaze focused ahead on their path. Calm, always so calm but there was something about the taut line of his throat and the set of his shoulders and the way his fingers bit just a little into Luca's naked thigh that built a whispering, quiet tension Luca didn't understand. Whatever it was, it made his gut quiver and his breath shallow. He'd never felt so small and vulnerable as he did near naked in Imra's arms. And yet he'd never felt so safe either. He bit his lip, taking these moments, these moments when some silent intuition told him Imra wouldn't, couldn't look at him, to drink Imra in again, re-imprint the subtle elegance and rough, wild beauty of his face, his body, the way he carried himself when Luca had refused to let himself look for weeks. His heart slowed, his breath stilled. And when Imra looked down at him as they crested the stairs, Time stopped in a single sweet moment when Imra offered a faint, distracted smile, and Lucas smiled back, tucking his head underneath Imra's jaw and letting himself lean. He clung to that comfortable moment for a few seconds longer, until Imra elbowed his bedroom door open and set him down carefully on the bed. Neither said a word, while Imra checked the drawers of the bureau and fished out a clean pair of boxes and one of the large oversized T-shirts Luca liked to sleep in. He set them on the bed at Luca's hip, then straightened, searching him discerningly. No socks, no gloves, no gauze, he said. I was serious. You need to let the wounds air and dry. Try not to come into contact with anything that will stick to the raw areas. Call for me when you're ready to come down, he arched a brow. Unless you'd like me to dress you too. No, thought not, independent little cat. Imra smirked. I'll be finishing dinner. He turned away but paused when Luca called after him. Imra? Hm? Luca hesitated, meeting that one blue eye turned over Imra's shoulder. Why am I a cat now? and not your angel any more? You're still my angel. You will always be Ongyulka. Imra's gaze softened. But that doesn't change that you're stubborn and independent, fickle and ferocious, playful and petulant as a cat. You move like a cat. You've grown into yourself, and you stretch and slink into long limbs like a feline thing, leggy and delicate. Whatever answer he'd been expecting... It wasn't that. Luca made an odd sound in the back of his throat. He wasn't even sure what it was trying to be, when words weren't quite working, and it felt like the flutter in his stomach was trying to climb up onto his tongue. He ducked his burning face away from Imra, scowling. Damn that man and his bluntness, his honesty, his... his... his complete and utter oblivion to what things like that could do to Luca. The way he just casually tossed something like that out, with no idea that his every word had the power to bind Luca up in its coils and make him feel at once beautiful and wretched. Oh, just get out, he growled, scowling at his knees. Imra chuckled. His Majesty's wish is my command, he said, and disappeared out into the hall. Fucking ass. Luca muttered, staring down at the crocus still caught in his fingertips, then snagged his clean T-shirt and buried his face into it, and screamed, muffling the sound to a muted groan. God damn it, Imra! 51. By the time Luca called for him again, Imra had laid out plates and drinks on the coffee table, 
stoked the fireplace, and dug his laptop out from under the desk in his ill-used office. He didn't use it for much other than tracking breeding lines, yields, harvest and planting dates, breeding and kidding dates, and supply orders, but he had a Netflix subscription. Not that he could remember the password, but he'd figure it out in a minute. Imre drifted down the stairs, with that subtle plaintive note that Imre couldn't help but smile at. Prideful little monster. It wasn't hard to see he couldn't stand imposing on Imre like this, but he wasn't quite seeming to grasp how little Imre minded. Even if, when he could still feel the warmth of Luca's naked, damp body enveloped in a towel, he was trying very hard not to suspect his own motives. Come in, he called, and took the steps two at a time to Luca's room. Luca curled on the bed, dressed in his pyjamas with his knees drawn up, carefully not clasping his hands, and just as carefully letting his feet dangle over the edge by his heels. Clean and dry, they didn't look nearly so terrifying, and Imra let go of a little of the worry that had been curdling and stewing inside him. How are you feeling? Better, Luca mumbled against his knees. The bath was nice. Good. I'll fetch the aspirin so you can have a few with dinner. Should help. Ready to go down? Uh, uh, informative. Imra bent over Luca and gathered up the bundle of boy into his arms. Up you go, then. As Imra straightened, Luca let out a little yelp before those slender arms came around his neck. Luca's wrist pressed against Imra's throat, and through that thin, fine skin, the soft flutter of the boy's pulse moved against Imra's neck in time with his own heartbeat, a shudder and throb of blood pounding through his veins. Imra could feel Luca watching him as he carried him out into the hall and down the stairs. It was almost strange how he always knew. Even during those silent weeks, he'd known the moment his back was turned that those pale green eyes were on him, connecting them in ways that tugged and tore at him and made it impossible for him to ever stray too far away. What are you doing, Imra? He dragged his thoughts back on track and glanced down at Luca meeting those wide eyes with a smile, before veering into the living room and settling him down in the corner of the deep, yielding sofa, right in the nest of quilt Simra had layered against the leather. He wrapped the blankets around Luca's shoulders, then pulled back and headed back up the stairs, taking the steps quickly to duck into the bathroom and fetch the aspirin from the cabinet. He swung back through the kitchen and picked up two trays with steaming, deep bowls of lamb stew and fresh-baked bread with a buttery, crisp crust, balanced next to hot mugs of tea. When he returned to the living room, Luca had tucked himself up in a ball again, hiding his hands and feet underneath the blankets. The click of claws on stone warned before Vila and Shetty came swarming in, tumbling over each other and then spilling themselves onto the rug before the fire, sprawling out in a tangle of black and white, with their tongues lolling and tails swishing. Imra set his tray down on the coffee table, then unfolded the legs of the other and placed it carefully over Luca's lap. Luca shifted enough to fit his legs underneath it, and flashed him a brief, rather pensive smile. Imra settled down next to him, twisted the cap off the aspirin bottle, and set it down on Luca's tray. Comfortable? Hmm, Luca answered with that same distracted smile, and reached for the bottle. He tilted his head back, shook a few pills into his mouth, then reached for the tea mug. Imra had deliberately made the tea cooler than normal so the mug wouldn't burn Luca's palms, but still when the boy winced, eyes twitching at the corners as he lifted the mug to his lips and swallowed a gulp, it took everything in Imra not to snatch the mug from his raw fingers and cradle it to Luca's lips for him. "'Can you handle a spoon?' he asked as Luca set the mug down. With a nod, Luca picked up the carved wooden soup spoon. Hold it between my fingers like this, see? He positioned it so the handle of the spoon was clasped between his index and middle fingers, resting primarily against the unblistered sides and supported by the edge of his thumb. Been doing it for weeks. Imra set his jaw, glowering at him, fighting back the growl building in his chest. 
weeks. Luca had been in pain for weeks, hadn't said a word, and Imra hadn't even noticed. Luca winced, hunching into his shoulders and flashing a sheepish smile. Sorry. If I have to watch you like a hawk to keep this from happening again, I will. It won't happen again, Luca promised, and Imra arched a brow. Luca laughed. It won't. I'll be good. I'm not even convinced you're capable. Am I really so terrible to put up with? Luca's lower lip thrust out. No. Imra sighed, and rested his hand to the top of that silky head of messy hair. And I am never just putting up with you, Ang Yuka. Luca beamed, then scooped a bite of stew into his mouth. Imra chuckled and settled his tray at his hip, keeping it in easy reach, but leaving his lap free for his laptop. In between stealing bites and listening to the faint click of Luca's dishware, Imra woke the laptop up and pulled up the desktop Netflix app, typed in his email, then took a stab at his password. Username or password incorrect, please retry. Forgot your password? He frowned. He'd set up this account some five years ago on a different computer that had saved the password for him, and he'd promptly forgotten it. He usually wrote his passwords in Romany, if only because they were less likely to be in common language lexicons used to test accounts for vulnerabilities and crack them. But everything he could think of, clover, apples, goats, family, all words that represented something important to him, something he'd remember, didn't work. Luca leaned over, peering at the screen, a one-sided grin tugging at his mouth. Sure you know how that thing works? Imra stared at him flatly. You finished? Nope. I forgot my password. Use the password retrieval link. Hmm. Imra scowled and picked up a bite of his stew instead, and Luca laughed, sweet and bright. Imra, are you being stubborn? Hmm. I thought goats were stubborn, not giant oxen. I am not an ox. Don't you start. Imra eyed him sourly, but at least he was laughing. That laughter seemed a balm on everything, and Imra was beginning to realize he'd do anything to hear it. With a grumble, he clicked the forgot your password, then typed in his email address before tabbing over to his mail client to watch for the reset link. What do you want to watch? Dunno. Luca wriggled over, edging closer and pushing his tray with his thighs and elbows. I kind of like those historical things, like I think there's a new one on Netflix with Jason Momoa. Who? Big guy? Aquaman? Who? Luca let out a long, slow sigh. He's tall and tan and has a beard and long hair, and he's really fucking hot. One look and it's like, whoo! Imra cocked his head, idly toying with his beard. I could be convinced to watch this. Thought you said you don't like men like you. I have varied and nuanced tastes. Imra eyed the little wretch. And he sounds nothing like me. Uh-huh. Luca just smirked in that maddening way of his. Got your password yet? Brat. But the email was there in Imra's inbox, and he clicked the link. A few taps, and he'd reset his password to Angulka. At least that he wouldn't forget. The Netflix browsing window welcomed him far too cheerfully, before blooming into an array of tiled title cards in bright colors. There. Oh, my God, Imre! Luca made a choked, amused sound, staring at the screen. The last thing in your watched queue is Fraser? Imre scowled. I like Niles. You're so old, and I love it. Laughing, Luca reached for the laptop. Give. Skeptical, Imra handed the laptop over. He couldn't help but marvel at how Luca handled it with the edges of his hands, keeping his fingers spread away, before maneuvering the touchpad and keyboard with his curled knuckles. Luca was nothing if not ingenuity in the face of sheer prideful stubbornness. Brad. He watched while Luca found the series he wanted, then pulled up the page. Ready? Aye, if that's what you want to watch. It is, Lucas said firmly, setting the laptop on the coffee table at the midpoint between them. 
and then promptly tucking himself against Imra's side, snuggling against him in a mess of blankets and lanky limbs. Imra froze, looking down at Luca. Luca tipped his head back, eyes wide and a little too innocent, a little smile playing about his lips. So we can both see, he said. You don't mind, do you, Imra? Imra groaned. He didn't know what the hell had gotten into Luca tonight, but that little imp was going to be the death of him. No, Onyulka, he said. I don't mind. With a happy sound, Luca burrowed against him and dragged his tray over to balance on one tucked-up thigh. Sighing, Imra stretched his arm along the back of the couch and turned his gaze to the laptop screen as the opening credits began to roll. He wasn't quite sure he understood the show, something about the colonial fur trade and the big bloke, Momoa, Luca had called him, fighting for a place and livelihood among settlers who wanted to crowd him out? Maybe. But it passed the time, and by the time the first episode had ended, they'd both finished eating and set their trays aside. Imra sank down to relax a bit deeper into the couch, and in response, Luca shifted down to rest his head in Imra's lap, pillowing his cheek against his thigh, this light warmth that drew Imra's attention no matter how he tried to ignore it. And it seemed only natural to let his hand drift from the back of the couch to rest on Luca's waist. Beneath the blankets, Luca's body dipped into a smooth curve, a cradle that seemed made for the curl of Imra's fingers to fit just so, to find their way into the dips and hollows of his hip bones and stomach and settle there, with Luca's soft, shallow breaths lifting and lowering his fingertips. Those breaths seemed too loud, as if the laptop's noise had faded to just a whisper, and the crackle of the hearth was nothing more than a sigh. The only sound in the room was Luca's breathing, and the dull, dreaming thud of Imra's heart. Luca shifted onto his back, his warm weight moving against Imra's thigh. His shirt caught on Imra's fingers with the movement, until the fabric rumpled upward and suddenly it was bare skin under Imra's palm, his spreading fingers. Bare skin and pure, radiant heat. A smoothness like wet silk moulded over lean sinew. A sweetness that soaked up into his palm and held him as though he were melded, flesh to flesh, with Luca. He stared dazedly down where his hand pressed, skin to skin. To Luca's body, a hazed and drugged slowness entering his thoughts, holding them back until his mind ran apace with a sluggish heart that would linger and mew over these moments forever and always, holding a few seconds fast for a lifetime. So pale, he thought. Luca was so pale, his skin's sweet crescents between the dark splay of Imra's fingers. As though Imra's touch were fine, gleaming wood stain, painted against glistening white ash branches. Imra? Luca whispered, voice trembling, coming to him through that dream-soft haze as though speaking through water. Imra dragged his gaze to Luca's face, to those wide, confused green eyes, to those flushed cheeks, to parted raspberry lips, moving and sighing with every swift breath. His mouth ached as he lingered on those lips, as he parted his own to speak, but nothing came forth. If he spoke, reason would assert itself. If he spoke, reality would pull him back from a trembling edge that seized the breaths in his lungs and held him teetering on the verge of giving in to something hungering and wicked and terrible. Luca swallowed, his throat working, his lips closing and then parting again on a delicate dart of his tongue. That pink, pink tongue, and Imra followed its every movement, the wet sheen glistening behind. Luca, he breathed, his name a sweetling caught in Imra's throat. With a soft, almost frightened sound, Luca sat up, until they sat shoulder pressed to shoulder, Luca's arm caught against Imra's chest, his stomach still burning under Imra's palm. Too close, something in Imra's mind warned. Too close, when those raspberry lips were just inches away, tempting him from over the curve of Luca's shoulder. 
The boy's gaze dipped to Imra's mouth, as though he could follow this wanton and wretched train of thought, and that honeysuckle scent dizzied Imra like wine as Luca leaned closer. What's wrong? Luca asked softly. Why are you looking at me that way? Because, Imra thought distantly, and answered that question not with his words, but with his lips. Were his thoughts not so slow, they might have caught up to the moment and seen it for what it was. Were they not so slow, they might have halted him in his tracks, taken firm rein of his body and his impulses to stop him before he could even move. Were they not so slow, they would have reminded him of those gentle words of caution. Be careful. Myra, both his conscience and his voice of reason, where both seemed to have deserted him but his thoughts were left far behind. As he leaned in and caught that soft, overripe mouth and tasted it the way it begged to be tasted, teasing its curves in savouring nibbles just to feel its plushness, and how it gave and parted and let him sink into each pillow-soft, yielding caress. And when Luca leaned into him with a low, breathy moan, Imra was completely and utterly lost. Every ounce of desire he'd bottled for weeks built into a bursting swell and flooded him, breath and body and bone, until he was caught on its racing tide and swept along, swept under, plunged into a drowning, submersive heat that immersed him head to toe in every sense of Luca. The warmth of that slim body pressed against his own, the lissom grace of long arms slipping around his neck. The rush of Luca's pulse against Imra's palm, as he curled his hand against his throat, stroking his fingers back into the soft tangles of hair at the nape of his neck, and the taste of his mouth, the taste, the scent, the warmth and wetness of his lips, his tongue, as Imra groaned and sought deep, so deep, as if within the heat of Luca's mouth he could find the secret that left his heart so completely at the mercy of such a slight, fragile wisp of a boy. This was too raw, too real, cutting him open and leaving him tender inside, every sensation too intense to endure, as though he were an open wound of sheer emotion, and every shy, darting taste of Luca's tongue, every soft sound the boy made, touched that wound and left Imra vibrating with the sharp, searing shocks of pure, perfect, overwhelming pain. Never had the pleasure of a kiss, a consuming, breathless, tight-locked kiss of such lusciously slow sweetness, been such pain, tearing him open and bleeding him out. And he would bleed every drop out for Luca, for this feeling. He would rip himself to shreds, let himself be torn apart by the silent hurricane inside him, this soundless tempest, this whirlwind whisper of delicate touches that struck with a hammer's blow. He would destroy himself for this kiss. But he would not destroy Luca. And in the race between his common sense and his impulse, his common sense finally caught up, then overtook him and blocked his way, a stolid wall of disapproval warning him against going any further. His gut wrenched at the thought of parting. Luca tasted of every honeyed intoxication Imra could ever imagine, and he wondered if his fascination was because that kiss was forbidden, or because he desperately wanted it not to be. Luca, he whispered, then stopped and filled his mouth with one last taste, one last savouring moment to draw that delectable lower lip into his mouth and capture it in his teeth and suckle it as though he could glean every last hint of flavour from it and keep it for himself. No, no, he had to stop, had to think reason, think sense. He was not a man given to rash behaviour, and he was stepping outside of everything he had ever known of himself, watching himself from afar as he did things and desired things that belonged to an Imra Claiborne other than the one he recognised in the mirror each morning. He made himself part from Luca's mouth, from Luca's gasping, pliant eagerness. That succulent mouth was swollen to reddened fullness, glistening. Luca's dark lashes lowered, his pale skin blooming all the way down to his throat, and 
God, he was so lovely, Imra just wanted to keep him this way. But he couldn't. Regret and shame soured the heat in his gut, turned it into a curdled mess churning in the pit of his stomach. Luca was so vulnerable right now. And Imra had forgotten himself, taken advantage, and violated not just Luca's trust, but Marco's. I can't, he forced out, the words like thorns gouging inside his throat. He stroked his thumb along Luca's jaw, taking him in while he could. Luca, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have done that. Luca's eyes drifted open. For a moment, dazed, a hazed and beautiful shade darkened, as though a thousand clouds reflected off the surface of a clear green pool. Then they sharpened, clarified, as Luca's brows knit together, the lax, soft line of his mouth tightening. Then why did you? He bit off. Because I... Imra swallowed. I cannot explain it. Please, please tell me you understand, Ong Yuka. Tell me you understand why I can't. Every drop of emotion drained from Luca's face. That flush melted away to leave pale skin as white as ice. Luca just stared at him. It would almost have been preferable had that gaze been accusatory, angry, condemning Imra for the louse he was. But more than anything, Luca just looked tired. I understand, Luca said quietly then looked away, gaze fixing on the laptop screen, the TV show that was churning on without a care for the tension stretched on a thin cord between them. Nothing else. Just that, and something curled up small in Imra's chest and hurt, this shriveled and tangled little knot. Marco is my dearest and oldest friend, he continued, and even to him it sounded weak. You are his son. I said I understand. Luca pulled away from him, that warmth leaving him as Luca settled at his side once more, wrapping himself up in the blanket. Still his voice was too quiet, too calm, too even, even as he said, You don't need to grind it in. I'm not trying to. Imra spread his hands. Helplessness hovered over him like a guillotine that would never fall, leaving him perpetually trapped, afraid to move one way or the other. I'm sorry. I don't know how to deal with this. This is outside the realm of my experience. Yeah, mine too. Luca's lashes swept down. He took a deep breath. His mouth trembled for a moment, then firmed. You kissed me first this time, Imra, and we're both sober. I know, and again, I apologize. Silence. Silence that broke Imra's heart, that made him afraid he'd ruined their relationship once more, that made him afraid he'd destroyed Luca's trust. Luca remained motionless for so very long, until he took another deep breath, visibly gathered himself, and looked up at Imra his gaze so very weary but his wry, self-deprecating smile genuine, no matter how small. It's all right, Luca murmured. Let's just be friends, and it'll be okay. He shrugged, shoulders a touch stiff, then looked away again with a low, sheepish laugh. Promise I won't sulk for another month if you don't. I don't sulk. Imra shot back without thinking, and Luca's laughter strengthened. Keep telling yourself that, Imra. He sighed, tilting his head back against the couch. I have no idea what's going on. Want to start the episode over? Imra met Luca's eyes, searching, asking a question even he wasn't wholly sure of. Part of him couldn't believe it was this easy. Part of him didn't want it to be this easy when he was raging inside, tearing at himself with claws of guilt and longing, leaving nothing of his heart but shredded ribbons. But if he was to bleed, he would rather bleed alone. And if Luca was all right, good. At least they'd talked, somewhat. At least it was out in the open. Luca had said he'd understood. Imra only needed to let it go and move on, if he even knew how. 52.
It was a point of pride, Luca thought, that he didn't break down sobbing and beg Imre to kiss him that way again, and again and again and again, until this unquenchable thirst was finally slaked, until he was drunk and sated on Imre. On his kiss, on the way it felt when Imre looked at him just that way, and took him into his arms and rested those hot, broad hands against Luca's naked skin. But he didn't. Because Imre couldn't. Because Luca was too young. Because Luca was Marco's son and not a real person with an identity, needs, longings of his own. Because Luca was... Luca was... Luca was what Luca wasn't, and what Luca wasn't was enough for Imra. He was tired of sobbing and wailing over that, tired of hating himself for it. It was just what it was, and one day he'd get over it. He'd rather be Imra's friend than have nothing at all, and maybe one day, one day they'd look back on this and laugh. But on this day, as he stared at the laptop screen, and tried to make himself focus on the story and not the man at his side. All he could do was hurt. Hurt and bottle it all up like he was hoarding it for himself, because it was too precious to give to anyone else. He'd thought it had burned, to humiliate himself by throwing himself at Imra only to be rebuffed as unwanted, undesirable. But the truth was even worse, and that scorched much deeper branding and scarring his aching heart, because the truth was that Imra did want him, yet refused to see him as more than every reason why he shouldn't. 53. Diary of a housebound prat, day 12, Luca muttered into his phone as he scrubbed around the burners on the stove with a toothbrush. The massive oaf I live with is growing entirely too spoiled. He doesn't wipe his feet proper on the mat. He leaves his dirty laundry on the bathroom rack like I'm supposed to just pick it up. This morning he had the nerve to ask if I knew where his blue argyle socks were. Does the shite fancy me a bloody housewife? Oh, like you'd complain, Xavier piped from the phone laughing. You practically are the doting little husband. Just need to consummate, eh? Lucas snorted, propping the phone against his ear and turning to rinse the toothbrush in the sink, scrubbing it free of black grime with his thumb. This stove looked like it hadn't had a proper deep cleaning in all its cracks and crevices in years. Then again, most of Imra's house was like that. Clean on the surface, but missing all those little touches like wiping down the upper edges of the baseboards or dusting the top sides of the living room ceiling fan blades. Imra had kept it plenty tidy, but he'd never gotten it the kind of clean that happened when you cooped a nineteen-year-old boy up in the house and told him he couldn't do anything more strenuous than cooking and cleaning. And by the time Luca was done, he'd be able to see his reflection in the wrought iron of the stove burner covers. No consummating happening here, he said. Don't even put that thought into my head. Oh, still no luck. Can't have luck for something I'm not even trying for. Xavier let out a dry laugh. Giving up so easily. I just... Luca wrinkled his nose, checked the toothbrush, then set to scrubbing at the next burner, pausing only to shift his grip when the toothbrush handle pressed into one of the still tender spots on his mostly healed fingers. I'm not sticking my hand in that fire again, you know. Things are better when we're friends. We talk. We're there for each other, instead of being awkward and weird. We're honest with each other, and overall, just try to be good to each other. Or that's what Luca had told himself over the last two weeks. Imra, Imra was always Imra. Kind to him, gentle. He spoke when Luca wanted to speak, didn't when Luca wanted quiet or solitude. It had mostly been up to Luca how normal he wanted things to be. And so he'd decided right then and there, sitting on that couch with Imra looking at him like he'd just desecrated a shrine, that he'd rather hold on to the good things than keep reaching for what was impossible, when wanting the impossible could ruin what made their friendship work. And it had worked, for the most part. He teased Imra, and Imra teased him back. They laughed over the dog's antics together, and Imra Mock chided him for sneaking Shetty and Vila tidbits from whatever Luca was making for dinner. 
and after dinner every night they stood side by side over the sink, Imra washing, Luca drying, their arms brushing while Imra quietly caught him up on how the animals were doing, what needed to be done next, as if Luca was a part of the farm and needed to know every plan and everything Lohera needed. He liked that. He liked feeling like he was an integral part of Lohera, and he didn't want to lose that for the short time he had it. So it was only in the dark of night, curled in his bed alone, that he touched his lips and remembered that moment of heated pressure, and how Imra had pulled him close and stolen his breath and set his world on fire. So, Zave mused, that sounds a hell of a lot like what you'd want in a relationship, eh? That kind of thing's good between boyfriends, innit? You can have those things in a friendship without it being about sex or love or any some such. Look at you, sounding all mature. Baby boy grew up when I wasn't looking. I did no such thing. Luca propped his hip against the counter, exhaling and wiping the back of his wrist across his brow. A few strands of his hair had escaped the handkerchief he'd tied over it and tickled annoyingly in the film of sweat forming on his skin. Look, I'm just trying to be sensible about things. People fall in love all the time with people who don't love them back. You'd have to be a fucking ass to throw away a good friendship over something like that. He shrugged, idly tapping the toothbrush against his elbow. So I'm not trying to be an ass, even if it hurts sometimes. Love hurts, Zave sang, merrily and entirely off-key, his voice cracking on every change in note. Love scars! Love wounds and marks. Luca winced. So does your singing voice. Aren't you Mr. Chuckles today, cheeky fucker? Zave huffed. Speaking of wounds and marks, how are you healing up? Better. Mostly healed over. Just a couple of tender spots. Imra's not letting me off the hook a single day early, though. Someone's got to put a curb on your self-destructive rampage, eh? Luca turned back to the stove. I'm not self-destruct. He froze as he caught a glimpse of motion through the kitchen window, then leaned forward, rising up on his stocking toes to peer out through the curtains. Little, wispy, feathery flakes fell down out of a clouded, heavy sky, catching on the wind and swirling briskly side to side, before cartwheeling downward again and leaving white speckles across the dirt of the barnyard, the grass of the fields beyond, the roof of the barn. Luca caught a breath, grinning. It's snowing. No way, not fair. It's bare and spare here. Yeah. No, it's... Ah, I didn't think first snow would be this soon. Even if he'd caught hints of it in the past few days, the darkening skies, a certain whiff on the air, like breathing in pure metallic ice. Luca bounced on the balls of his toes, then dropped the toothbrush and padded for the door to stuff his feet into his boots. I'll talk to you later. Gonna run out and make snow angels? Zave asked. Maybe, maybe. Luca laughed, wiggling his boots up over his ankles and tugging the laces just tight enough to make them stay. I need to go. The animals are outside and Imra might need help and I, I, I just need to go. Xavier laughed indulgently. Bye, fuckface. Bye, Luca said, then shoved his phone into his pocket and spilled outside. Tiny flakes struck him immediately, peppering all over his body like little ice kisses, and he laughed, stopping just past the door and tilting his face up to the sky. Cold wind cut razors through his T-shirt and jeans and turned his entire body into a rash of goose pimples, but he ignored it with a pleased sigh as he closed his eyes and just let those delicate, fragile little kisses pepper over his cheeks and melt against his skin. He'd always loved first snow, and Sheffield had had some right blizzards, but it wasn't quite the same when they fell over blocky buildings and cars and streets and the tiny useless patch of yard at the house, while the buildings funneled the wind until the snow fell in clumps and channels and bars. He'd missed this kind of snow, just an endless swirl across endless fields, quiet and peaceful, and bringing with it a silence that fell one flake at a time, to blanket the world. He opened his eyes, licking melted snowflakes from his lips and breathing out frosted smoke. 
The momentary question of where would Imra be was answered by the distant figure he made atop the closest hill, standing with his close-fit, wool-lined leather jacket buttoned snug around him, feet planted, hands in his pockets while he looked out over the rolling dales. Luca wrapped his arms around himself, rubbing cold arms with even colder fingers, and skipped across the yard to vault the fence and climb the hill. He stopped at Imra's side, gazing out over the fields. From this high he could see the goats in their far-off pasture, prancing and kicking and snorting at the flakes landing on them as if they were either utterly offensive or the most delightful toys they'd ever seen. It's snowing, he murmured, and immediately felt an utter tit for stating the obvious. Imra's lips twitched at the corners. So I see. His shoulders were dusted with snow against the dark leather of his jacket, dotted snowflakes mingling into the silver and white and deep steely grey of his hair and beard, making them seem all the paler until the blue beads braided in stood out bright. He turned his head toward Luca. You're not wearing a jacket. I'm not cold. He laughed, holding a hand out to catch snowflakes in his palm. They wouldn't stick. They melted on contact with his skin until he held a palmful of snow dew. It's so pretty. I wanted to come see. Country snow isn't like city snow. Imra inclined his head with an amused sound. It is lovely. Are you going to bring the goats in? If it holds through the end of the hour, yes, and I think it will. Imra squinted up at the sky. It's looking like we'll have fairly heavy snow for the next week. Those clouds are full enough to drop a litter, and I don't trust the look of them. We should insulate the barns and be prepared to be snowed in within the next few days. Luca groaned, slumping. Don't tell me we'll be trapped inside the house. This is the first time I've tasted fresh air in weeks. Not completely. We'll put up covered walkways to the barns. Should only take a day or two to get it done, but it's best to do it before we truly need it. The animals will still need our care, even in a blizzard, though we should lay in extra wood and kerosene at the house, put out extra feed and water in the event we're trapped inside, and check the backup generator in case the power cuts to the barn's heating systems. It wasn't hard to tell that Imra was talking more to himself than to Luca, making his to-do list out loud, his eyes distant with rapid, ticking thoughts. But then he focused, glancing at Luca with a distracted smile. You don't have to worry about it. I'll take care of the animals until the worst of the weather passes. If the winds are too strong and the drifts are too high, it won't be safe for you out there. Luca bit his lip. I don't like letting you go out there alone, Imra. I've been doing it for years. But you don't have to now. Imra shook his head slightly. Your hands, Angyoka. They're fine. Luca let himself follow impulse then even if his heart beat in a twisting, strange lurch that told him he shouldn't, when his impulses were terrible, full of wanting and needful things. And yet if they were friends, it shouldn't matter, it should be all right. And he wasn't going to hold himself back from that closeness with Imra when distance hurt Imra, while the only one that intimacy hurt was Luca. And so he slipped his hand into Imra's, pressing their chilled fingers together letting them warm each other as they touched palm to palm. See? he said softly, and tried not to breathe in the heartache of that coarse, beloved touch. Imra had ways about him, and one of those ways was a certain stillness when something startled him, arrested his attention. That stillness settled now as he looked down at their clasped hands. He shifted his grip to stroke his thumb over Luca's palm, raising a sharp shudder shock of sensitivity that tingled in his knees and tightened in his stomach, tracing the pinkness of new skin and the slightly rougher areas of fresh-forming calluses. I see, Imra murmured, and didn't let go of Luca's hand. Tomorrow, then. Luca swallowed back his heart and tore his gaze away from Imra to look out over the fields as the wind blew harder and the snow came down in thicker gusts, a curtain of lace and frost. And today? Imra's grip shifted once more, his fingers splayed, then laced with Luca's, 
clasping them tight and holding them tangled together. Today, he said, and his rough accented voice spoke in the language of Luca's longing, we'll just watch this snow fall. 54. Imra wasn't sure what woke him. Maybe it was the creak of a floorboard or the querulous groan of an opening door. Maybe it was a soft whispered curse or the curious whine of the dogs stretched by his bedroom fireplace. Maybe it was the rattle of the shutters, the boom of the wind as the building's snowstorm outside gained strength and howled itself through the night. Maybe it was the pressure at the foot of the bed. Or maybe it was just that way he always somehow knew when Luca was near. As if every time they touched created a polar charge, a building energy making static on the air between them, crackling and sharp. He opened his eyes. Outside, the night was a wall of white, turning the darkness into light as the moon caught on the edges of snowflakes, high, high in the heavens, and shattered into a billion pieces on their sharp edges to rain downward in a blizzard of shimmer and shadow. They'd just finished staking out the walkways that afternoon, and none too soon. The storm had held off for two days after that first snow, but by dinner tonight the cold, crisp twilight had disappeared into a whiteout. The snow, piled high against the walls of the house, made it feel frozen and silent, insulated in a timeless place full of secrets. And so it seemed only fitting that a little cat of a man was curled at the foot of his bed, making himself small, as if he could hide and keep his presence secret from Imra if only he didn't take up too much space. Imra pushed himself up on one arm, watching the forlorn bundle Luca made tucked up in the very corner, as if trying to fit into the same space he'd occupied when he was just a wee boy. Wrapped up in a quilt the way he always had, and coaxing a sigh from Imra's lips, from Imra's heart. Luca. Luca's shoulders stiffened and he peered back, one eye visible past his hair, green gold and gleaming in the firelight. I'm sorry, he whispered. I think the furnace is out, and there's a draught in my room. I'll take a look and fix it up in the morning. Imra shifted across his king-sized bed to the side farthest from the hearth and pulled one of the pillows out from his stack of two to settle it in the empty space left behind. You don't have to sleep at the foot of the bed, Angyoka. Luca turned to face him, his heart in those fire-lit eyes, a siren calling its song to Imra in alluring notes. Are uh, you sure it would be all right? I can, uh, I can sleep by the downstairs fireplace. This was unwise, rash, yet Imra would not, could not allow his own troubled thoughts to deny Luca even the smallest comfort or kindness. There's no point in wasting wood on a second fire, and the room would take hours to properly warm. This one already is. He pulled the covers back over where he'd lain, offering Luca the spot already heated by his body. Come. Still Luca hesitated, but then untangled himself from the quilt and crawled up to the head of the bed, kittenish in his oversized boxes and shirt. He curled himself up against the pillow, curling on his side facing Imra, watching him quietly with one cheek pressed into the pillow and his body drawn up in a ball. Imra pulled the covers back up over him, gently tucking him in, then settled back against his own pillow folding his arm underneath his head. Thank you, Luca whispered. Imra smiled faintly and closed his eyes against the loveliness of his Angulka nestled into such a sweet, soft bundle so very close, those slender bare limbs in Imra's bed. Go to sleep, little cat, he murmured. Good night. Fifty-five. Only because Luca was exhausted from working all day did he manage to fall asleep with Imra so near, yet utterly untouchable. Yet he didn't sleep for long, even if the rush and sigh of the wind outside calmed him with its rhythmic lullaby. His dreams were restless things, without shape or form, 
only sounds, musical notes that each seemed to quiver inside him in vibrating strings of lonely, resonating pain. He was accustomed to tossing in his sleep when his dreams wouldn't let him be. He wasn't accustomed to a warm body there to stop it. He came to blearily, aware only of a sense of heaviness, of pressure, and a scent, familiar earth and hay and musk and man, wrapped up in body heat and entangled around him. He opened one eye. A taut plane of bronzed muscle filled his vision, tawny, naked skin, and the sharp contrast of deep, steel-gray curls of finely scattered chest hairs, a few scratching against his cheek. Hard sinew bunched under his palms, Imra's shoulders. His legs were caught and tangled in fabric over powerfully corded sinew, Imra's legs. And his waist was encircled by bands of heated iron, locking him in place, Imra's arms. His next breath caught and wouldn't let back out, stuck like a swallowed stone. He opened his eyes more fully, looking up at Imra. So close, so close, his beard flowed in a soft wash against Luca's cheek and mingled with his hair, one cool blue bead warming itself against Luca's jaw. Iron and silver locks drifted into Imra's relaxed, sleeping face and spread in a fanning tangle over the pillow. It was like waking up in a lion's embrace. The great beast turned docile and peaceful and beautiful in dormant sleep, and Luca tried so very hard to talk himself into pulling out of Imra's hold before Luca began to want, but couldn't. He was a traitor to their friendship, because he wanted nothing more than to stay here forever and always, wrapped up in Imra's arms, in Imra's bed. And he couldn't. He couldn't. So he held on to this moment while he had it, while Imra wasn't awake to push him away and remind him who he was, why he shouldn't, why they shouldn't. He wrapped his arms around Imra's neck, tangling his fingers in that tumble of hair he loved even more for its silvered sheen, running his fingers slowly along the braids scattered throughout. I love you, Imra, he whispered, barely more than a breath. Then he pressed his cheek over Imra's chest and listened to his heart and willed himself to sleep once more, no matter what dreams may come. 56. Imra waited until Luca's breath evened into sleep to open his eyes. He'd thought he would give himself away when Luca woke. He'd barely managed to control his breathing, harder still to control his wayward heart. He'd not slept an hour, not a minute, not a wink, not since the moment Luca had rolled over against him in his sleep, and Imra had wrapped his arms around him without thinking, and not yet talked himself into letting go. Were he a decent man, he'd have let Luca know he was awake, let go, retreated to their respective sides of the bed. But how could he be a decent man with such sweetness tucked against him, clinging to him so trustingly? How could he make himself let go, when Luca's soft words were the thread binding Imra to Luca and Luca to Imra? If Luca saw himself as the thread stitching his parents into a single broken heart, then that quiet whisper had laced Imra to the boy through and through, until his heart was no longer whole without Luca sewn into it. I love you, Imra. Imra closed his eyes, pressed his lips into Luca's hair, and held on tight till morning. 57. Somehow Imra wasn't surprised that, when he woke on the morning of December 1st, Luca was nowhere to be found. Since that first snow, sleeping in had become a habit. The farm had gone into hibernation, and short days and long nights meant late mornings, where they drifted into each other sooner or later in the kitchen, and whomever woke up first made breakfast before they trudged together down walkways walled by corridors of packed snow to feed and water the animals, check on the beehives and the fences, check the barn insulation and heating, and watch the nanny goats for signs of heat. Imra normally found the winters too idle, when he was more wedded to hard work than he had ever been to another person, but there was a certain quiet pleasure in the downtime now. 
He showed Luca how to make candles from beeswax and set the dinner table with Luca's first lumpy, misshapen efforts. He showed him, too, the many things that could be crafted from goat horns, how to purify and jar honey, how to can and preserve apples, how to properly cure cheese for aging, all the little things that passed the hours on a farm in winter. All the little things that let them pretend everything was normal, no matter how many times the conversation died for endless seconds each time their hands brushed, lingered, then pulled back as they avoided each other's eyes. One more month, Imra reminded himself. One more month before he sent Luca back home to Marco, and life would return to normal. The farmhouse would be empty, desolate. Things would be rough back in Sheffield, with Luca's absence likely changing nothing. Luca would find his way, Imra thought. Luca always found his way, with that stubborn strength he hid behind impish smiles. It was Imra who'd be lost, once Luca was away and likely never coming back, moving on to a life that had no need of Imra, and a farm that was just a fond childhood memory best left in the past. He sighed, staring across the kitchen of the empty house. He had an idea why Luca was starkly absent this morning, but he couldn't help thinking maybe he should start trying to get used to this now, before he was already gone. Imra fished a small parcel from its hiding place atop the fridge, tucked it into the inner pocket of his jacket, and stepped outside into the snow. The morning was dim and silvery and chill, the cold biting and nipping at Imra's cheeks, the sun playing peekaboo between the clouds and throwing wan, pale radiance down to make the snow glitter with winter light, every breath cut with edges of ice. Frost rhyming his breaths and kissing his lips and crackling in tiny, crisp-scented icicles inside his nose. The drifts had piled so thick in the overnight winds that it was hard to tell the actual dales from mounded snow. A pair of fresh footsteps led across the field in front of the house, winding down toward the trail leading between low hills and out toward the broader pastures. He followed that path of footsteps as if led on a tether, to where they ended at the crest of a low rise. Luca sat atop the low stone wall there, his legs dangling over the edge, his body wrapped up in a heavy black wool coat with the high collar pulled up around his jaw. His skin was white with the cold, save for the pink-flushed, wind-kissed points of his nose, cheekbones, and ears. His gloved hand draped over his knee, a lit cigarette dangling from between two fingers the thin coil of smoke and the cherry ember burning away untouched. Luca looked out over the fields and the bare spindly trees, his eyes half-closed, remote, his lips parted, as though he'd started to say something and then forgotten what it could be. His earbuds rested in his ears, trailing into his pocket. His shoulders shook in a subtle shiver. A few dustings of fresh snow dotted his hair, though the sky was clear now. Imra wondered how long he'd been out here, but didn't ask. He said nothing, as he moved to stand at the fence close by, and, hands in his pockets, watched the land and sky with Luca in silence. Luca didn't seem aware that he was there. He didn't move, didn't look at Imra, though his lips closed into a bitter line. But after long, silent minutes, he replaced the smoke cloud of his breaths with the smoke of the cigarette, taking a long drag before blowing out a steady, bitter-scented stream, tapping the thick curl of ash from the tip to pepper down onto the snow, and tugging the earbuds free from his ears. He coiled the gnawed, frayed cord around his fingers, then stuffed them into his pocket before flicking the cigarette with his thumb. Sorry, he murmured. Figured with the snow it couldn't hurt much. You're fine, Imra answered, but said nothing else. Luca looked like he'd bolt if Imra pushed too hard, and so he did what he was best at. He waited, and finally... Am I? Luca asked, his voice cracking. Don't feel all that fine. First day of December. I try not to think about it. Another slow drag off the cigarette, then twin streams of smoke through his nostrils. I'm twenty now. That's some kind of bloody milestone, isn't it? No longer a teenager. 
Imra stepped closer, until he could lightly bump Luca's arm with his elbow without crowding him. It's just another day if you want it to be. I don't know what I want. Luca stared down at the cigarette, then stubbed it out against the fence, grinding it into the stone at his hip. I guess that's half my problem. We could go into town, catch a film. That sounds like it would be torture for you. Luca's soft, brittle laugh made Imra want to reach for him, take his hand, but he reined himself in firmly. Luca tilted his head back, staring up at the sky, throat working in a swallow. Let's just let it be another day, Imra, if that's what you want. Imra debated, pressing his lips together, fingering the brown paper and string wrapping the parcel in his pocket. The gift had been an impulse, and if Luca didn't want to do anything for his birthday, perhaps he'd not want even that little reminder. But if not for his birthday, Imra likely would have bought it just because it needed to be done anyway. So, after a few moments of struggling with himself, he slipped the long, slim, rectangular parcel from his pocket and offered it to Luca. Package came for you yesterday, though. Luca blinked down at the parcel. Eh? Open it. With a knit to his brows, Luca plucked at the twine, then unfolded the paper. Inside, in a carved wooden case, rested a new pair of earbuds, soft black rubber tips affixed to polished wooden casings. The website Imra had ordered them from said the wooden casings provided better sound quality and acoustics. He'd never really looked into anything like that, so he'd just picked the prettiest ones in gleaming walnut and hoped Luca would like them. Luca stilled, his eyes widening, his breaths catching. Imra! He gently plucked the earbuds from their fitted velvet beds, turning them over, before smiling slowly, eyes lighting. You didn't have to. You've nearly chewed through your old ones. They seem important to you. Luca's smile faltered, and Imra wished he hadn't said anything. But still that curl lingered around the boy's lips, and he stroked his fingers lightly down the woven nylon cords of the wooden earbuds. I guess... The how I block things out. If I shut off what I can hear, I don't have to see or feel either. All I feel is the song. He snorted softly. Even if it's part of why I'm so useless. A certain sharp edge to his voice caught him, right? and he turned to look at Luca fully rather than watching him from the corner of his eye. Useless? Other people have all these fascinating hobbies. Paper craft. Or they weld furniture from metal recyclables on weekends. Or they make candles from beeswax from their own bees. Or they're just really, really into something. He clenched his fist around the cord, jaw setting in a tight line. I'm not really into anything but reading and my music. I don't do anything. I don't make things, not like other people. Not like you. Imra frowned. Had Luca been comparing himself to Imra all this time? You don't have to be like me, young Yoka. I... Luca stared down at his hands. I always wanted to be. I always looked up to you so much. Admired you. I still do. I find that amusing, considering how I admire you. Luca made a strangled, confused sound. What? Why? I'm a complete and utter prat. What is there to admire about me? Everything. Imra took a moment to gather himself, sort through his thoughts and string them into words that would make sense. While he considered, he pulled himself up onto the wall next to Luca, settling at his side and leaning forward to brace his elbows on his thighs. Not many twenty-year-olds know themselves the way you do, Luca, he continued. You're smart? And you know what you want, even if it's not yet taken a concrete shape. You know you're seeking something to feel passionate about, something you can commit yourself to. That doesn't mean you have to find what that something is exactly right at this moment. Imra laced his fingers together, studying his hands, the scars, legacy of a lifetime on the farm, of throwing himself into it to let it break and burn his body and rebuild him into the man he needed to be to hold Lohera together on his own. He supposed that was his passion, cut into his skin. 
Some people try to find that something for their entire lives, and might be old and grey before they figure it out, and there's nothing wasted in the things they learned along the way, no matter where their lives might take them. Twenty isn't so old to still be unsure, but the time you spend finding your way isn't useless. You aren't useless. Quiet, Luca wound the cords of the earbuds around his fingers. Imra watched while he made a cat's cradle, then tumbled it apart. He seemed so much older in this moment, older, stranger, already weary and bowed with the weight of a decision he didn't know how to make. Imra only wished he could carry some of that weight for him, but Luca's choice was Luca's own and no other's. I'm just afraid I'll settle on something and then end up miserable, Luca finally said, as quiet as the silent blankets of snow. And I'll have wasted that, too. You'll have learned what you don't want, and that's not a waste. Nor will it be too late to change if you want to. Imra chuckled. When I was twenty, I thought I wanted to run away and join a traveling Roma music troupe, wander the world with my guitar. Why didn't you? That's not really a way of life anymore. Dancing in town squares for pennies. Most of the professional Roma music troops play concert halls and fine events now. And, frankly, I'm not that good. He laughed again, shaking his head. His younger self had been such a mess, up in the hayloft at all hours of the day and night, banging away at that guitar until his mother shouted at him to leave off. He was bothering the chickens. And I really do love Lohera. I was just kicking at my traces, bucking at the idea of following in my father's footsteps, because I needed time to figure out who I was, and that I wanted Lohera for me, not because it was what he expected. Luca blew out a cloud of frost-rhymed breath, thicker than cigarette smoke. That's the heart of it, eh? Hm? Dad wants me to be like him, an engineer. I'm not interested, but I keep pushing aside any thought of what I want because it's not what he expects, and I'm tired of the fallout every time I lean off the path he thinks I should follow. His way is straightforward. Mine's... I don't even know. Tangled off sideways. But I can't go sideways and won't go straight, so I end up going nowhere at all. Where does your path lead, then, if not engineering? Fucked if I know, mate, Lucas snorted. Imra smiled slightly. All right. What do you want? Fucked if I know that either. Luca set the earbuds delicately in their case and propped it on his thigh, then braced his hands against the stone of the fence and leaned back on them, tilting his head back to look up at the clear.